This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Annihilation, written by B. V. Larson, narrated by Mark Boyette. Chapter One. The day the macros came back into our tiny slice of the universe, I wasn't ready for them. I thought I'd prepared for everything they could do, for any contingency. But I was wrong. By earthly calendars, it was a Thursday night, the end of the first day of May. That was a detail which shouldn't have mattered at all, since I now lived in the Eden star system. But it did matter to me. I missed May and springtime and all the lost traditions from my old life. I stood on a high battlement atop a spire of rock on Eden 8. It was one of the highest peaks on the planet. I built an impressive fortress up here which clutched the granite pinnacle of the mountain and wrapped around it like a coiled snake. I'd named the fortress Shadow Guard. Of the three worlds the centaurs had ceded to humanity, Eden 8 was the farthest from the central star. Compared to the hotter worlds of Eden 6 and Eden 7, the planet was relatively cool. In comparison to Earth, it was a warm world, ranging from steaming jungles at the equator to balmy temperate zones around the poles. Eden 8 orbited its yellowy star very evenly. The planet had less than a one-degree tilt to its axis, and it didn't wobble much. Earth's six-degree tilt gave her four seasons— but here on Eden 8, there were only two, and they were practically indistinguishable from one another. As a result, there wasn't really a summer or a winter. It rained a little more one half of the year than it did the other, but a newcomer would barely notice the difference. Besides the lack of seasons, the most noticeable thing about the terrain was the vast carpet of forest lands. We had real trees here. They were over a thousand feet tall in places. Even Earth's great redwoods didn't compare. On the biggest continent in the southern hemisphere, I'd built my fortress in the middle of a forest of the largest trees. Shadow Guard perched on a pinnacle of rock overlooking a sea of trees. It served as a communications relay station and garrison headquarters for the inner habitable worlds. But that was only part of the reason I'd placed it here. I'd chosen my new headquarters because I liked it up here on top of this pleasant world. The view was spectacular, even at night. More importantly, at this altitude, it was always cool and often cold. There were very few spots on the three planets owned by humanity in this system that could make that claim. Building on this site had been expensive in terms of resource allocation. We no longer thought in terms of dollars when constructing things. With the amazing factories we'd captured from the nanos and their lumbering cousins, the macros, we were able to produce anything we wished, given enough time and materials. Thus, when I calculated expenses, I did so by tallying the number of hours a given factory had to work to churn out whatever it was I needed. Combined with the number of human and robotic subsystems that had to be committed to do the assembly and the gathering of the necessary raw components— I arrived at the final cost. Building Shadow Guard had required a staggering number of hours of effort, numbering in the thousands. To lower the production burden on systems that could be better used building ships, I'd employed my idle crews. I'd ordered them to participate in lengthy exercises that amounted to fetch and carry missions. Every garrison ship equipped with a segmented arm had flown countless missions, ferrying modular structures up to the mountaintop, one at a time. This effort had reduced the strain on the worker machines, but the project had still taken more production than it was really worth. When it was finished, however, I found myself pleased with the results. I'd built a retreat that pierced the clouds and enclosed some 30,000 square feet of space, not including the exposed ramparts that served as balconies around most of the chambers. It was on those lofty turrets that I found myself pacing tonight. Darkness shrouded Eden 8, and at this altitude the nights frosted everything with a glaze of ice. 
Fortunately, my various physical alterations made the environment comfortable for me. Why did you build this place, Kyle? Sandra asked. I glanced around, but didn't see her. After a moment, I stopped trying. She was somewhere nearby. That was nothing unusual. She almost always was. She was my guardian angel, or perhaps I should say, my guardian creature. She wasn't entirely human, and she wasn't exactly an angel. Don't you like it here? I asked. I love it, she said. That's why, then. I built it for you, out of love. Bullshit. I smiled. Where the hell are you, anyway? There was a swirl of movement. I flinched as she jumped down beside me from the conical snow-crusted roof of a nearby tower. It must have been a thirty-foot leap down, and Eden 8 had a good twenty-one percent higher gravity than Earth. But she landed neatly. I only heard a tiny, audible grunt out of her. She smiled at me in triumph, but her face fell as I skipped back in alarm. A shower of snow had followed her down from the roof. It splashed on her back and hair a moment later. She sputtered and brushed at the snow. I stepped forward and helped her remove fine white granules of ice from her suit and hair. We kissed and smiled at each other. Then we both laughed. This is a romantic place, Sandra admitted. I turned away and walked to the crenulated walls. The parapets circling Shadow Guard's battlements had a very medieval look to them, which was by design— the walls resembled the jaws of a predator with lines of big, square teeth. I leaned on one of these granite teeth, gazing down at the night world below. It was twenty-one thousand feet to the bottom, and it looked twice that far. The forests were shrouded in darkness at the base of the cliffs. The sky was a span of velvet blue above, dotted with diamond-white stars. Starlight wasn't enough for my eyes to see much detail in the lands spread out below me. The planet had no moons, and that made the nights darker than they were on most worlds. Eden 8 was the most heavily inhabited of the star system's worlds, at least the most thickly inhabited by humans. But by Earth standards, it was practically empty. There were a few pinpoints of white light down there dotting the landscape, the lights marked small farms and colonial ranches, places where we'd managed to clear glades from the giant forests. Lands had been granted by Star Force to enterprising families who'd sworn to build their homes and have their children here. As of our last monthly online census, there were over 12,000 registered humans on the planet. I scooped up some snow and crushed it into a ball in my hand. I looked at Sandra. She eyed me warily. We'd had plenty of snowball fights in the past. When you have bodies full of nanites upgraded by biochemical edits, hurling snowballs could be serious business. I held up the snowball. This is why I built up here. I wanted something humanity will be forever denied in the Eden system, a truly cold place to live. She nodded. That's a good reason, she said. I believe that one. You've always liked the winter. I hurled the snowball over the walls. After years of enhancements, I've got a good arm on me, and I doubt any baseball player in all history could have pitched it farther. The snowball flew away into the night like a streak of white. Finally, gravity took hold, and it began a long, slow lob that turned into a hurtling drop. Seconds later, it was sucked down into the darkness below us and vanished from sight. Sandra leapt up onto one of the square merlins and perched there on the edge, watching it fall. I can still see it, she said. It might make it all the way to the trees. I stared, but my eyes weren't much better than the ones I'd been born with. For me, the darkness had swallowed up the falling ball of whipped ice. It's May, back on Earth, you know. I said. I miss having seasons. Now I can experience winter any time I want just by coming up here. She still crouched on the wall, staring down into the darkness intently. 
Don't tell me you can still see that ice ball, I said. She put up a flat hand to shush me. She shook her head. Didn't make it, she said. It hit a spur of rock about two-thirds of the way down. Too bad. She looked at me. It's not the seasons you miss, Kyle. It's Earth itself. I doubt we will ever be completely at ease here. I mean, it's a lovely world and all, but it will never be home. I don't know. People have migrated before. We've done it for a thousand generations. Yes, but never to a brand new planet. There are things in our genes, in our instincts, that can't be adjusted. The length of our days and nights, for example. I'm finding these fourteen-hour cycles to be annoyingly short. I had to agree with her there. Seven hours of daylight were always followed by seven hours of night. Many of us were having trouble adjusting our sleep patterns. I frowned suddenly, disliking the melancholy turn of the conversation. Listen to us, I shouted. Such defeatism. We'll see home again. Sandra's face tightened. She nodded her head but looked away. What? I demanded. I don't know. If we do go back, we'll bring war. I can't imagine any other way it will happen now. I don't want to burn down half of Earth just for our comfort. Doesn't have to go that way. There are always factions when someone makes a power grab. Maybe they'll rise up and kick Crow off the throne. Maybe he'll have a heart attack or choke on a barbecued shrimp. This last comment finally made her laugh and broke her somber mood. Okay, she said. What are we going to call this palace of yours? It's not exactly a palace. Oh, come on, of course it is. I bet Crow has seven of them by now. Don't be shy. What do you want to call your first one? I felt uncomfortable with the subject, but forced a smile. I've already decided, I said. I'm going to call it Shadow Guard. Why? Because it will help prevent our enemies from sneaking up on us, hopefully. She blinked at me. I shrugged. It's not just a vacation spot, you know. It serves a military purpose. There's a lot of equipment on this rock, including the best sensor array in all six of the known star systems. Show me, she said. Smiling, I offered her my arm. She clasped it formally, and we walked together down the icy granite steps to a portal. Like all the doors in the fortress, this one was made of smart metal. It sensed us, identified us, and dissolved to let us in. The opening yawned and warmth gusted up into our faces. A single operator was on duty. The operator was a young lieutenant who looked up shyly as we approached. Almost apologetically, she lifted a tablet and waved it slightly, trying to gain my attention. What's this? I asked, taking it from her. Something relayed from Welcher Station, sir, she said. I frowned. This isn't the standard daily report. Any hostile activity should have been reported to me immediately. The young woman's face registered alarm. I'm sorry, Colonel, but it isn't about hostile action. It's labeled as a diplomatic message. My frown deepened. I swiped a finger over the screen, passing the opening bullshit on the first pages. How was it that bureaucracy always snuck into any organization? Already there were three pages of dates and details on every report and document that came to me. The reports seemed to grow fatter and less informative by the month. The first useful section dealt with unusual readings, mostly from Eden 12, the homeworld of the blues. That was nothing new. There had always been unusual readings coming from that gas giant which was inhabited by enigmatic beings. Today there had been large energy releases of unknown origin. I rolled my eyes. After all, it was a gas giant. Huge storms rolled across it every day. Some of my people needed to take a course in basic astronomy. Finally, on page 27, I reached the heart of the matter. I read it quickly, then gave the device back to the lieutenant. Well? asked Sandra. Who's he from? The crustaceans, I said. 
Sandra gave a callous bark of laughter. Oh, those lovable bastards. What kind of love note did they send you? Are they sending us a big wooden horse this time? I shook my head. No. They're asking for help. They say they're under attack and are requesting any aid we can spare. Sandra looked at me and her smile faded. I knew in an instant what was going on in her mind. It was the same dilemma that raged in mine. Should we help our enemies? They'd sided with the macros in the last conflict and done us grievous harm. But I had to admit, I still held out some sympathy for the arrogant shellfish. After all, hadn't I committed Earth troops to serving under the macros when we'd faced extinction? I'd attacked the worms exactly as they'd attacked us. We'd fought with the worms, but in the end they were alive and the machines that had attacked Helios weren't. They are biotics, I said. Maybe this is a chance to mend fences with them. Maybe they finally realize the machines will never let them coexist in peace. We can always use another ally. But we can't trust them, Sandra said. It could all be a trick. Another ruse, like the last one, designed to get us to lower our guard and help the machines destroy us. I know, I said, and I agree that we'll have to proceed cautiously. Sandra turned her attention to the star map and the holo tank in the center of the room. She reached out her hand and tapped the controls. The holo tank shimmered in response and brought up a detailed three-dimensional image depicting the crustacean home system which was one jump from Eden. We'd named the F-class star Thor. All told, we'd discovered six connected systems. Thor was at our end of the chain of star systems, the last system we'd discovered beyond Eden. The Thor system consisted of three gas giants and a load of other airless, rocky worlds. The central binary stars were a tight tag team, an F-class white star and a tiny red dwarf. I'd named the big one Thor and the smaller one Loki. We called our closest hostile neighbors crustaceans, but really they were alien beings that resembled giant man-sized lobsters. They came from three water moons that orbited the innermost gas giant. What else does the report say? Sandra asked. Are there macro ships orbiting their worlds? No. No signs of conflict? What kind of trouble can they be in? Nothing that we can see from space, I said, working the tablet. But there are strange sensor readings from their moons, particularly Yale. Seismic spikes, explosions possibly. And the oceans, the temperature of the water is rising— They've risen 1.1 degrees over the last few days. One degree? Sandra asked. Big deal. I began to pace. I've learned a lot about planetary climates and geology over the last few years, I said. A one degree change in a volume of water that great is very significant over such a short period of time. It means a huge amount of energy has been released. Sandra zoomed in on the gas giant that dominated the sky for every crustacean. It was bluish in color like the solar system's Neptune. The gas giant itself wasn't inhabited, as far as we could tell, but it was in the zone that supported liquid water. Circling that world were several water moons, the home worlds of the crustaceans. Each of these moons was comparable in size to Earth and covered by oceans. Sandra and I both stared at the planetary system in the holo tank. I knew she was thinking the same thing I was. What the hell was going on out there? You're going to fly us out there, Sandra said to me. You're going to risk Star Force lives to save lobsters, aren't you? Yes, I said. I think I am. They don't deserve it, Kyle. You're probably right. But I have to try to make peace with them. Sandra muttered something else, but I didn't hear her. I'd already left the warmth of the command center and walked out onto the battlements again. The frosty winds were stronger now as it was nearing midnight. The wind felt good against my skin. 
Rather than gazing down into the night-shrouded treetops below me, I turned my eyes upward into the sky. Above me hung the droplets of fire we call stars. They appeared ice-cold to me tonight, and I saw them as my ancestors must have. They were like the staring eyes of a thousand gods. I knew something was happening up there, but I had no idea what those heartless, glittering gods had in store for me. Chapter 2 Just before dawn we left Eden 8. Sandra and I boarded a destroyer and were taken swiftly up into the sky. The ship whisked us away toward the outer rim where welter stations circled the coldest rock in the star system. On the way, I kept checking every few hours for changes in the situation. Any kind of update from Thor would be nice. But there was nothing. No new information from our sensors, scout ships, spy probes, or the crustaceans themselves— the only measurable data that came in was an ominous detail. The temperature of the oceans on Yale had risen another tenth of a degree. This was neither encouraging nor enlightening. We didn't get a proper night's sleep on the long haul out to the battle station. My mind and my command staff couldn't help playing out grim scenarios. Could it be a natural disaster, volcanic action, some kind of civil war? We just didn't know. During the final hours of the journey, we drew closer to the station and began decelerating hard. For several long hours, the destroyer shuddered and maintained a steady, teeth-throbbing four Gs of braking thrust. That's what space flight consisted of for Star Force veterans. Endless sessions of pulling hard Gs as we accelerated up to cruising speed, then turned around and decelerated just as powerfully so we could dock rather than smashing into the landing bays. I'd had plenty of time to review what little we knew, but not enough input to decide on a course of action. Since I didn't have much to go on, I focused on what I could do with clarity and purpose, shore up our own defensive posture. I was feeling paranoid, and I had very good reasons for it. The last time the crustaceans had sent a cryptic message, they'd sent an emissary ship along with it. The ambassador inside had blown herself up, and the EMP blast had disrupted my battle station, nearly crippling it. If the crustaceans were involved in some kind of new conflict, my first concern had to be the security of my own backyard. I began reviewing our defenses for the tenth time since I'd left Shadowguard. Fortunately, the Eden system only had two points of entry, at least that we knew of. There were two rings that connected this star system to others, each allowed instantaneous interstellar travel to another system. One path led to the Helio system, which was occupied and patrolled by our allies, the Worms. Beyond Helios and farther down the chain of rings was the solar system. Unfortunately, Earth could not be considered friendly at this time. Still, with the worms and several systems serving as a buffer, I didn't fear a sneak attack from that direction. In the other direction was a single known system, the Thor system. In my view, it was more dangerous than Earth. If the enemy came at us from that flank, we would have only a day or two of warning at best. We knew there was at least one other ring that connected Thor to some other unknown location owned by the Macros. The machines had launched attacks on us via that ring several times. Judging the Thor system and the unknown numbers of Macro fleets beyond it to be the greater threat, I'd built a battle station on the border, right next to the ring that connected Eden to Thor. Known as Welter Station, the structure had survived its first battles— but only barely. Things had changed a lot since I had first built the battle station. She was monstrous now, and instead of being nearly deserted, the fortress teemed with Star Force personnel. The refugees from Earth had stepped up and manned the station with a crew of over a thousand, which was what it had been originally designed for. This thing is huge, Colonel, Commodore Miklos said when the station came into visual range. His tone indicated he believed the battle station was too big. 
The Commodore had joined us on this trip out to the border. He was my exec and overall second in command. I nodded but avoided Miklo's eye. I'm sure you've seen it before. Of course I have, but it's bigger. The volume is three times greater than what was proposed in the original design documents. I nodded again but said nothing. Miklos was one of my best. I'd come to trust and rely on his judgment and loyalty over the last few years, but that didn't mean I always listened to his frequently offered advice. He was fleet and therefore wanted every hour of production to go into building more ships. It was only natural for him to view any other expenditure as counterproductive. He looked at me, frowning. Why did you put so much effort into rebuilding it, into making it bigger? I thought it was a failure. A failure? Hardly. The first battles this monstrosity was involved in were not promising. It was pushed over like a tin can, a giant tin can. I felt a sensation of growing annoyance with him, but I tried to keep my reaction off my face. I was alarmed by how easily our enemies circumvented this behemoth station during her last action, I said. I freely admit that the station did not perform optimally in combat. If the station can't defend itself, it is useless, Colonel. It can defend itself. I snapped back at him, my voice rising in volume. It took out a great number of ships in its first engagement. Miklos fell to brooding quietly. After a minute or two, I heaved a sigh. All right, I said. I admit I took a gamble by putting so much of our resources out here at this outpost. After its relative failure in previous engagements, I felt I had a decision to make, either to put the station on the back burner and build fleets instead, or to expand its capabilities. Miklos nodded slowly. I understand completely, sir. You doubled your bet. Yes, I chose to double down. Miklos didn't appear surprised. He did look concerned, however. He began to list reasons why ships were superior to fixed fortifications, even though fortresses were more cost-effective. Mobility is a force multiplier, he lectured me. Big guns do no one any good if they aren't able to reach the critical battle. Historically, fortresses have always fallen to mobile forces. The Maginot Line, for instance. I rolled my eyes. I'd taken his lecture as good-naturedly as I could up until this point, but now he'd annoyed me enough to shut him down. The Maginot Line? I demanded incredulously. Let me assure you, Commodore, this station won't go down in the history books as Riggs' greatest folly. Over recent months, while Crow has been licking his wounds back on Earth, I've assumed the Macros have been building another invasion fleet. To meet that inevitable threat, I shored up this battered station. That's all there is to the story. Miklos fell quiet again. He wasn't pouting, however. I knew him too well to believe his feelings could be hurt by a scoffing tone in my voice. Unfortunately, I also knew his opinions hadn't been swayed by my little speech. Not in the slightest. He was simply being polite and biding his time to make his case again. The man could be relentless. We went back to watching the station swell as we rapidly drew closer. The last time I'd been out here, the station's primary characteristic had been the asteroid rock that armored the central Taurus. That had drastically changed. I'd captured and added a new asteroid to the station to create more mass. This new section was hollowed out. We leached the metals from it and left the stone as armor. The surface of the entire thing was dotted by equipment embedded into the natural rock— Instead of occasional battlements and sensor arrays that resembled outcroppings of metal, I'd added an entirely new superstructure that formed a thick band around the center of the station. The structure was vaguely disc-shaped, and the crewmen had come to call it the saucer. The new battlements were anything but fragile, however. They were built with heavy structural components, mostly steel and yard-thick polymers. 
Inside the saucer, clusters of weaponry were closely massed and capable of incredible firepower. The saucer was encrusted with missile batteries, beam turrets, railgun emplacements, and more. I broke the silence with Miklos first. You should learn more about what this station can do, Commodore, before you scoff at it. I do not recall making any scoffing sounds. No, but your tone makes your opinion self-evident. Please turn your attention to the most innovative of the additions, the new fighter bays. From each of seven bays, a wing of fighters can be launched within minutes of identifying a threat. Miklos nodded thoughtfully, arching his eyebrows. I've read the reports on the fighter bays, but the technology is unproven. We've seen them in action on the side of the Empire, I said, struggling to keep my voice even. My fighters are based on their designs. What is the strategic advantage of these fighters? After the lobsters disabled this base with a single well-placed bomb, I decided that a localized mobile defense was a good idea. The fighter wings are under orders to scramble with paranoid regularity. A squadron or two is always on orbital patrol. Even if we do get sucker-punched again, all our eggs won't be in a single basket. The fighters are there to harass any approaching enemy. If the station is disabled again, they will provide some defensive capability. Miklos looked interested, but far from pleased. I knew he considered a fighter to be a type of ship, even if they had a limited range. To Miklos, any ship was a good ship but he would rather have a more mobile force. May I suggest something, Colonel? I nodded, knowing I was going to hear his ideas eventually, whether I wanted to or not. I'm thinking about the current situation, he said. In the coming days, we might want to move to the crustacean homeworlds to help them. We have a lot of new armament here at the battle station, but the water moons are out of range. Perhaps we could produce carrier vessels to transport the new fighter wings. You're proposing that we strip the fighter wings from the station and use them as a mobile force assigned to these carriers? I asked. Temporarily, yes. We could put the carriers into production immediately. We would not have to build the fighters, only the carriers. We could do that fairly quickly, as they would only have to have a large structure and engines. What about armament? I asked. No weapons would be required on a carrier. The fighters would be their weapons. I considered his idea. I glared at the growing image of the battle station. It bristled with weaponry and appeared invincible from space. Despite its strength, I wasn't excited about the idea of weakening this monster I'd built. As it was, it was an absolute barrier to entry into the Eden system. With it standing here on watch, I felt one of my flanks was secure. On the other hand, if I was going to have to send my ships out into a hostile system, I would want those fighters to cover my fleet. Miklos seemed to sense my indecision. He sidled closer to me and continued with his arguments. We could use standard cruiser engines and structure. No redesign necessary. They would probably be slower moving but they could serve as strategic platforms. Think of them as flying bases, able to move in and provide an anchor for the fleet wherever you wish. In this situation, they could orbit the Thor gas giant and cover all three inhabited moons. I thought about it. Really, it did make sense. All right, I said at last. I'll go talk to Marvin and discuss a design and how long it would take to assemble such a vessel. I'm not sure we'll have time to pull it off, however. If we're going to save these lobsters from whatever is killing them, we'll have to move fast. Miklos handed me a computer tablet. I glanced down at it. What's this? I asked. I took the liberty of running some numbers. Also, key components are already in pre-production. As we've moved some of the duplicators to the Bethel station, I thought we might as well get a head start. I glared at the tablet. I was angry, but at the same time I didn't want to quell initiative taken by my staff. I reminded myself the delegation of authority was part of successful leadership. That part had never come easily for me. 
I calmed down with an act of will and looked at what he'd given me. The numbers were not too presumptive. He'd changed standing production orders, but only directed the duplicators to construct components that were useful as spare parts or for any fleet support ship we might care to build. Even if I'd shot down his ideas, the production wouldn't be wasted. I nodded and handed the tablet back. I'm surprised you put this into motion so quickly, and without full approval, but I can see that you've done it in a way that does not disrupt standing orders. I approve of the action. Continue. Miklos beamed. It was rare his bearded face smiled, and I was glad to see the expression. I realized he'd been sweating my decision and fearing a possible reprimand. I was glad I didn't have to chew him out. As a top leader, I had to be careful. A few words from me could crush a spirit. I wasn't really worried about having that effect on me close, but I knew I'd done it to others in the past. I left the bridge and went to my private quarters. Sandro was there, already strapped onto an acceleration couch. I grunted and strained as I got into place beside her. In order to maximize our speed, we'd applied most of the ship's power to the engines, rather than the niceties such as the gravity stabilizers. I was really feeling the G's today. Sandra worked her tablet controls as I got into place for the final burn. The ship had to go to full thrust to slow us down enough for docking. There were always jarring last-second adjustments. Sandra caused the forward screens over our acceleration couches to light up. The battle station loomed. It was a dark hulk in space, sprinkled with gleaming lights. It resembled a bristling sea anemone as much as anything else I could think of. Batteries of rail guns, beam turrets, and missile silos dotted the uneven surface. Why did you rebuild this thing, Kyle? Sandra asked me. I made a sound that was somewhere between a sigh and a grunt. I felt I'd answered this sort of question enough today already. I'm a sucker for big, cheap defenses, I said. I looked at it, and I just couldn't come up with a better way to expend our resources and get more firepower out of each nut and bolt. She nodded, unsurprised. It failed the first time, but you still believe in it? Absolutely. But what if the enemy comes from the other direction next time? From Earth? Earth was trashed less than a year ago. So was every player in this game. But I know one thing about the macros. They can rebuild amazingly fast. I decided to put most of our resources into stopping them first. Are you sure they're the greater threat? I nodded. Those alien machines would exterminate us all if they could. Crow would only enslave us. Sandra gave me a flickering smile. Encouraging, she said. I guess she didn't like the fact that we were surrounded by enemies. We held Eden and had a foothold in the Helios system, but that was the extent of our influence. I'd stopped patrolling the lobster system and Alpha Centauri long ago due to lack of resources. I hope you've done it right this time, she said sincerely. So do I. After this short conversation, I went back to rechecking data I'd already rechecked, scanning for new details that I might have missed, and which I pretty much knew weren't there. It was agonizing going into a conflict without intel. I'd done it before, but I hated it just as much today as I had the first time. How do you plan and prepare for the unknown? I guessed that recent military leaders back on Earth over the last century had had it pretty good. Back in the days of planet-wide satellite coverage and Cold War intel, there were years of research and planning to back up anything you encountered. When the Soviets made a move, NATO was rarely surprised. They gamed out everything. Orders were already in a vault, ready to be distributed within hours. Those days were gone. Out here on the frontier of space, meeting new species and new threats every few months, I had to fly by the seat of my pants most of the time. My military decisions were based on guesswork as much as anything else. I'd never even seen the next system in the chain of rings, the one the macros appeared to be coming from. We'd sent in probes, of course, stealthy robotic things that we'd been sure would evade detection long enough to employ passive sensors and scan the environment. 
none of these probes had ever returned. The macro system beyond the ring and the Thor system remain to this day a mysterious black hole in our knowledge. Because of this, we had to operate as if an attack was coming from that sector at any moment. We had to assume the worst, because we had no idea what the truth was. I was reminded historically of the colonial period in Earth's history. I felt akin to the explorers and colonial governors of centuries past— they had small garrisons on wild coastlands. All around them, local native populations simmered with resentment. Worse, other colonial powers or out-and-out -out pirates might arrive on any given day to raid their settlements or even conquer them. Back then, there weren't any satellites or instantaneous transmissions, and the distances were comparably huge. It took months to voyage home, possibly a year between requesting assistance and getting it from your home country. I was in a similar situation. Effectively, we were on our own, and we had no idea what was going to come over the horizon. By the time we docked, I was ready for action. I jumped off the couch and suited up. Sandra was right behind me when I hit the airlock. I was unsurprised to find Miklos already there waiting for us. The doors swished open, and another familiar sight met my eyes. It was Marvin in all his unholy, metallic glory. Chapter 3 Marvin was my science officer. He was also a robot. He'd built himself, and he liked to fiddle with things, including his own structure. Sometimes he could fly— on other occasions, he slithered and dragged himself with whipping nanite arms. Usually, whatever form he took, he was large and had a dozen or so tentacles. Some of them held cameras at various angles, sending input into his amazing nanite chain brain. Others propelled him by dragging his body around. A few were reserved for directly manipulating his surroundings, like human hands. Today he was in a floating configuration, gliding around on gravity repellers. I paused in concern to inspect his propulsion systems, making sure they weren't powerful enough for full flight. He'd been forbidden to outfit himself as a ship. He'd gotten into serious trouble every time I'd allowed him that luxury. Flitting around the station was one thing, but having full run of the star system was quite another. I'd made the mistake of giving him flight permission in the past, and he'd provided me a large number of sleepless nights in return. The trouble with Marvin wasn't that he was an enemy. He was definitely on our side. But he got ideas. These ideas were things that no human could ever come up with, much less put into action. He was brilliant and useful, but also easily fascinated and obsessed— when I assigned him a critical task, often something no one else could do, it would get done eventually, but along the way he might become distracted by some idea of his own. He might want to grow a culture of intelligent microbes, for example, or explore a neighboring star system without permission. Marvin, I said, stepping forward and saluting him. He returned the gesture by slapping a tentacle to his brain box— it wasn't even close to a real salute, but it was the best I was going to get, so I didn't complain. Greetings, Colonel Riggs. I did a quick count on the number of cameras he had following me. Often, Marvin gave away his true intentions by focusing more or fewer cameras on a subject. Things that bored him were covered by one drifting electronic eye. Things that fascinated him received the attention of multiple panning, zooming cameras— this time, to my surprise, Marvin had several eyes on Sandra. I frowned, not understanding what he had in mind. Deciding I didn't have time to try to figure it out, I shrugged and pressed ahead. I've got a new project for you, Marvin. I want a carrier ship produced quickly with minimum downtime. Here are Miklos' initial plans. Go over those, make adjustments for performance and faster production times. When you're done, oversee the production. By the end of this little speech, I'd gained the attention of four more of his cameras. I'm surprised by these instructions, Colonel, he said. I've been working on the sensory data incoming from the Thor system. I've... Yes, I know that was your prior assignment. 
Do you have any new datum to report? No, Colonel, I... Then perhaps you've come up with a hypothesis to explain the situation. No, sir. However, I haven't been allowed to make direct contact with the crustaceans. If I were allowed to converse with them myself, I'm sure... Not going to happen, Marvin, I said. But I'm here now, and if it makes you any happier, you'll be the first to know what is discussed between Star Force and the crustaceans. Ah, Marvin said. I see. I'm to serve as a translator bot again. You're still better at it than any other brain boxes, so yes. I could tell Marvin was miffed. He wanted to be given diplomatic tasks to complete. I'd long since decided that was never going to happen. The mere suggestion gave my command staff fits, but I hardly needed their cautioning. Marvin could do the job, certainly. He understood the languages of the various races in our local space better than any being in existence. He was also very good at manipulation and getting what he wanted out of a conversation. Unfortunately, I couldn't trust him to take such a conversation in the direction I wanted it to go— if he came up with an idea of his own, which he no doubt would consider extremely interesting, the entire diplomatic exchange might well transform into one of Marvin's crusades to gain some tidbit of information the rest of us found useless. The group proceeded up to the center of the station, into the primary control center. Marvin was watching all of us, but mostly me and Sandra. I knew he was thinking about something, but I simply didn't have time to play games with him. When we reached the center and began going over reports, Miklos got my attention. Yes, what is it, Commodore? I asked. Sir, I could not help but notice you've already altered my blueprints. He thrust a tablet at me. I glanced at the tablet in his hands but didn't take it. The design is essentially unchanged, I said. I know that, sir, but I'm talking about the number of carriers to be produced. I see only one listed here. The Defiant. You've typed in that name at the top. You don't approve of the name? Don't worry, it's only a placeholder. The new captain will rename her as per our traditions. Maybe you want me to call it Barbarossa again. Twice in the recent past, we'd built ships named Barbarossa, the first of which had been Miklos' command. Both ships had been destroyed within months of their construction— it had become something of a joke among the enlisted men. They often told one another they'd been assigned to the third version of Barbarossa and were therefore certain to die soon. Miklos looked pained for a moment. Defiant is a fine name, sir. But my original plans called for three carriers, not one. Ah, I see, I said, nodding my head. I'd known what he was getting at all along, but I hadn't felt like making this easy for him. It is quite possible the second and third ships will be constructed. We'll do them one at a time. If the first one proves itself, there will be more. Miklos thought about that. I could tell he didn't like it. Building components for all three, then assembling all three, would be faster, sir. Only by a few hours, I checked. Also, if we do it my way, we'll have a working ship up in a few days. That gives us something to deploy right away if needed. Miklos nodded in defeat. Yes, sir. I understand your logic. He turned away and began a surprise inspection of the gunnery crews. I could tell he was in a bad mood. The crews were going to have a long day. Sandra stepped close to me and spoke quietly. He really wants those ships? He's fleet, I said. He can't get enough ships, never. What kind of hardware do you like best, Kyle? I looked at her, bemused by the question. I like whatever destroys the enemy most effectively. Watching them blow up gives me a surge of joy, it really does. I believe you. I began going over the latest reports while Miklos eyed his tablet in frustration. There was no intel coming in from the Thor system. Nothing. We'd sent a number of requests to the crustaceans, and they'd all been ignored. I was increasingly curious and annoyed at the same time. Somehow the crustaceans always managed to irritate me. They just had that kind of personality. 
Every interaction we'd had with them had resulted in us being surprised at the result, and not in a good way. My staff transferred themselves to the battle station, merging with the regular crew on the command deck. It was an impressive affair. When building a station the size of a small moon with nearly limitless supplies of materials, you can afford to go big. After having the station nearly knocked out due to losing the bridge area in previous engagements, I'd overhauled the design and drilled deep into the bedrock of the asteroid the station encompassed. The command deck could no longer be easily taken out, not without destroying the entire structure. It was at the very center of the asteroid itself. The primary chamber of the command deck was a good 10,000 square feet in size and enclosed by four-foot-thick walls of steel laced with self-repairing smart metals. Beyond those walls was a belt-like corridor that connected staff living chambers and specialized command equipment rooms. A spray of corridors radiated out from the beltway corridor like spokes on a wheel. Under the command deck was the cavernous main hold, full of ordnance and supplies. Above us was the troop barracks and armory. Beyond all of these was a wall of dense rock about two hundred feet thick. Outside the rock wall was the saucer-shaped superstructure encrusted with weaponry. The new fighter bays were located in the superstructure. I reviewed our state of readiness carefully. We were tight and ready for action. It was galling. I'd built this entire monstrosity to face the last threat, an attack by the macros via the Thor system. Once again, I'd failed to anticipate our next need, which now appeared to be providing support for the inhabitants of the Thor system. Colonel, asked Miklos. I turned to him, almost startled. You're back, I asked. Are you sneaking up on me? Miklos smiled faintly. I've been standing right here looking at your screen. Am I right in assuming the station is in an excellent state of readiness? You're absolutely right on that point. Where's Major Sloan? I want to congratulate him on his accomplishments here. He's gone beyond what I thought was possible in six months. He's inspecting the fighter base, Miklos said. I looked at him questioningly. Miklos cleared his throat. I took the liberty of telling him about the carriers we're building. He's deciding which wings to send, which pilots are best suited to the task. I laughed. One carrier, Miklos. Just one for now. If it proves itself, we'll talk about building more. Of course, sir. I shook my head and turned my attention back to my screens. Miklos was my executive officer, and we had made a decision together. But somehow I'd expected to bring it up at a general staff meeting. Apparently things weren't happening fast enough for Miklos' taste. Miklos didn't wander off. He lingered at my side. What's on your mind, Commodore? May I show you something, sir? I frowned at him, then I caught on. You've got another design, don't you? Just a few ideas. You can pull up the file there. He pointed to a blinking icon on my desktop. It hadn't been there a moment ago. I tapped on it and frowned as a schematic unfolded. There were layers and decks and details. My frown deepened. You've been working on this for months. No one could come up with it so fast. My staff is very efficient, sir, he murmured. Don't bullshit me. I've got a lot of experience designing ships, and with bullshitting. Just so, sir. I heaved a breath and began going over the plans. They were very detailed. I liked them immediately, except for one thing. They weren't simple. There was no way this ship could be slapped together with existing parts. Hold on, I said, interrupting Miklos' pitch. This isn't what we agreed to. Are the designs flawed? No, of course not. This ship will be a magnificent addition to the fleet when we build it, but I'm not ready to commit so much material and specialized components. I want something we can slap together like a macro cruiser. These point defense systems, for example, elaborate and expensive. 
the mothership must be protected from missiles. Right, well, you told me the ship would be protected by its fighters. You said it would operate as a simple garage for a mass of smaller ships. This is much more than that. This is a miniature version of this battle station. A mobile version, sir. And the primary guns? What the hell were you thinking? I don't want this ship anywhere near a battle that requires heavy rail guns. Miklo's expression was a combination of chagrin and stubbornness. The fighters aren't able to bombard a world themselves, sir. They lack heavy weapons. Yeah, I know. That's the whole bloody point of a fighter. We both stared at the designs for another minute in silence. I knew I had some hard decisions to make, and Miklos wasn't going to like them. I figured that was just too bad. All right, I said. We'll keep your designs for later, when we have the time and resources to build a showboat. But for now, I'm going to make a copy of this whole thing and do some serious editing for the first prototype ship. I closed the project file and tapped at the screen. I copied the entire folder of data and renamed the new copy Showboat. Then I brought up the original file and began deleting things. The first thing I did was tear out generators. Big ships the size of a macro cruiser normally had three generators, two to run the engines and one to run the weapons batteries. Miklos had no less than six power systems in his design, overkill in my opinion. I deleted all but two. Miklos looked physically ill. Colonel, he protested. The vessel can't possibly... Hold on, I'm not done, I said. I brought up the forward batteries and removed all the heavy rail guns and laser turrets. I left only six small point defense lasers. At each of these scattered emplacements, I added a garbage can-sized generator. I did this by dragging and dropping components with my fingers. See? I said. Those power consumption meters are already out of the red and into the yellow. The ship won't have the capacity for most mission assignments with these changes, and the power usage is still overloaded. That's because I'm not done editing yet, I said. He looked horrified. Look, I said, I've taken into consideration your concern about missiles. These little turrets are the only armament this ship is going to have, but they'll stop a mild missile assault. With independent power for all the PD turrets, they can't be knocked out at once. Even if the ship's main power is gone, they'll still function. But the engines, sir, two primary generators won't carry the load. I swiped the screen rapidly, paging through the decks until I had the engine rooms displayed. There were three primary engines. I removed one. That'll fix it. She'll be slow. She won't be able to keep up with the rest of the fleet. Yes, I agreed. She'll be slow. Remember the design goals. This vessel is a strategic platform. We'll only move it into regions we consider to be safe. Once it gets into position, it will set up camp. It's not designed to fly into battle as a front-line ship, and I know how I can speed it up even more. I brought up the hull specifications next and began thinning down the outer shielding. Miklos tugged at his beard in distress, but said nothing. By the time I was done, the ship looked something like what I'd envisioned when Miklos had originally sold me on this idea. I saved the design and mailed him a copy. Then I turned to him. Two days, I told him. What, sir? To build this thing from scratch would take six days, I said, tapping the indicated estimate at the upper left corner of the design screen. But you don't have six days. You've got two. That's all. Miklos looked at me in bewilderment. I turned to face him and straightened my spine. He did the same. All my people understood the body language and the look I gave him next. They knew when they saw that stare I meant business. In this case, Miklos knew he was about to get an order he didn't like. He wasn't wrong about that. You have two days to build this thing, Commodore. I said, jabbing my finger at the image on the screen. After that, I'm flying out to see what's heating up Yale's oceans. I don't care if the lobsters answer us or not in the meantime. I don't care if your ship, fighters, and pilots aren't ready yet. We're leaving in two days. But we don't have the production capacity. 
Miklos began, then trailed off. Most of the factories and materials are back on Eden 8, sir. We can't even fly them out here that soon. I could tell that my pronouncement had shocked him. He was a hard man to rattle, but I think I had managed it this time. We have many of these components in storage, I said. You'll use the stores aboard the battle station first, then build new elements second. If you have to strip a few pieces out of this station, I'll approve it. The only thing you have to build fresh is the bones of the ship, and then do the assembly. I'll talk to Sloan about that. Don't worry about him giving you the runaround. You'll have his entire crew to help out, a thousand of them, suited up and ready to do the assembly by hand. Miklos raised his eyebrows at this offer of support and nodded. May I ask a question, Colonel? Certainly. Why two days? Number one, because I've calculated it can be done in that amount of time if you work around the clock. Number two, because I already ordered a complement of ships to meet us here from the Helios Ring Garrison. We'll form up a fleet and fly when they get here. And the need for speed is... Because I don't like what I'm seeing in the Thor system. I don't like watching something strange happening just beyond our borders. I'm going to go out there and find out what it's all about. And I'm flying two days from now. Two days, said Miklos, his eyes looking unfocused. He nodded a moment later, then turned around and ran out of the command center. Everyone on duty swiveled their heads in surprise. When a nanotized member of Star Force decides to really kick it into gear, it's a startling thing to watch. One second he was standing and calmly deliberating over plans with me, and the next second he bounded over tables, pushed off from the ceiling twelve feet over our heads, then slammed down on his feet and sprinted to the doors. He surprised the doors themselves, even though they were made of fresh smart metal. He slipped through them the moment they flashed open widely enough to allow him to pass, folding his body and causing a spray of droplets like mercury to shower the Beltway Corridor beyond. After that, he vanished from sight. The staff looked at me, but I turned back to the designs and ignored them. On the floor, droplets of silvery metal chased one another. They would eventually form veins of shimmering liquid, then coalesce into a door again. I smiled contentedly. I didn't know where Miklos was going or what he planned to do first, but I always liked to see my people hustle. Chapter 4 Two days later, the fleet arrived. It amounted to half my complement of ships from the Helios Ring garrison. No one really liked the idea of stripping ships from that border, as Earth had attacked us with a serious armada not long ago through that very ring. But that was the only ready supply of ships I had, so I had no choice. The fleet was a small one. All told, there were less than a hundred vessels. Two-thirds of them were smaller ships, ugly, stubby gunboats. Each of these were armed with a single heavy railgun that was the equivalent of a macro cruiser's belly turret. They had little armament other than that one heavy gun. The rest of the ships were nano-type cruisers and destroyers. Absent from the roster was one carrier. Miklos had not quite managed to pull it off yet. Sir, give me one more day he said. I shook my head. No. I thought I'd said it gently, but I could see he wasn't happy. He was red-eyed and squinting from lack of sleep. He fought visibly not to have a public outburst, which would no doubt turn into a gush of curse words thrown in my direction. I watched him with interest. Miklos had never quite been in such a state of frustration, at least not that I'd seen. I chalked it up to the lack of sleep. You've done very well, but your best was not quite good enough, I said. Also, you need to get some rest, man. Part of an officer's responsibility in my fleet is to maintain his readiness, all things in moderation, as they say. Miklos glowered at the screen, unable to lift his burning eyes up to me. I walked away to the big view screens on the walls. They were so high resolution, they looked like windows. Outside the station sat a hulking shadow. It looked quite a bit like the carrier I'd designed in a ten-minute stretch a few days earlier. 
but there were holes in it. In the hull, not all the smart metal had been troweled over the exterior. Shame about the holes, I said. For some reason, this put Miklos over the edge. For your information, Colonel, he snapped, those holes are your doing. I glanced back at him in surprise. Really? How did I manage that? By redesigning the ship with too thin of an exterior layer of smart metal, the ship was designed to use the thick hull as part of its structural integrity. We haven't been able to compensate. I nodded and made a clucking sound. While well, my design was only a starting point, really, you can adjust it. We will, Miklo said. But there wasn't any time in the schedule for a redesign and correction. I frowned at the ship. Really, it was an impressive effort. I felt myself bending. I didn't like it, as bending wasn't my way. To get things done, a leader had to establish the rules and stick to them. If people started getting the idea your deadlines were only guidelines, they would relax and nothing would get done. It was only human nature. Still, I liked the idea of having this ship on the expedition into the Thor system. It would transform a thin force into a much stronger one. I'd begun to think of the carrier as a small mobile battle station, and the idea of having such a flying fortress to back me up was seductive. I'll tell you what, Commodore. The task force will get underway now, but I'll leave behind ten small ships. They will form your carrier's escort. When your carrier is ready, send it out to the crustacean worlds after me. Miklos looks startled. You want the ship to come in later? As a relief force? Yes. In some ways, this improves the plan. We can head out with the vanguard at top speed and render any assistance we can. Then your carrier group will follow to a safely established position. This way the ship won't slow down the entire fleet. If you finish tomorrow, it will come in two days behind us. That's not too long to wait for the support. I glanced at him again. The transformation in his mood was obvious and dramatic. The light of hope had returned to his dark eyes. You will get that support, sir, he said. But did you say carriers, as in the plural form? Yes, I said. I'm impressed by the design, and the versatility is there, at least on the planning boards. I want two of them. Stay here after the first one is done and finish a second. Don't let anyone sit on their hands here at the station. Double shifts for everyone. I heard a few groans from the staffers, but pretended I hadn't noticed. You'll stay here, I continued. When you finish the second ship, send it with another fighter wing stripped from the battle station to the Helios Ring garrison. That will make up for having their strength reduced so significantly. You'll stay in system even after the ships are built. In my absence, you'll be in charge of defending our colonies. Miklos nodded rapidly. I can do that, sir. I almost laughed. Given the chance to build a second of his beloved carriers, all his plans to rave at me had instantly faded. I had to admire his dedication to fleet. He was passionate about his forces. Ah, uh, who should command the first carrier, sir? He asked a moment later. Give it to Captain Saren. She's a senior officer, and she's in line for a new ship. Captain Jasmine Saren had an interesting history which was intertwined with my own. She and I had worked together from the very start of Star Force, and we'd become... close. Too close for my girlfriend Sandra's comfort. Saren had left my service and joined Crow last year, thereby gaining a promotion to the rank of Admiral. But she'd soon seen the error of her ways and returned to my banner with the reduced rank of captain. As of today, I had her captaining a destroyer with a crew of only six. I knew she'd see the new captaincy as a promotion, one which I thought she'd earned. Captain Saren was informed of the change in plans and requested a private channel with me. I took the call in my stateroom aboard the cruiser Lozaro, which was to serve as my command ship for this mission. The small fleet was just getting underway. Sending through a few ships at a time, we wriggled through the ring and glided into the Thor system. 
Colonel Riggs. Hello, Jasmine. I just got the news from Miklos. Thank you very much. I won't disappoint you, sir. Her pretty face appeared on my screen, her image updating a few seconds behind her voice due to transmission relays and other propagation delays. My cruiser was in the Thor system now, accelerating away from the ring toward the gas giant the crustacean moon circled. Jasmine was still back on Welter Station. I know you won't, Captain, I said. That ship is ugly and slow, but she's powerful. Jasmine was as pretty as ever. Dark hair, dark eyes, perfect nose and lips. I'd been taken with her since the first time I'd met her. She was slight and quiet, but tougher than she looked. And she was always, always competent. Any special orders for me, Colonel? Yes, I said. Get that ship finished, and get out to Thor as soon as you can. If possible, take over the task of playing assembly boss for Miklos. He's not taking proper care of himself. Ah, uh, isn't he just doing what you asked him to do, Colonel? A man's got to learn to pace himself. But, Colonel, if you order a man to do something and give him an impossible schedule, he's going to overwork himself. Surely you can see that? I frowned at the screen. You want me to take responsibility for the man's condition? I guess I may have accidentally over-motivated him, if such a thing is possible. But in any case, he needs a few hours off. I'll see what I can do, sir, she said. I thought I heard a small sigh escape her. Very good. Rigs out. A day later, we were halfway to the Crustacean homeworlds. Happy news came in from Welter Station. The carrier was finished. Miklos reported this to me with obvious pride. I thanked him, praised his efforts, then ordered him to build the second one immediately. And get some sleep, man. You look like hell. Yes, sir. When I broke the connection, I found Sandra standing behind me with her arms crossed. My immediate thought was she'd found out about my giving the carrier to Jasmine and knew I was bringing her along on this mission. She did look annoyed, but not openly pissed. This was a fine line in her expressions. I decided to play it cool. Hey, honey. How about we get some chow down at the wardroom? This cruiser has the best food in the fleet. I ordered up a supply of frozen air swimmers from Eden 8 just for you. Her expression softened, but her arms stayed crossed. Dinner now? she asked. We're only hours away from planet four. I shook my head. Plenty of time. Nothing's shooting at us yet. I wanted to talk to you about something first. There it was, I thought. It was the Jasmine thing. It had to be. Jealousy was a prime motivator on Sandra's hierarchy of emotions. It outweighed hunger every time. I want to ask you about Miklos, she said. I think you've been working him too hard. I blinked. This was an unexpected but welcome turn of conversation. I began to smile. He's been driving himself too hard lately. I agree with that. I just told Jasmine, uh, Captain Saren, to take over the construction effort from him. He's been driving himself because you ordered him to do it, Kyle. Sandra admonished me. You can't tell people to work harder and at the same time tell them to take breaks. I just want people to do their best, I said. They often don't take into account the need for balance in order to achieve that. What it sounds like to them is a set of contradictory orders. I shrugged. How about those air swimmers? They're great when broiled. I'll have the cook dip them in butter and garlic. Okay, she said, weakening. I stood up and took her arm. We headed toward the exit when I got an idea. I bent and kissed her. She kissed me back. We stopped and didn't take another step toward the door for a while. Somehow we'd begun making out. What happened to dinner? she asked. I'm not that hungry. She laughed, then pulled away a fraction. Her eyebrows knit together. You gave a new ship to Jasmine, I heard. Damn, I thought. Talk about a mood deflator. I tried to smile. 
Yeah, she's senior, and her talents were wasted on a destroyer. What ship did you give her? I hesitated. I could tell she already knew the answer. How could she have heard the rumor without knowing what it was about? She just wanted to see a full confession. The new carrier, I admitted. You know what she's going to call it? No, not yet. One of Star Force's oldest traditions dictated that new ships were named by the captain. It dated back to the early days when nano ships plucked their captains out of their beds. After passing the deadly tests and taking command, the new people had been given the honor of naming the ship that had tormented them. She's going to call it Gata, Sandra said. You seem to know more about current events than I do. That's part of my job. I moved in for another kiss, but she dodged me. Don't you want to know what Gatter means? Um, no, not really. It means something like calloused or stubborn in Hindi. I frowned. Did she tell you that? No, I looked it up. I nodded, but had no idea why we were having this conversation. I reached out a hand toward her shapely hip but she pushed it away automatically. I could see the look on her face was one of concentration. She really was interested in this carrier. Her eyes studied mine with sudden intensity. Why did you give that ship to her, Kyle? She asked. My face went blank in surprise. When it comes to women, I'm a bumbling idiot. But I've learned to sense traps when they're laid at my feet. I was on guard immediately. I knew I had to step very carefully. Uh, I began, my mind churning. Because she deserved a serious command? Yes, I know that, she said, her eyes searching my face. But I don't think you made the right decision. People have feelings, you know. I heaved a sigh. I didn't like where this might be going. Was she going to have another jealous fit? I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to upset you. Me? I'm not talking about me. Then what are you talking about? Miklos, of course. He wanted that command. He built this ship. He has dreamt of it for months. He hardly talks about anything else, you know. No, I didn't realize that, but don't worry, I'll give him the second ship. The second one? I filled her in on Miklos' new orders. By the end, she was satisfied, and a few minutes later, we were back to kissing. Soon I was as satisfied as she was. By the time we made it down to get our platter of broiled air swimmers, the kitchen had run out for the night. But after a disappointed look from me, they headed back to the freezers and thawed another batch. Rank does have its privileges. Chapter 5 the first day's voyage into the Thor system was tense but uneventful. We were expecting something to happen at any moment. Every hour we stared at the screens, made countless attempts to open channels, and continuously scanned the moons ahead. What if we're too late? Sandra asked me. I glanced at her and went back to staring at the screens. The same thought had occurred to me. What if the crustaceans had been too proud to ask their enemies for help? What if they'd waited until the last, and what we'd heard had been the last gasp of a civilization? Now that we'd finally responded, there might not be anyone home to answer our call. Nonsense, I said. They're just stuffy and prideful. They're probably too embarrassed to tell us they have problems. You think they regret calling on us? That they're too proud to admit they need help? Exactly, I said. But we won't know the truth until they talk to us or we get more solid data. More long hours passed. During this time, the carrier Gotter was crewed and launched back in the Eden system. It came into the Thor system behind us, trailing its tiny flotilla of support ships. When a call finally did come into my command center, it was from Captain Saren rather than the Crustaceans. Where are the ships, Colonel? Jasmine asked me when I opened the private line to her carrier. I don't know, I admitted. 
We haven't seen them fly above their atmosphere on any of the three worlds since we entered the Thor system. I don't like it, she said. It looks like a trap. That or the aftermath of a tremendous catastrophe. Jasmine didn't answer me for a while. When she finally did, her voice was hushed, almost as if the things we were discussing were too terrible to be spoken aloud. Perhaps they were. You think they're all dead? she asked. That's why they aren't talking. We'll find out when we reach orbit. But it might be too late by then. If there is something so powerful, it could erase a species from three worlds that quickly. Your fleet may not stand a chance. I chuckled. If this entire fleet turns into vapor, your orders are to do a U-turn with that carrier and get back to Welter Station. Then close all the shutters and hide in the cellar. She didn't seem amused. Don't you at least have a theory, Colonel? Of course I do, I said. But I've got nothing to go on. Guesses aren't helpful, so I'm going to wait until we have some hard evidence. Privately, I felt certain the prideful crustaceans would never have called me for help unless they were desperate. Whatever was going on out here, it was serious. The second day went on as had the first— we sailed through space, coming closer and closer to the gas giant in the habitable zone. More than a day's flight behind us was Captain Saren's carrier group. I monitored the new ship's vitals from the beginning. There were a few glitches, and she was slow. I calculated that it would take Gotter more than two days to reach the home planets of the crustaceans. It would be closer to three days. The moons, Yale, Harvard, and Princeton— now we're visible using our long-range optics. They were strange worlds, beautiful in their own way. I reflected that calling them moons was really only a technical description. They were planets, just like any other. They did happen to be locked in orbit around a larger planetary body. But isn't every planet locked around its star? They were nothing like the sterile rocks we called moons back in the solar system. Two of the worlds had so much water on them, there was virtually no land to be found on the surface. The depths of these oceans were tremendous. As we drew closer, our readings indicated that the third moon, Yale, had the deepest oceans of the three, and that it was even more alien than we'd thought. Yale had no land at all. Submarines can't normally go deeper than a few thousand feet due to the tremendous pressure. The requirement for breathable gas inside creates such a difference in pressure that the hulls of most subs will collapse if they continue to sink. On Earth, our oceans are about 30,000 feet at their deepest, but the oceans of Yale were deeper still. Our instruments measured the rocky bottom and detected it at some 200,000 feet down in places. At that depth, there is so much pressure that water transforms into alternate states— Back on Earth, I'd been accustomed to ice, steam, and liquid water. But when you stack up water deeply enough, with enough crushing weight, it takes on new physical properties. It becomes solid and hotter. A type of hot ice develops. Our fleet eggheads told me about it with a strange light in their eyes. The pleading transmissions had come from Yale, as well as the strange readings we were getting now. The oceans were a full six degrees hotter than they'd been a week ago, and still there was no discernible reason for any of these changes. When we were only nine hours out from orbit, Marvin came to consult with me. He seemed to be in a state of agitation. He couldn't stand still. His metal tentacles slapped the deck like fish in the bottom of a boat. It was very distracting, but I'd seen this behavior before. Marvin was excited about something. What is it, Marvin? I asked him. You look like you're about to pee your pants. Reference unclear. I do not urinate. In fact, I have few liquids in my structure, with the possible exception of lubrication reservoirs. Are you suggesting I've sprung a leak, Colonel? Or is this somehow an apt reference to my findings? I chuckled. It's an idiom. I'm suggesting you're excited and agitated. Cameras studied me. You can infer that from my behavior? Yes. Now tell me what you want. I've got a lot of data to go over. 
That's exactly it, sir. I think there's something in the data we've missed. He finally had my full attention. Tell me about it. It all came from my previous geological studies concerning the smaller celestial bodies in this system. Remember when we flew into the system and scanned it? I've been comparing that data to the current scans we've been reading since our arrival in the Thor system. What have you found? It's very interesting. There's a discrepancy on my readings of the third moon, Yale, a variation in measurable mass. I frowned. In mass? I asked. Suddenly I understood his earlier remark about me making an apt comment. He meant the world had literally sprung a leak. So the planet is smaller than it was before? Yes, he said. What could be causing such a change? A leak, of course. I stared at him for a moment, finally catching on. I turned to the screens and flipped through maps and models. You're telling me their oceans are draining away, I said. How long has this been going on? A camera snaked over my left shoulder and gazed down at the table with me. I knew it was only Marvin's way of seeing something from my perspective. He did this from time to time, peeking over people's shoulders with one of his many eyes. It helped him to understand what we were talking about when discussing visual input, because he could study what we were seeing. Most found it disconcerting, but I understood why he did it, and so it didn't bother me. Marvin's visual input was different from the human norm. He had many more eyes, variable numbers of them, actually, and he could be looking at several things at once. Unlike humans who were built to visually study one part of their environment at a time, Marvin could see many at once. His cameras weren't as good as our eyes, but he made up for that by having a lot of them. Due to this major variation in visual input and processing, his perspective on the visual environment around us was quite different. Rather than looking only at the item we were discussing, he liked to use his mobile visual sensory systems to try to see my point of view. He wasn't very good at indirect empathy, but he excelled at direct mimicry of behavior. Finally, I had the data he was referring to. It had been in an old file saved months ago. According to this, the planetary mass of Yale is about 1% lower than it was when you made your original readings. That's incredible. Have you got anything else, Marvin? He slid up beside me at the table. Possibly, he said. I looked at him expectantly. He studied me with many cameras at once. I knew he wanted me to ask him more about it and to praise him for his accomplishments. He was odd that way. He liked it when people begged him for facts. He also liked to keep secrets. Sometimes he used critical details of information as bargaining chips to gain privileges. Usually these privileges came in the form of an approval to perform some kind of nasty experiment. I'd played his little game many times. Over the years I'd worked up a counter to his manipulations. I decided to employ it now. My first move was to nod and tap the screen, closing the file. Very good, Marvin, I said. I think I have enough for now. You've done an excellent job. Once again, you've proven to me that my decision to make you my science officer was the correct one. Marvin's cameras flicked from the blank screen to my blank face and back again. Don't you wish to study the matter further, Colonel Riggs? he asked. I shrugged and reached for a cup of algae-based coffee. You're the science officer. You've made the call. Your commander has been briefed, and you've decided he's heard all there is of value to know. I trust your judgment on this one. That's very gratifying, Colonel Riggs. Good. Now, if you don't mind, I have a number of issues to attend to before we reach orbit. We're only a few hours from planet fall. But I think there might be something else to discuss. Oh, yeah? I asked, trying to look bored. I fooled with my coffee mug, adding cream and sugar. I hated cream and sugar. Marvin appeared disappointed. His tentacles drooped and stopped thrashing. Yes, there's a localized point where the leak is occurring. You know where the leak is? I asked. Yes, at least I have it down to a 100-square-mile region of the Southern Oceans. I nodded. With languid slowness, I reached out and tapped at the screen. I knew I couldn't afford to appear eager. I opened the file, but didn't bother to flip to the appropriate screen. Instead, I paused to sip my coffee. Algae-based coffee tastes pretty bad to begin with, 
but with sugar in it, the flavor had moved from sewery to sugary sewery. I winced, but tried to hide my disgust. Marvin studied me and finally couldn't handle it anymore. He reached up with two tentacles and touched the screen, making spreading motions and spinning the globe of Yale to the correct angle. I smiled slightly. It was kind of fun to make him impatient for once. His tentacles rattled and scratched on the touch screen until he had the correct view displayed. By this time, several staffers had taken note of our conversation and stepped up to watch. I ignored them and pretended to be enjoying my coffee. It was a good thing, I figured, that Marvin had no sense of smell. If he had, he'd have known right away I was faking. On the screen, he displayed a region known as light blue on the moon's surface. For the most part, Yale had no real features. It had clouds and a little scrim of polar ice at the top and bottom of the world, but no land. With only endless ocean encircling the core of the world, there wasn't much to see. But in spots like light blue, the ocean floor had heaved up closer to the surface. In this region, the color of the surface changed. Most of the world was so thickly covered in deep water, it was almost black, even when the bright light of Thor shined down directly upon it. But light blue was different. It looked like one of Earth's oceans. The shallow area? I said. Isn't that the highest underwater mountain range on Yale? Yes, it is also one of the most thickly inhabited regions. The crustaceans can't survive in the deepest oceans, which have an estimated depth of 200,000 feet. I studied the imagery. It didn't look right to me. Is that a whirlpool? I asked incredulously. Yes, Marvin said. It's so large, I believed it to be a storm at first. But now I know the truth. The water is circling, draining away. What could be down there? I asked. What could possibly swallow such a fantastic volume of liquid? Marvin was perking up. He sensed my interest, and I'd given him urgent questions which could be evaded. I knew instantly what he was thinking. Soon he might manage to gain a hold over me. I smiled because I knew his game, and for once I was one jump ahead of the sneaky robot. I'd figured out the answer to my own question before I'd asked it. I snapped my fingers as if getting a sudden flash of insight. I know, I said. It's a ring. It's got to be. A ring at the bottom of the sea, draining the water away to nowhere. What else could it be? Marvin looked stunned. For a full second, none of his numerous limbs or input devices moved. When they moved again, they were deflated like a dozen wilting flowers on a hot August day. That matches my assessment, he said. Somehow, I said, a ring has opened up at the bottom of their ocean. What an ingenious form of attack. You think this is an attack? I nodded. Either that or the crustaceans were experimenting. Maybe they tried to open up a pathway from their home world to another star system. Maybe the attempt backfired horribly. I proceeded to disseminate Marvin's data to the command staff and the entire fleet. I made sure it was transmitted back to Eden as well. While this went on, Marvin studied me and the data. I knew he was horribly disappointed. He'd given up his data without getting anything for it. When I managed to slip out of his sight, I dumped the ghastly coffee on the deck of the conference chamber and watched the ship's nanite hull absorb it. Moments later, it was released outside the hull as the waste it truly was. The ship knew garbage when it encountered it. But Marvin wasn't quite done yet. He came to me less than an hour later. I have a new theory, Colonel. Would you like to hear it? If you think it's absolutely necessary, I said, I'm very busy. It concerns Yale's oceans. I believe I know the cause for the rise in temperature. Oh, that. Never mind, then. Marvin appeared to be stunned again. You don't have any interest in this critical detail? He asked. I'm interested, all right, but I've already figured it out. As the oceans recede, the deep, deep hot ice is being exposed. The rapid lowering of the sea is causing the hot ice to break down and heat up the water. Does that match your theories, Marvin? Yes, he said. Crushed again, he wandered away a few minutes later. Since my conversation with Marvin, I'd been poring over science texts. I'd learned about the changed state of water at great depths, 
and the hot ice phenomenon. It had been difficult, but the look on Marvin's structure was worth it all now. I grinned after him and whispered to myself, We'll chalk that one up for the dumbass human. Chapter 6 When we were about half an hour out from Yale, all hell broke loose. At the time, I was in the ship's head, relieving myself. The ship was under heavy deceleration, but when you have to go, you have to go. Operating a ship's elimination system when under several G's of force can be a difficult operation by itself, as anyone who's done it can tell you. Things went from bad to worse, however, when the ship's klaxons went off and the vessel heeled over, engaging its automatic evasion routines. I cursed and found myself sliding on my back across the chamber. Fortunately, spilled wastes were quickly removed by the smart metal floor. When I managed to get out of the head, I struggled up the corridor to the bridge. I was slammed from one side to the other as the ship rocked and lurched. The inertial stabilizers were offline due to power requirements. The engines were burning at full throttle to keep us from crashing into those deep blue oceans, and the rest of the power went to the weapon systems. I crawled into the command center and found a crash seat to strap into— it wasn't the one I was assigned to, but that was just too bad for whatever staffer I'd displaced. I managed to connect to the fleet command channel and listen to the chatter long enough to figure out what was going on. We were under attack. This is Riggs, I said, trying to sound calm. Give me counts and ranges. What have we got incoming right now? Missiles, sir. No ships, just missiles. About two thousand of them. My mind glazed over. I didn't have to do the math. We were at close range, and we didn't have enough time to lock on and shoot down that many missiles. Not if crustacean missiles were as good as macro missiles at finding their targets. They were going to hurt us, and hurt us badly. It was all a trick, Kyle, Sandra said on a private line to my helmet. Those bastards! We'll lose half the fleet! Fire everything we have back at them! We can at least hurt them this time! My mind had come out of shock and was now racing. I couldn't believe it. These vicious lobsters had done it twice in a row. I'd not underestimate them again if I ever got another opportunity. Stop decelerating, I roared. I want every pilot to plot an individual course. Bring your noses around and accelerate toward Yale, but do it at an angle. I want you all to miss the moon, naturally, but slowing down will just make us easier targets. We need to do a flyby as fast as we can— giving them as little opportunity to shoot us down as possible. Within twenty seconds, the pilot of Lazaro had followed my orders. The results were gut-wrenching. A normal human without nanite-hardened organs would have passed out or quite possibly died. For us Marines, however, there was no such simple relief. We lived, remained conscious, and suffered. It felt as if someone had a firm grip on my intestines and was hell-bent on unraveling them. The point defense systems were firing now on full automatic. Vac suits, everyone! I shouted over the command channel. Assume your vessel will lose pressure before this is over. I want zero casualties from decompression. It was all up to a few thousand brain boxes now. The missiles would be hitting their first targets within eight minutes. I'd been watching the counters displayed on the big wall screens. I'd learned to count again by this time. We weren't going to get them all. Some of my ships were about to be destroyed. The only question was whether or not any of us would make it home. As I got over my initial shock, the emotion that followed wasn't fear. It was rage. None of this made any sense. Why would the crustaceans do something like this? Sure, they didn't like us. But going to the trouble of draining their own world, of damaging their own habitat just to make this ruse convincing— I couldn't fathom that kind of dedication to deceit. I tried to think, but it was difficult to do anything other than keep my guts in place and watch the ticking numbers on the displays. Red slivers were arcing closer every second. Occasionally one of them blinked out. But the rate of defensive hits was far too slow. My hopes that the majority of their missiles would be shot down faded. They were quality weapons. Probably they were spinning and coated with reflective polymers to deflect our lasers. 
Maybe they even had aerogel mists enveloping them, technology we'd only recently mastered ourselves. I slammed my fist down on the arm of my stolen chair. Even as I did so, a confused-looking lieutenant came into view. She was crawling toward me. I frowned at her, then saw her look up at me in shock. I realized then she must be trying to make it to the chair I was in. Her chair. I waved her away. She turned and crawled out of my sight. My mind wanted to feel bad for her, wanted to wonder if she would survive the next six minutes, the displays reported. But I didn't feel bad for her. I didn't have time. I had to think. I sucked in a breath and contacted Marvin. Marvin! I shouted. Yes, Colonel. Are you aboard this ship? I demanded. What ship, sir? No games, Marvin. Are you on the same ship I am right now? Yes, sir, at the moment. I felt relief. In general, when Marvin knew or even suspected an attack was coming, he tended to bug out early, sometimes very early, before anyone else even knew what was going to happen. The fact that he was still aboard was encouraging. It meant he was just as surprised as I was. Marvin, I need you to translate for me. Open a channel to these treacherous lobsters. They've never responded, sir. I don't care. I know they've been listening. Probably whatever I say will amuse them greatly, but I don't care about that either. Open the channel and translate. Channel open. I paused to suck in some air, and then I let loose. To the people of the water moon under the shadows of my ships... You're the least honorable of any species I've ever encountered. You are cheaters. You are ignorant and savage. I am a professor among my people. I hereby give you all a failing grade. There was no response for several seconds. I'd hoped to elicit some kind of defensive response out of them with my verbal attack. After all, they had no reason to stay quiet now. Their trap had been sprung, and staying quiet no longer benefited them. I also knew they were an arrogant, talkative race that valued academic achievement. Talk of failing grades should sting. But they didn't respond. I narrowed my eyes, squinting at the readouts. Less than four minutes left now until their missiles were among us. Four minutes from now, crews would die because I'd screwed up and believed these lobsters again. My anger deepened. My next thought was a dark one. I considered bombing their cities. They hadn't given us any ships to shoot at, but their civilian populations were vulnerable. We knew where they lived in their shallow reefs and deep grottos. We knew some of them were still alive. I lifted a fateful hand to press the transmission button again. The crews were waiting for my order to fire. I could feel it in my bones. But about a second before I gave the order to commit a billion intelligent beings to death— I had another thought. Scan those missiles, I roared. Has anyone done that? Are there macros flying those things? My thought was simple and horrible. What if the lobsters themselves, God love the son of bitches, weren't actually attacking us? What if the macros were behind it all? I knew the lobsters weren't easy to get along with, but I also knew they weren't suicidal. They must know what we could do to their populations. They would have done the math long ago. I could understand an ambush, but why would they let us get in so close before launching their surprise attack? Perhaps they hadn't. If macros held their underwater cities and were the ones firing the missiles, perhaps it was their math I was witnessing in its perfection. The macros had a treaty with the crustaceans, we knew that— just as they'd had a treaty with several other races. Of course, the first thing these machines always did when they signed a new treaty was try to find a way to break it. It was like making a deal with the proverbial wolf at the doorstep. It never stopped seeking a way in, a way to devour those it has bargained with. The macros might have suckered us in, then launched this late attack to provoke our response— that way, the lobsters would suffer mass casualties, we would lose a fleet, and the machines would be smiling as they presided over our collective funerals. They'd achieve the deaths of millions of fools at the cost of a few missiles and transmissions. Answer me! I roared. Are those missiles piloted by macros or not? 
No, sir, Marvin said. He sounded as calm and unruffled as he always did. No? Confirm that. The missiles are from crustacean bases? Yes, Colonel, he said. Every indication is that the crustaceans have launched this attack. I have no choice, then. Commanders target their civilian populations. Input Special Order Z. Do we have to, Kyle? Sandra asked me on a private channel. I ignored her. I stared at the blue, blue world below me. I wondered what it would be like to sail a ship on that glass-like sea. The water was warm, hot now even. The skies would be cloudy. But on a clear day, the world would be an endless, perfect expanse of blue. The tides were very large due to the gravitational tug of the gas giant in the sky. But I knew that even tidal waves back on Earth were small bumps in the road when out in the open ocean. They only became deadly when they washed up on shores. Those seas had to be idyllic. And I was about to turn them into radioactive soup. Two minutes left. Everyone was waiting for my final order to fire. Is that channel to the crustacean still open, Marvin? I asked. Yes, Colonel. Okay, transmit this. We do not understand your actions. Possibly we never will. We are different from you, but not without compassion. It is very possible the makeup of your brain structure does not allow for compassion. In that case, there can probably never be peace between our two peoples. Not until one of us is wiped out. I paused, then continued on. We came here to help you. We came here because you called us. We know your oceans are draining. We know they're heating up. We suspect that the machines have opened a ring under the sea, and the water is escaping from your world. Worse, this is causing the temperature to heat up due to the hot ice in the deepest— Where did you come by this information? A voice asked. I blinked in surprise. I'd been in the middle of a death speech, a haiku that was to lead to the annihilation of a world at the end, and quite possibly my own death. It took me a precious second to realize the enemy had at last responded. Where did we get this information? I repeated. We figured it out on our own. You said you needed help, and we came to give it. Along the way out here, we deduced what your problem was. We aren't stupid. Congratulations. You've achieved civilization. Please stop firing at our missiles. They have been deactivated. We have lost a fair number, and we need the rest. Marvin, mute the channel for a second. Done. Are they telling the truth? Are the missiles deactivated? Yes, apparently. They are no longer powered. Many have deviated course. Don't trust them, Kyle, Sandra said with vehemence. They are just playing another trick. Melt their cities. It's all we have left. I was surprised she'd been listening in. I shouldn't have been, but I was. I didn't have time to try to kick her off the line now, so I tried to ignore her words. But I found that I couldn't. She could be right. This could be one last trick designed to cause us to absorb the blow of a thousand missiles, letting them get in even closer before igniting the sky with the light of a million suns. Divert your missiles, and they won't be destroyed, I told the crustaceans. I switched to the command override channel a second later. Commanders, gunners, this is Colonel Riggs. Cease firing on any missile that is not directly targeting your vessel. That is an order. I'm attempting to negotiate a ceasefire. The point defense lasers that had been chattering steadily for several minutes slowed, then came to a stop. The sound reminded me of the final beats of a dying drum. Next, I opened the channel to both my people and the crustaceans. This is Colonel Kyle Riggs. If one of those missiles gets through just one and destroys a Star Force ship, I want every ship in the fleet to bomb your pre-assigned civilian targets. That is an order. There were thirty-one seconds left. No one said anything to me as the clock ticked down. I had time to wonder how many Star Force personnel I'd just gotten killed by trusting the crustaceans one last time.
Chapter 7 For the most part, the crews obeyed my orders. They stopped firing on missiles that weren't a direct threat to their own ships. This was possibly the biggest risk I'd taken. Not all my ships were able to defend themselves against incoming missiles. The gunboats in particular were vulnerable to this type of weapon. The cruisers and destroyers had numerous point defense systems, which were essentially automated laser turrets controlled by brain boxes with their own sensors. Normally, these larger ships had the job of screening the smaller ones. But today, I'd ordered them to turn off that screen to comply with the deal I'd made with the crustaceans. I couldn't even watch as the two lines converged on my screen. A shower of red splinters met with my ragged row of ships. But there were no hits, no explosions. The missiles diverted themselves or simply sputtered out and drifted. They sailed away from our fleet, falling into a broad orbit over Yale. Within a few minutes, everyone on my staff was sighing with relief, and a few were high-fiving one another. I guess they felt happy just to be alive. My own mood was much darker. I was angry with these aliens who'd tricked us and then turned the trick into some kind of test. I felt I'd been toyed with, and that the crustaceans were playing a deadly game with countless lives for their own strange amusement. My ships flew past the moon and scattered. When I was sure none of the missiles were following us, I ordered Marvin to reopen the channel. I wanted to talk to these crazy shellfish personally. I wanted to know what the hell they thought they were doing. Channel open, Marvin said. Hello, are you listening, crustaceans? This is Colonel Kyle Riggs, commander of all Star Force and Earth's representative in this system. We're listening. We've always been listening. Your every statement and action since our first encounter has been weighed and judged. That's great. Who am I talking to? Please identify yourself. This is Professor Hoon. Professor? I asked. I'd been expecting something more like a governor or an admiral, but I had to remind myself that these people valued an academic structure more than anything else. Yes. In addition to teaching at the highest levels, I've been a principal investigator in many ontological... Yeah, that's great, I said. No need to give me your full resume, Hoon. Let's talk seriously for a moment. Did you realize as our ships approached Yale that we were coming on a mission to render aid to your people? Of course. I'm afraid I'm going to have to lower your cognitive score by an additional 1.5 points. Your question was poorly worded, and worse, it demonstrates a clear lack of understanding of the situation. I stared at the walls for a second, my eyes unfocused. I was beginning to get a black, sick headache. When my eyes came back together, I spent a few seconds gazing at the deep blue of Yale's oceans, covered by swirls of white clouds. My expression shifted into a mask of rage. What the hell is wrong with you? I demanded. Do you think this is some kind of game? Why did you fire on my ships when you knew we were on a rescue mission? Because by our estimates you could not help us. A hostile barbaric fleet in orbit over our dying world represented nothing other than an additional threat. But you called us out here. Immaterial. I must warn you, Riggs, you're dangerously close to losing another half-point. I muted my mic and cursed for a while. Around me, the staff looked nervous. The battle was on hold, but clearly the situation could go bad again at any moment. All right, I said when I'd calmed down. You called us out here, but figured we couldn't really do anything to help you. So you decided to blow us out of the sky with an ambush at the last moment so we couldn't cause any harm either. But it is your logic that I find greatly flawed. Your test results are coming back in, and the tally is woefully low. Absurd. Our actions were impeccably logical. I will give you this single opportunity to improve your score, I said as officiously as I could. There was a brief hesitation while they mulled this over. What form will this opportunity take? Hoon asked finally. 
I smiled. They'd taken the bait. The assessment will take the form of a series of questions, I said. Remember, your responses are being carefully judged. Every word is recorded and weighed by our academic panel. We are prepared. Ask your questions. Why did you nearly cause me to attack and kill millions of your own population? Because the population of World 3 is doomed. I frowned. You mean that if they were going to die anyway, you figured it didn't matter if we killed them all right now? A follow-up query was not specified, and breaks the format agreed to. Worse, the answer to your follow-up is self-evident and thus unnecessary. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. Your cognitive score has been lowered by a half point. I felt like having another round of cursing. I passed on that, but raised my arm to hammer on the chair armrest. I stopped myself with difficulty. Somehow their nonsense about tests and constant insinuation that we were uneducated rubes, barbarians really, was getting to me. I didn't want to prove them right, no matter how irritating they were, so I held back my fist-pounding display with difficulty. Fine, I said. You're saying that you decided we couldn't help, and since we were a possible threat, you ambushed us. You didn't care if we killed the population of Yale, um, World 3, because they were as good as dead already. I have to ask, however, did you ever consider the possibility that you were wrong? That your actions might have needlessly killed my people and yours? Certainly not. I thumped my helmeted head back against the headrest. Around the command center, the staffers were listening in, and they murmured to one another. No one could believe it. Compared to the risk I'd taken, these people were insane. They were so arrogant, they never seemed to question their own conclusions. My anger had faded somewhat during this interchange. After all, they'd been at greater risk than I had from the start. I'd nearly lost a fleet, but they'd nearly lost a world. What mattered most was the fact the disaster had been averted. I told myself I needed to focus on that. Then, a new question sprang into my mind. What was it that caused you to change your judgment concerning our capacities to help you? I asked. Your last transmission stated that you knew about the lowering sea levels and the physics behind the rising temperatures. That was it? I asked incredulously. You were waiting to hear that we understood your problem? If you'd been unable to discern the nature of the emergency on your own, you certainly could not be capable of rendering significant aid. I thought about it, and there was a certain twisted logic to this. After all, their engineers were probably working on the problem desperately. If they hadn't been able to stop the draining of the oceans, then it must be a difficult trick to pull off. Anyone capable of solving this problem probably would have quickly figured out what the problem was based on the data presented. They'd given us a couple of days in system, then judged us morons when we didn't seem to figure it out. The penalty for academic failure among the crustaceans was a harsh one. Death. All right, I said finally. We're here and we're at peace. Now let's discuss the political state between our two species. Let's agree to a peace treaty. Is that absolutely necessary? I rolled my eyes. Yes, I think it is. Before we agree to work with you, we have to be at peace. Can't you see the logic of that? Or do I need to lower your scores yet again? You're confusing your own cultural norms with logic. But the error is excusable in this case. We find this sort of confusion is common in alien species and does not represent a lack of mental capacity. By this time, I was rubbing my temples and wondering what had possessed me to fly out here and help these people. It was going to be a long mission. Professor Hoon wasn't done yet. Another significant failure in your response is represented by the nature of your fleet. It is essentially made up of warships. These are not the best vehicles to render the aid we require. That's because you didn't tell us what kind of help you needed— we assumed you were under some kind of attack. 
We are. But we still feel the nature of the attack is, and always was, self-evident. Before you even launched your fleet, many on the committee had lowered your percentile chance of rendering significant aid to the single digits. I would point out that I did not go with the prevailing trend of my colleagues on this matter. I estimated, and still do, a fourteen percent chance you will manage to provide us some type of meaningful assistance. Well, I said, at least I've got that going for me. I request that you do not embarrass me by failing too grossly at the task. We wouldn't want that, would we? By the way, where are you located personally? I mean, are you on Yale or one of the other moons? What is the significance of using the term Yale to describe our stricken world? It's a famous university back home, on our home world. Indeed. Then it is a complimentary term, and I will adopt its use during our discussions. In response to your original query, yes, I'm on Yale. I smiled slightly. We'd named their worlds after famous colleges back home precisely because the crustaceans reminded me of snooty academics. I decided not to enlighten Hoon, as I doubted he would get the joke. If he thought it was a compliment, maybe that would help us all get along. As a secondary thought, I was impressed that this lobster had the gonads to still be sitting on Yale. He'd pretty much ordered his own death by firing on us. That took a serious belief in oneself, not to mention a willingness to self-sacrifice, which was rare in my experience. Perhaps for the crustaceans, self-sacrifice wasn't an unusual trait. I reminded myself that the ambassador that had flown out to my battle station months earlier had done so knowing she was going to die. She'd killed herself and my electronics in an EMP blast, arrogantly insulting me with her last breath. Have you tried plugging the hole? I asked. Of course. Unfortunately, the hole is large, and the pressure difference between our ocean depths and open space is too great to withstand for any material we've put in place. I questioned him then on the precise depth and size of the hole in their ocean. From those numbers, I knew our people could calculate the amount of pressure that was involved— Without getting into the math, I was able to estimate that it would be tremendous, more than enough to fold foot-thick steel like tinfoil. Really, they were talking about suction. On one side of the ring in question there was open space. On the other side was a deep, dark ocean. The water at that depth was crushing in the extreme. When faced with a hole, very little friction and a vast pressure difference— the water must have been gushing through with fantastic force. Probably, wherever it was coming out, it was a spectacular sight. It would turn instantly into ice and form a long, frozen stream, like a glittering comet's tail that grew steadily in space. How did the hole in your oceans come to exist? I asked. The macros opened it. Is this not obvious? Yes. I said thoughtfully. I suppose it is. But I thought your people in the macros had a treaty and were cooperating. During our last battle, we took certain tactical steps that the macros found unacceptable. They are still technically allies, but they are actively seeking ways around their agreements. I thought about it. The crustaceans had operated as marines in our recent battles— They'd played the role my own troops had when we'd been working for the macros. As I went over their actions in my mind, I figured out what he was talking about. You mean they are upset with the way you handled yourself in the Eden system? I recall you attempted to retreat and then finally surrendered your forces to us. The macros don't like allies that surrender, right? Correct. The macros found these actions unacceptable and contrary to our prior agreements. If you ever find yourself serving the machines, know that you have been forewarned. I snorted. I probably knew more on the topic than Hoon did. Star Force had begun its forays into deep space in the belly of a macro transport. I'd been a mercenary leader then, nothing else. I know all about the ruthless nature of the machines— I said. 
We served them in the past, before we threw off our slave yokes and rebelled. They used my men like machines, ordering us to attack world after world. They planned from the start to grind us down until we were all dead. In this rare instance, our experiences have been similar. Let's get back to our problem and what we can do to help. Possibly I can use my ships to evacuate your population. How many individuals do you have on Yale? Approximately one trillion. My mouth dropped open, and it was a second or two before it closed again. A trillion? I asked. Approximately. Our young are numerous and quite small. Unfortunately, they are more vulnerable to changes in heat and pressure than our adults. I see, I said. I envisioned clouds of young the size of brine shrimp. Tell me, Hoon, how long do we have? How long until these environmental changes become intolerable to your species and your young begin to succumb? The process you describe has been ongoing for many days. Our population was nearly two trillion a few weeks ago. I was staggered. They'd lost hundreds of billions of lives already. The evil of the macros was overwhelming. At the same time, I felt guilty. They'd suffered so much already, and I'd been about to bomb them myself. In a moment of emotion, I'd ordered my ships to unload on their dying civilian populations. Were a few insults and a hundred lost human ships worth that kind of slaughter? It was a troubling question, but I felt I knew the answer. I'd been in the wrong to give that order. No matter how irritating our intended victims were, Genocide was the business of the machines, not Star Force. I urged myself to remember that in the future. Chapter 8 We spent another fruitless day watching their oceans drain away while the water that was left heated up steadily. It was dismal and sad. On the morning of the second day, I ordered Marvin to board a nano-ship and fly down to the surface. I wanted him to observe the phenomenon from within the atmosphere of the planet itself. We could measure the phenomenon with radar and sonar, but the surface was now obscured. The entire world was wrapped in thick clouds. Really, this was steam, rising up from the warming oceans. I didn't need to ask Hoon how things were going for his civilian population. The young must have all perished by now. Only the thicker-shelled adults could survive the warm waters and migrate to areas that were cooler. They were clustering around the poles at both ends of the moon, grimly clinging to life. There wasn't much we could do for them. With hundreds of billions of individuals, any evacuation effort would only save a handful. Probably the panic created by our efforts would kill more than it would save. If I lowered a ship into the atmosphere with an open hold, thousands would try to board. The results might even capsize the ship. Worse, the aliens were aquatic and would require water aboard the rescue ships in order to breathe for an extended period of time. The weight would be tremendous. No, rescue and evacuation was out of the question. We had to use what we had to save them in another way. When he returned from the surface, I summoned Marvin. He was in a state of agitation when we met in the conference room. His tentacles were slashing the chairs and cracking like whips on the walls. Fortunately, smart metal furnishings were self-repairing. "'What have you got for me, Marvin?' I asked. "'I've completed my preliminary study on the situation. The ocean is draining at a slightly decelerating rate as the pressure drops, but the rate of change is not significant.' How long until the oceans drain all the way down to where this spot is exposed and the process stops? Approximately thirteen days. Hmm, I said. That gives us a little time, then. And it's good to know the oceans won't go all the way down. No, they won't. So the situation isn't entirely dire. That depends upon our goals. I frowned at him. What do you mean? If Star Force wants to colonize this world one day, then the situation is beneficial. If our real mission is as stated, however, this is very bad news. I stared at him. Our mission is clear. 
We're here to help out the crustaceans. We're here to turn them into allies, one more powerful biotic species to stand shoulder to shoulder against the machines. Then my report is very dire. The population of this world will be completely annihilated before the thirteen days are up, or shortly thereafter. I thought about it. The heat. You're saying it's going to get worse. Yes. Every day the hot ice at the bottom of the oceans is further exposed. This world has very deep oceans, but it would be primarily coated in surface ice if it weren't for internal heat from geological sources and the compressed hot ice. Now that the oceans are receding, the cool water in the middle depths of the ocean is being drained away. It is true that the ocean will eventually cool again, but it will take some time. Thirteen days is not long enough. Exactly what temperature will the oceans reach by the thirteenth day? The oceans will be near the boiling point by then. Two hundred degrees Fahrenheit? I asked, incredulous. Higher than that. This is salt water, after all. The boiling point is slightly higher. I massaged my temples. I realized dully that a thousand billion sentient beings were going to be boiled alive over the next two weeks if I didn't get cracking. What can we do to stop this? Unknown. That's not good enough, Marvin. What have you tried? Have you sent in a probe? I've sent in many submersibles of various makeshift designs. Few of them were able to survive the turbulence on the way down to the aperture. Most stopped transmitting telemetry and readings even before they reached the event horizon and vanished. The few that did make it all the way down never came back. Not surprising, really, I said. They were programmed to attempt to come back to this side after scanning whatever was on the far side, I assume. Naturally. But there was little hope they would succeed. The gushing pressure on the far side is almost insurmountable. Even if one of the probes did get up enough velocity to punch into the water and reach our side of the ring, they would not survive the impact with high-pressure water. Right, I said, thinking of the time I'd come back into the atmosphere of Venus from the Blue Giant system. Even hitting gas is like hitting a solid object when you're moving it thousands of miles an hour. Hitting liquid, it would be like smashing into a brick wall. The probes would be obliterated. Marvin was watching me carefully from multiple angles. This made me nervous. He wasn't asking for anything, and I was the only thing in the room for him to study, but I was still wary. You've got something else in your brain box, I said. Talk to me. I have another possible approach to the situation, Colonel. Yeah, of course you do. Just tell me. Would I be held responsible for the possible side effects of experimentation? I laughed. You want me to sign a prenuptial agreement? I'm sorry, Marvin, I'm not going to absolve you of responsibilities for some idea I haven't even heard about yet. He scrutinized me for another full second before continuing. The rings have capacities other than the transmission of physical matter between two locations. You're talking about relaying transmissions, right? The vibration thing? Not just that. They can be switched on and off. The flow of material can also be reversed. In a sense, they can be opened and closed, like doors. I nodded, seeing what he was getting at. That's self-evident in this case. The ring was always there, the crustaceans have told us, but it was inactive. Now someone has figured out how to turn it on and use it to drain their oceans away. My money is on the macros, of course. They're always looking for a quiet way to kill off their biotic allies that doesn't violate their existing agreements. Marvin's cameras drew closer to me. I believe I can gain at least partial control of the ring. What? That's great! The cameras rose up a little higher, showing he appreciated the praise. I had to wonder why he hadn't brought this up in the first place. Yes, he said. It's something I've been pondering for a long time. It's closely related to the process of using the rings to relay vibrations from one system to another. You see... The rings are really in two places at the same time. That is their secret. There aren't really two rings, there's only one. I nodded impatiently. Yeah, that makes sense. This is a wonderful development, Marvin. I want you to grab control of that ring and turn it off. Naturally, that would be the happiest outcome. I paused and my eyes narrowed. What do you mean, would be? I thought you said you could control it. I said I could take control of it. 
I can put it into program mode, so to speak. But I have no real idea of what commands to send it. I don't know its protocols or packet control structures. I would have to experiment once I opened a session. I nodded slowly and my face fell. I was beginning to understand his hesitation. I also understood now why he'd asked for absolution before making an attempt to do this. Marvin, I said, I get it. You're talking about hacking this thing, about attempting to get it to do what you want. But you know you don't understand the interface. You'd be making guesses, and bad things might happen as a result. Exactly. I thought about it. What if Marvin reversed the ring's direction of flow and put the other end of it into the flaming surface of an unknown star? Anything was possible. He might destroy Yale or save it. I knew a little about hacking. It was a hit-or-miss thing. Usually there were a lot of misses before hits were registered. It would take time, and it would be dangerous. But really, what other choice did we have? You know, Marvin, this interchange represents a shift in your behavior. I think you might be maturing. Instead of hiding the possible disasters that may occur, you brought them up ahead of time. I'm proud of you, Marvin. You're learning about responsibility, and honestly, I think you're growing up. That's an unexpected compliment, Colonel Riggs. Keep it in your RAM, I told him. I don't give a lot of those. Audio saved. I smiled and summoned Captain Jasmine Sarin and the rest of my command staff. We had a decision to make. I think the crustaceans have to decide, Colonel, was Jasmine's opinion. I wasn't surprised. Everyone felt that way. We discussed it for nearly an hour, and the prevailing decision was clear. I nodded and contacted Professor Hoon. They all listened intently. No one seemed more interested than Marvin himself. He desperately wanted to make the attempt, of course. His main interest in this meeting was spreading the blame for it afterward, in case it turned into a royal shit bomb. No one could blame the crazy robot if he'd gotten us all to agree it was risky. Professor Hoon's answer was quick and decisive. Yes, by all means, make the attempt. But be warned, there will be an investigation afterward. If this is an elaborate ruse to increase the speed of our world's demise, there will be a censure forthcoming. I tried not to smile. After all, we were talking about billions of possible deaths. The fact they were all doomed in the near future seemed almost immaterial to them. What mattered more was the correctness of the procedure. I thought about asking Hoon who he thought was going to perform this investigation and censure, but held back. Understood, Professor Hoon. We'll take every precaution. We also request dissemination of the results, Hoon continued. I hesitated. This was a sore point among my staff. If we did gain some level of control over the ring, they didn't want to give that powerful technological advantage away to the crustaceans. They'd been hostile just a month ago. They were cooperating now, but were not really our allies. We will consider it after the successful conclusion of the operation. Possibly we will utterly fail, in which case there's nothing to disseminate— if it does work out and relations between our governments are normalized, we can consider sharing technologies. We have a lot of things to share, far more than just this little trick. We accept your conditions, because we have no choice. I turned to Marvin and the rest of them. Marvin was barely able to crowd to the conference table, he was so excited— no one else was sitting within a chair or two of him for fear they'd get slapped by a tentacle or knocked in the head by a drifting camera. Can I proceed, Colonel? he asked. Yes, I said. There's no time to waste. See if you can turn off that damned ring, Marvin. Channel open, he said. Suddenly Marvin froze up. Every tentacle stopped moving, and he resembled a still-motion photograph. The effect was uncanny. No human could have gone from such a state of agitation to a completely motionless state. It was as if someone had switched off his primary generators, but he still had enough residual power to maintain rigidity. 
What's wrong with him, Kyle? Sandra asked. I think he's okay, I said, standing up and walking close. I think he's switched over all his computing power to this hacking effort. I think he's locked up, Quan said, poking at a camera near his elbow. Marvin made no response, so Quan prodded him more vigorously. I see this all the time. He crashed. He needs to reboot or something. I waved Quan back. Just give him some air, I said, getting nervous. I was as worried as the rest of them, but tried not to show it. About a minute after he'd frozen in place, Marvin finally came back to life. We all began breathing again in relief. Transmission sent, he said. Well, how did it go? Give me a full report, Marvin. Impossible, he said. To verbalize a full report of my transmissions would require a period of time longer than your projected lifespan, Colonel Riggs. Yeah, okay. Give me the condensed version. What did you do? I sent a sequence of likely codes to the ring. How many of them did you send? Just over six billion. Did you try everything then? What are the results? Unknown. I brought up the display of Yale on the conference table. The world looked pretty much the same. But I knew the currents of a worldwide ocean would take longer than a minute to reshape themselves. What do you mean unknown? Did you get through to the ring or not? Did it accept any of those six billion commands? Yes, it accepted one. The last one I sent. Okay, so you sent a barrage of spam at the ring, and apparently it finally took one command and executed it. That sounds like blind hacking, Marvin. I was under the impression you had some idea of what you were doing. It was not a sophisticated algorithm, he admitted. What command did it finally take? Sandra demanded suddenly. What did you tell the ring to do? I have no idea. That's why I stopped when it accepted a command. In order to learn how to control an unknown device, experimentation is required. The next step is to observe its behavior, and thereby update my knowledge base. I don't like the sound of this, Sandra said. I thought you knew what you were doing. It sounds like you just pushed every button on the remote control until something happened to the TV. An accurate analogy, Marvin said. But what if you found the self-destruct button, she demanded. I doubt that function exists, but if it did and I had managed to trigger it, we would have seen dramatic results by now. All of us stared down at the conference table. Yale was depicted there, blue-white and lovely, filling the screen under our collective elbows. Everyone was squinting. Several gritted their teeth as if wincing in pain or worry. What had we done to this beautiful, stricken world? Had we made things even worse, somehow, for the hapless inhabitants? Like Marvin, I figured we would find out soon enough. Chapter 9 Professor Hoon is attempting to contact us, Colonel Riggs, Marvin said. He seems agitated. Probably because you did something horrible, Sanders said. I hesitated before I told Marvin to open the channel. Hoon was in a much better position than we were to know what had happened down there. Very possibly Marvin had turned the suction effect up a notch, shifting the controls to high. Aren't you going to talk to him, Kyle? Sandra asked. Yeah, sure. Open the channel and start translating, Marvin. Channel open. Professor Hoon... I said, doing my best to sound upbeat. We've made some preliminary tests, and... I'm astounded, said Hoon, interrupting me. All of my academic staff have been forced to reevaluate your ratings. It's obvious to me that our screening systems are inadequate. We've misjudged you by a startling margin. Well, I began, uncertain where he was going with this. I can safely tell you I've been misjudged more than once. Yes, your seemingly simplistic emotional responses to stimuli had us fooled. Despite measuring at a nearly bestial level of reasoning, your species has performed a miraculous feat of engineering. 
We're trying to explain it and would like your help in investigating the matter. Um, okay, we can do that, but first let me ask, the results are positive? There was a hesitation on the channel of several seconds. Your response casts suspicion on your accomplishments, Colonel Riggs. It indicates a lack of confidence in the results, which in turn indicates a lack of competency in the instigator. Look, I said, becoming annoyed again despite my intentions, we've performed an experimental attempt to improve your conditions. We don't have the same level of equipment at the scene to measure the results. I'm just asking you for confirmation. But you omitted a key element of the confirmation query. You have not asked us to confirm a specific change in the situation. I'm afraid this is a familiar pattern. When an apprentice queries his master in this fashion, it often indicates one of two possibilities. Either he cheated, or he got lucky. I looked at Marvin. The lobsters had nailed it this time. If we had solved their problem, we'd both cheated and gotten lucky. I didn't want to tell them that, however. For one thing, this race bugged the hell out of me. But also, they might be less grateful and willing to work with us if they knew the truth. Professor Hoon, I said sternly, we in Star Force are unaccustomed to accusations of incompetence. Let's review the facts. You've been dealing with a catastrophic technical problem for an extended period of time— you failed to solve the problem or to mitigate it in any significant way. You called us for help. We arrived to render assistance, and you attacked us. We've explained our reasoning. Repetition of points previously made is not customary for our species. I'm not asking you to repeat anything. I'm making a point. Despite your failures and your thoughtless attack, we've managed to fix your technical problems within hours— after all this, your prejudice against Star Force has led you to yet another folly. Rather than graciously assuming the role of the student at his master's feet, you've persisted in coming up with fantasies. Here at Star Force, we deal in measurable facts. Now, as the principal investigator in this experiment, I've requested twice for confirmation of critical data. You've not specified what data you are looking for. I want a raw report. Specifying what we expect to see will bias your input. Ah, said Professor Hoon, as if in sudden understanding. I apologize. We've misconstrued your intentions. I apologize again for our suspicious line of questioning. You are correct. In this situation, we must assume the lowly role of apprentice— despite the fact we're unaccustomed to it. Perhaps there is a bias in our system. Interesting. I will demand a full analysis of our entire interchange later today, but never mind that now. The key fact is that the ring in the bottom of our sea is no longer transferring liquid mass off-planet. I smiled, and everyone around me smiled. Only Quan leaned back in his chair, bored. The rest of them were breathing sighs of relief. Sandra got up out of her chair, walked to Marvin, and hugged his chassis. You pulled it off, you crazy robot, she said. Surprised, Marvin lofted his camera and viewed her from every angle, but he didn't flinch away. I chuckled. It was probably his first hug from a real live girl. You really do like nerds, don't you? Quan asked her. Yes she admitted. I wasn't quite sure how to take that, so I ignored it. I considered the situation with Hoon. It was time to press for concessions from him, I decided. When would it be a better time? We just saved a third of their population. Professor Hoon, I said officiously. Now that the current crisis has been averted, I would ask you to consider another matter. I'm very busy, but I'll allow the interruption on this occasion. You'll be glad you took time from your busy schedule to listen to this, Hoon. I'm offering you a golden opportunity right here, right now. Switch allegiances. Leave the service of the Macros and join our Federation of Worlds. Star Force will be officially obliged to protect you once you do so. 
cast off your people's chains. Be a free biotic species. What do you say? An odd appeal, Hoon said. We are currently at peace with the machines. Why would we declare war on them by allying with your organization? Because the machines are traitors. They turned on that ring and drained your oceans. You realize that, don't you? Obviously, Starforce lacks the intellectual and technical capacity to have managed this achievement. I almost pointed out to him that if we'd just turned it off, we might have been the ones to turn it on, but stopped myself. I decided that wouldn't help my argument. The machines aren't at peace with you. Not really. They have an agreement with you and will stick to the letter of it, but not the spirit. They will try with regularity to circumvent it and destroy your population, even while demanding you fight their wars for them. We've beaten the machines time and again, including doing great harm to your forces. If you're in this war anyway, why not join the winning side? There are compelling points to your arguments, Colonel, but I'm afraid we must deny your request. Just like that? Don't you have a committee to report to or something? Shouldn't the others be consulted? I'm surprised you have the unilateral power to make such a high-level policy decision. I don't. Not as an individual. But it was previously determined you were likely to make this type of request at some point as you've made it before. At our committee hearings days ago, before we summoned you to aid us, it was decided to refuse your offer. The vote was unanimous, by the way. I rested my chin on my hands. These people were tiring to deal with. Can I at least hear your reasoning for the decision? Certainly, although be forewarned we aren't interested in pleas, the decision is final. We've carefully examined the size of your fleet and judged it to be inadequate to stop the next macro wave of ships. What about our battle station? I asked. We've built it up, and the fortification can withstand an assault even bigger than the last one. Agreed, Hoon said. Unfortunately, that does not help us or alter our calculus. The battle station protects the Eden system, but does nothing to stop a macro invasion of the Thor system. He was right, I knew. He was making the same argument Miklos had made to me days ago. We'd built a tremendous bulwark at a critical bottleneck, but it didn't solve all our problems. The fortress couldn't move. If a fight occurred somewhere else, it would be useless. All right, I said. I understand your reasoning, but if matters should change, if there should be a clear change in the balance of power, I would strongly suggest you reconsider. Starforce doesn't want to go to war with your people again, that's why we're out here saving your bacon today. Saving our bacon is an odd and potentially offensive reference. That portion of your comments has been deleted from your statement to make it more comprehensible. It's an idiom, I explained. If you witness shifts in the balance of power in the near future, I want you to reconsider our offer. Make your decisions very carefully. We always do. The conversation went on for a minute or two, but the critical elements had been covered. We'd saved their world, but they weren't ready to join us, despite the fact their current allies were trying to kill them. I understood their reasoning to a degree. They knew we were weak militarily, and what they really wanted was some kind of neutrality. Unfortunately for them, neither Star Force nor the Macros were in a peace-loving mood. As the crisis seemed at least temporarily averted— I headed for the mess hall to eat the first real meal I'd had in days. Then I had a shower and flopped onto my bunk. Sandra joined me a while later, and we had celebratory sex. Today hadn't gone the way I'd thought it might, and I was happy about that. So was she. Somehow she figured I was a hero now, and Marvin was an even bigger hero. That robot is the strangest thing, she said. He's a traitor one minute, and a savior of billions the next. I really don't know what to think of him. Well, 
while you're probably trying to understand him as a human personality. He really isn't one of us. That's not entirely a bad thing, but you can never forget it while dealing with him. His motivations are his alone. He's effectively a species of one. When you talk like that, it makes me think we should quietly turn him off. I looked at her in surprise. Her head was resting on my chest, and her eyes looked up at me seriously. I could tell she meant it. Why? I asked. You just got done telling me he was a big hero. Sometimes he is, but sometimes he's evil. Remember what he did when experimenting on the centaurs, on their young ones? I try not to think about that. Yeah, me too. But something you said forced me to start thinking. You said he was a species of one. But it doesn't have to stay that way. What if he decides to reproduce, to copy himself? What if there were a thousand Marvins, or even a million? He's much smarter than the Nanos or the Macros. An army of Marvins could kill us all, if they decided it was for the best. Maybe they'd do it just for curiosity's sake, for the fun of cutting us up and poking around in our guts. We both fell silent after that. A few minutes later, Sandra fell asleep with her head still resting on my chest. It was a nice feeling, and I was very tired, but I found I couldn't let go and relax. I laid there for the next hour, listening to her soft, rhythmic breathing. My thoughts didn't let sleep come. Her words had disturbed me. Chapter 10 our ship spent two more full days hanging over Yale. Captain Sarin had joined us with her carrier, and the fighters patrolled constantly. I was impressed by her carefully maintained vigilance. We watched the ring and the seabed that Marvin had somehow switched off. For the first day or so, we were nervous, waiting for something bad to happen. But nothing did, and by the end of the second day, I began to feel confident that we'd solved the problem— Below us, the oceans settled, and the storm clouds dissipated. It was going to take years for the climate to reorganize itself. The planet had lost about three percent of its mass, and that translated into about four miles of ocean depth gone down the drain. There were spots of land now, on a world that had previously been covered by seamless ocean. The new lands were alien-looking. The freshly revealed seafloor was white and rocky. The newly revealed lands formed islands which dotted the surface of Yale. These islands steamed and were covered in rotting seaweeds and dead fish. Seen from above, they reminded me of the jagged teeth of an ancient leviathan, revealed for the first time in a billion years. We sent down probes to the ring when the currents and storms had subsided, but when the probes went through the ring, which was still under a thousand feet of water— they simply found the seabed on the far side. They weren't transported anywhere. As far as we could tell, the ring had been truly switched off. I was about to give orders to Star Force personnel to land and investigate the region on foot when a message came in from Miklos, who I'd left in charge of the Eden system. A communique from Earth had been received at Shadow Guard. The rings allowed for more or less instantaneous communication between star systems, but we rarely heard from Earth these days. And when we did, I had left explicit instructions. I was to be immediately alerted. I took the hard copy to my office and read it over twice. The message was from General Kerr, who had commanded the last fleet from Earth and who had personally led the attack against Eden. Despite a long history of conflict— Kerr and I had always been able to talk man to man. Essentially, the message said he was coming out for a visit, and that he wanted to discuss normalizing relations between Crow's Empire and Star Force. I was elated, but the rest of my staff was hostile. He's coming out here to spy, declared Quan with absolute certitude. Trust me, Colonel Riggs, I've known my share of dictators. Crow is just like the rest. Dictators only send out ambassadors to do two things, to spy or to get free stuff. Don't let General Kerr anywhere near Eden. 
I opened my mouth to respond, but didn't get the words out before the next objection came out of Sandra. Quan's right, she said. But I would handle it differently. When he gets here, let's capture him and make him a prisoner. That will give them one less good commander for their side. We can tell them he had an accident aboard his ship, and his people were all lost. I looked at her in surprise. Remind me never to put you in charge of diplomacy, I told her. She crossed her arms, sat back in her chair, and glared at me. Possibly, Captain Saren said. We could be more diplomatic, but I don't trust Kerr any more than the rest of this group. It's my suggestion we meet with him in the Helios system on a neutral ship in neutral space. That way he can't learn anything of our operational strength. Well, I'm glad no one here feels restrained when airing their opinions, I said. But I'm going to let them in. There was a chorus of complaints and warnings. I lifted my hands and waved for quiet. Don't freak out, I said. I'm not a fool. I'm not going to give them the ten-dollar tour. They will see exactly what I want them to see. May I speak? Sandra asked angrily. Be my guest. The moment their ship crosses into our space, it will be cataloging and counting every gun we have. That has got to be at least part of the purpose of this effort. Of course it is, I said. But their ship won't be coming into our space. We'll meet them at the doorstep in the Helio system on the far side of the ring from the Eden system. We'll take their committee off their ship and transport them into our space under our control. I like that idea, Quan said. They can't see much from the window of a spaceship. When I look out these windows, all I see is the sun. Maybe not even that. Not even the planets are big enough to see without instruments. Exactly, I said, nodding to Quan. I could always count on him to see logic. He almost always took my side. I still don't like it, Sandra said. He's up to something. They'll bring something in, something in their personal baggage, a spying tool or a bomb, maybe. I have to agree, Captain Saren said. We can't trust them. Remember Marvelena. I winced at the mentioning of that name. Marvelena had been a lovely, voluptuous spy who had attempted to assassinate me. She'd done rather poorly and had paid for her failure with her life. I understand your concerns, and I share them, I said. But they can't have a scanner small enough to fit on their person which would be capable of reading much about our fleets. What about weapons, Kyle? Sandra asked. What about assassination? I shrugged. The moment they cross into our space, we'll do a body scan and make sure they're clean. Remember, they aren't nanotized. They won't be much of a match for our people, even if they're armed. But don't worry, I'll keep them under guard anyway. I could tell none of them were really happy about it, but the decision had been made and they all knew it. I wasn't known for changing my mind when it was made up, so they quickly gave up trying. Still, I could tell they were unconvinced, except possibly for Quan. All right, I said. I was annoyed with them, but I managed to keep my irritation out of my voice. I know you all think I'm making a rash move, but the stakes are very high. Let me explain my own thinking. We need to reconnect with Earth. The possible benefits for Star Force and all humanity are immeasurable. We could become trading partners, and inevitably there would be immigration. We need people out here. There are barely 40,000 humans in the Eden system, not enough to fill these lovely worlds for a thousand years. More importantly, this is a chance to ally with Earth for the next round with the macros. Every member of our species must come together to stand against the machines. Divided, we'll fall eventually. Jasmine leaned forward, frowning. I think our primary worry is Crow himself, she said. We all know him. We know what he's capable of. I think he's grown worse and worse as time has passed. He's become a megalomaniac. I was there, Kyle. I've seen him as Emperor Crow. I know Jack Crow very well. I agree he's not the man I flew with in the beginning. Or maybe he is, but he has changed for the worse. Still, 
We've always been able to come to some kind of arrangement in the past. I'm willing to give him another chance. No one met my eye. So, I said, clapping my hands together loudly, let's get to the details. How are we going to pull this off? Slowly, they came around to helping me solve this part of the problem. Involving them in the minutia and taking their suggestions on details helped massage damaged egos. I'd overruled them all, and I knew that could cause sour feelings. I had to give them something to fuss about. In the end, the plan they came up with was simple and clever. I contacted Miklos to set things up. Boarding the cruiser Lazaro, Sandra, Quan, and I flew back to the battle station. I'd left Captain Saren behind in the Thor system with her carrier and most of the fleet. When we reached the battle station, I transferred over to the new carrier ship, the Defiant. It was the third ship to bear that name in Star Force. Miklos had named it himself, as was customary. Miklos stood on the massive hangar deck when I came out to meet him. It was amazing. There were rows of fighters and cylindrical launch tubes through which they could be deployed. When the fighters launched, they didn't use their primary engines. Instead, they were propelled out using gravity repellers in the tubes. The technology was impressive because the hangar deck itself was pressurized. The tubes also acted as airlocks, and the released gas helped launch the tiny ships that much faster. Spacious, I said while touring the hangar. This is the first time I've boarded one of these mother ships. I never got the chance to inspect Captain Saren's gotter. The ships are essentially identical, Miklo said, but I have made minor improvements to the design of the Defiant. I'm impressed, I said, as we traveled down a long, echoing passage that traveled along the spine of the ship. We soon reached the officers' quarters. These chambers were simple steel cubes with nanite-laden smart doors. I was stunned by their starkness, but I tried not to let on. Even the bunks were flat planes of shiny steel. The accommodations are bare bones, I said. But I guess that's to be expected. Exactly, sir, Miklo said. We have very few amenities for such a large vessel. I had a very tight schedule to meet to get her up into space on time. But the ship is effective. She is a beast of war, not a luxury liner. Miklos proudly walked at my side down another echoing corridor to the ship's bridge. Here he had not spared any expense. He had installed our best sensory systems, shock absorbers, and consoles. Even the brain boxes were veterans. I could tell by their serial numbers. Did you take some of these gunnery control systems from Welter Station, Commodore? Miklos cleared his throat. I thought it might be for the best, sir. These ships were built to fly directly into a war situation. I didn't want baby brain boxes in place, cutting their teeth in battle, so to speak. The boxes came from the battle station, while new ones have been installed there. I felt it was better to have the fresh, inexperienced components placed on the battle station where they would have time to learn. Eventually they will operate at top efficiency. I nodded, thinking it over. I decided it had been a wise decision to outfit the two carriers with the veteran boxes rather than having the ship's AI be hopelessly green. Well done, I said. We'll fly Defiant out into the Helio system with a full complement of fighters and crews. We'll meet the Earth ship and make no mention of the design being new. We'll just act natural about it like it's no big deal. When they ask about it, we'll tell them it's one of our carrier ships without an explanation. If we don't tell them we only have two of these monsters, they'll naturally assume we have several of them. Miklos liked the plan, and the voyage began. At first, the plan went without a hitch. We flew to the Helio system and sat there at the ring in our carrier. A single ship approached us. I knew right away when I saw it that Crow was trying to impress us, just as hard as we were trying to impress him. The ship was a monster. About the size of two macro cruisers sandwiched together, the vessel was an oblong rectangle that bristled with equipment, sensors, and gun tubes. It probably displaced more mass than our carrier. That, gentlemen, 
is a battleship, I told my staff as they eyed the ship in concern. We gave them docking instructions and waited tensely. I'd have been nervous if I hadn't been surrounded by twenty gunboats and several destroyers. Altogether, I was certain we outgunned the battleship. When channel request came in hailing us, I nodded to Miklos to answer. This is Commodore Nikolai Miklos, he said. Please dispatch a pinnace to transfer your committee to our ship. The other ship slowed and stopped only fifty thousand miles from our bow. She was huge. I tried to look like I didn't care, and that seemed to calm my crew. They stopped murmuring and staring. This is General Kerr of Earth's Imperial Forces, said a very familiar voice. It had a southern twang and a Texas swagger to it. I don't want to talk to any underlings, Kerr said. Get Kyle Riggs on the horn pronto, please. Miklos looked at me again. I nodded to him curtly. We had a plan, and I wanted to stick to it. I knew it was possible this monstrous ship had come out here for the express purpose of giving us a sucker punch. If Kerr thought I wasn't aboard, he was much less likely to take a shot and unload at close range. I'm sorry, sir, Miklo said. I'm in command of this ship. You will be transferred aboard and transported to Shadow Guard. There you will meet with Colonel Riggs. Shadow Guard? What the hell is that? Some kind of penal colony? No, sir, it is a fortress. A command center on Eden 8. Hmm, so Riggs is dodging me, is that it? Too scared to come out and talk like men? Why should I put myself at risk? Why should I trust you lot when you won't return the favor? General, may I remind you that you requested this meeting... Our last encounter with Imperial forces was less than cordial. If you are, as you claim to be, an ambassador, then transporting yourself and your staff to our ship should not be a hardship. K.G. Riggs, making me come to him? Well, tell him for me I won't be on my knees. Not unless he chops off my legs at the shin bone. We have no such intentions, sir. Miklo said patiently. Will you be coming aboard? I had to smile. The general had always been demanding and flamboyant. He was, however, a very sharp man. Sometimes I thought his entire act was designed to throw off casual observers. It came off as an arrogant blowhard. But he was dangerous. Kerr grumbled some more, but eventually... He boarded a small ship and floated across the last few intervening miles and docked with my new carrier. I headed down to the hangar deck to meet him. I surprised myself as I walked the long passages. I was actually looking forward to seeing the general again. I didn't trust him, however, not even as far as I could throw him, which was a considerable distance. Chapter 11 Kerr was naturally annoyed to meet me on the hangar deck. I thought you weren't here, he roared, not even bothering to extend his hand. I let mine drop slowly. I didn't know you cared so much about my whereabouts, General. He eyed me suspiciously for a few seconds. I don't like starting off talks like this with lies and tricks. What's going on here, Riggs? What are you trying to pull? Am I under arrest or what? As he spoke, a number of my stern-faced marines approached the general and his party. They had guns, but they had instruments in their hands as well. They ran the scanners over every member of the general's staff, all six of them. They're only here to make sure you are unarmed and not carrying any kind of contraband. What? You think I smoke weed, boy? I chuckled. No, sir, I was thinking more along the lines of bombs or transmission devices. Found it, shouted one Marine. He tugged at the waistband of a major in General Kerr's group. A device with dangling wires popped out. That's nothing but a music player, Kerr complained. We'll check it out and return it if... She's wearing one, too, said another Marine. He pointed to a small young lady wearing a lieutenant's bars. He was pointing to her chest. 
Harassment, pure and simple, Kerr declared. The woman looked at Kerr, and he nodded slightly. She reached up under her shirt and removed a device. I was under the impression she'd pulled it out of her bra. I had to smile. It was a game, but quite possibly a deadly one. When we finally had all the devices on the table, they were analyzed and identified. Scanners, recorders, and compact radios designed to transmit coded data that resembled static or background radiation. There was nothing deadly other than their sidearms. I picked up the general's revolver and returned it to him. He looked at it in surprise. I can wear this? I nodded. Yes, sir. But I don't suggest you shoot any of my marines with it, not even as a joke. You'll seriously piss them off, and I can't be held responsible for their natural reaction. General Kerr snorted, but he strapped his gun into place. He looked pleased to have it back on his hip. Kerr then proceeded to introduce his staff to me. I was immediately bored. I disliked shaking hands and mumbling greetings, but I guess it's all part of the job. When I came to the woman who'd had a scanner in her bra, however, I perked up. She was quite attractive, almost innocent-looking. She appeared to be of mixed heritage, part Asian and part Caucasian. It was an entrancing combination. This is Alexa. She's the daughter of a friend of mine, Field Marshal Brighton. Lieutenant, I said, taking her hand gently and nodding to her. The famous Colonel Riggs, she said. You seem less dangerous in person. I smiled. The news vids lie. Not always, Kerr said, stepping closer. I let Alexa's hand drop reluctantly. Let me give you a tour of the ship, I said. The party followed me out of the hangar. As we left it, a shadow dropped down from the steel trusses in the ceiling. No one else noticed, I don't think, other than me. It was Sandra, of course, stalking the group like a hunting panther. I went back over the greetings in my mind. I bit my lip briefly as I thought of how I'd greeted Alexa differently and personally. I hoped Sandra hadn't witnessed that and taken it the wrong way. It was a faint hope. Partway through the tour, Kerr stopped and interrupted me. He stared at me in sudden concern. We're moving, aren't we? he asked. Why, yes, General, of course we are. As I said before, we're on our way to Shadow Guard. And my crew back on the Carrington just let you slip away with me aboard without any kind of communication authorizing it? I smiled at him. I'd had Marvin compile the general's voice from a large variety of recordings in order to imitate him. Marvin had done such a good job, the battleship had just stood there and watched as we slipped away. I'm surprised that you're surprised, sir, I said. This ship does have good stabilizers, but any fleet midshipman would have known we were underway. You're avoiding the question, Riggs. This is typical of you. Bait and switch, the old shell game. I've been conned again. Nonsense, General, I said. I told you up front what the invitation entailed, and you accepted. Breathing hard, the General waved me forward. I had no idea what he had intended to happen, but apparently this sequence of events was not to his liking. I wasn't sure if this indicated hostile intent or not, but I was glad things weren't going his way. I'd once read a quote that went like this. When holding a snake, it's best not to let go. That summed up my theory on interaction with Kerr and Crow. They were both snakes in their own individual ways. I had to keep them off their game, surprising them, never letting them make a move on their own. Otherwise, one of these snakes was going to bite me in the ass eventually. After the tour was over, I showed them their stainless steel cubicles. They weren't impressed. We dolled them up a bit with blankets and pillows, but there was no hiding the fact their quarters made prison cells look luxurious. Riggs, I have to say I'm not surprised. You people have so much iron in your butts, you don't even need a mattress. That's what this is meant to convey, isn't it? That you're tougher than we are? Not really, General, I said. Honestly, we didn't even think about it. You've still got nerve endings, don't you, boy? Yes, sir, they just don't get as much use as yours. He glared at me and huffed. I left him there and walked away. 
I was headed up to the bridge when I heard soft footsteps behind me. I turned, expecting to see Sandra. I was surprised that it was the lovely Lieutenant Alexa Brighton instead. I smiled at her immediately. You should go back to your quarters now, Lieutenant, I said. Why? Are we under arrest? Not exactly, but I've got a lot to do, and I'm sure you're tired after your long journey out from Earth. If you sleep now, you'll arrive at Shadow Guard well-rested. There's more to see there. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not tired at the moment. We stared at one another for several awkward seconds. She took two steps closer and smiled up at me. I liked the shape of her eyes and mouth. She was quite young, no more than twenty-five. Call me Alexa, she said. Okay. Could you show me around a little more, Colonel? She asked. I have some things I'd like to discuss. Uh, I said, looking at her. She took a few more steps closer until she was within arm's reach. Her hand lifted slowly toward me as if to touch my shoulder. I barely saw it coming, but Alexa was taken completely by surprise. A shadow dashed up behind her, grabbed her rising hand, and twisted it around behind her back. Her gentle, peaceful expression changed into one of shock and agony. Sandra, let her go. Don't you dare break her arm. She's trouble, Kyle. I've been watching her almost as much as you have. I'm sure you have. Now let her go. She's unarmed. Reluctantly, Sandra let Alexa go. The young woman whirled around angrily, but with one look at Sandra's murderous eyes, her protests died in her throat. She pushed past and ran down the corridor, holding her shoulder, which was probably numb and throbbing. Cry, baby, Sandra said. I didn't even break it. Are you sure? I would have felt the bones crack. Sandra, may I remind you I'm trying to make peace with Earth? That this is a diplomatic meeting between the Empire and Star Force? That's how you see it. I see it as a security risk. I sighed and headed back up to the bridge. I knew there was no point in arguing with Sandra. Quite possibly she was right anyway. This girl might be starstruck by me, or she might be putting on an act. Either way, it was probably for the best that I kept my distance. Do you think she's pretty, Kyle? Sandra asked me as she stalked along at my side. I guess so in a childish way. That's bullshit. I tried to keep my face neutral. I knew she was watching me closely. I'd found Lieutenant Brighton very attractive, but I wasn't going to let Sandra know that. The lieutenant would live longer if I pretended I didn't care about her. Look, she's just somebody's kid who got assigned to coming out here to further her career. You need to control that jealous streak of yours. She'd better not be planning to further her career with your help. Sandra said dangerously. If advancing her career is the plan, she should be running from me, I said with a laugh. I'm not exactly on Emperor Crow's A-list, more like his most wanted list. Sandra fell silent, but I could tell she was pissed off about Alexa. I knew enough about women to take the silent treatment for the gift it was. I kept my mouth shut all the way up to the bridge. I checked every report in my queue and read about a thousand emails. When I finally retired to my quarters, Sandra shadowed me. She still wasn't talking, and that was just fine with me. There were less than nine hours left before we arrived at Eden 8 and slid into orbit. I was tired, and I didn't want to waste them. I flopped out on my bunk, arms over my head. I didn't even bother with a shower. About ninety seconds after my head hit the pillow, I fell into a light dream. It was a good dream, something about hunting crows in cornfields and orchards with an old twenty-two rifle I had as a kid. I had a thin smile on my lips when I was rudely awakened. I grunted in surprise as a weight thumped down on my chest. My arms snapped up and gripped my assailant. I squeezed. It was reflexive to do so. Ow, Sandra said. I can't believe this, but you're actually hurting me. You can't do that to a normal person, Kyle. You'd break their bones. My eyes fluttered open. Sandra was sitting on my chest like an insolent house cat. I had her wrists clamped firmly in my hands. She struggled but couldn't free herself. 
Like all Star Force Marines, we had both bananatized. That meant our bloodstreams were teeming with millions of tiny robots. These robots had the job of healing our bodies, but more importantly, they had already altered them. During an excruciating multi-hour ordeal, they changed the internal structures of any human they were injected into. The nanotechnology was beyond our own, but we used it wherever we could. Our bones were harder, our muscles more dense. We moved faster and hit harder than any other humans in history. Even with all those physical improvements, Sandra and I stood out as unique. Like very few others, we'd gone through additional treatments. We'd been improved by taking microbial baths administered by Marvin. The microbes in question were a sentient species capable of collective thought and action. They'd worked on our bodies at a biochemical level, altering them. As a result, Sandra was one of the fastest beings I'd ever encountered, and I was one of the strongest. She writhed in my grip as I came fully awake. Let me go or I'm going to kick you, she said. I kept my grip and smiled. When you jump on a sleeping marine's chest, you've got some explaining to do. I'll kick you. I don't think so. She glared at me darkly, and I let her go a moment later. I was having fun, but I also wanted to have sex again at some point in this relationship. Sandra jerked her arms away from my hands and crossed them under her breasts. She stayed, sitting on my chest, however. I didn't complain about that. She had been a fit, shapely young woman when I first met her. After undergoing physical transformations, she was as cut and sculpted as an Olympic gymnast. Due to my own physical alterations, her weight didn't bother me at all. To me, she felt as if she weighed ten pounds or so. Clearly, you want to tell me something, I said. I'm feeling jealous. You don't say. Never would have suspected it. You liked that girl. She was normal, soft, young. You liked her. She seemed friendly, but she's only a kid to me. She slapped me across the face. She moved so fast I couldn't react quickly enough to grab her wrist. A trickle of blood ran from my cheeks where they'd been smashed into my teeth. A normal man would have been seriously injured. In my case, it didn't really hurt, but it did sting a bit. What was that for? For lying. I was a young girl when we first met. You went for me quickly enough. Don't forget I can read your physical responses, Kyle. I could hear your blood pound in your veins. I could hear your breathing accelerate. Yeah, did Alexa get turned on, too? I shouldn't have said that. I knew I shouldn't have said that. But I was stinging a bit from the bash in the mouth. I was tired, and sometimes when I'm tired my mouth gets one second ahead of my brain. This was one of those times. Her hand flashed out of the dark again. This time I knew it was coming. I had my own hand up to block hers. Unfortunately, I guessed wrong. I'd expected her to go for a right cross again, but she surprised me using her left. She was ambidextrous, and I should have anticipated the move, but I didn't. She caught me a good one, slamming me in the right ear. This hurt even more than my cheek did. Something about getting hit in the ear, even after all my treatments. It hurt. I grunted and grabbed her. We grappled for a second, and I flipped her over on the bed and landed on top of her. A normal woman would have been crushed down by my weight and pinned helpless. But Sandra was no normal woman. My weight meant nothing to her. She kneed me, twisted, and I was flying across the room. She was so fast. I bounced off the lockers and came up in a crouch. We faced one another, breathing hard. We'd fought before, but this was more serious than usual. The whole thing surprised me. What's wrong? I asked. She heaved a huge sigh and stretched out on the bed. I'm sorry, she said. I stood straight, but I didn't step closer to her. Sandro was moody, but this was unusual even for her. I didn't say anything. Blood dribbled from my chin, but I ignored it. I don't know, she said. I suppose it's because she's a normal human girl. Younger, prettier, but most of all normal. I know you miss that. I hate that she's something you want. I hate that she's something I can't be. 
I opened the lockers and rummaged out a bottle of vodka. Usually I was a beer man, but tonight I felt the need for something stronger. I poured, and she appeared at my side. I don't like it straight, she said. Funny comments swam in my head, but this time I managed to stop them before they came out of my mouth. Instead, I got out a mixer and gave her a drink. Our glasses clinked and ice cubes tinkled inside. We drank our beverages in relative silence. I didn't bother to make up lies telling her I wasn't attracted to Alexa and that she was prettier than the Earth Girl tramp. I didn't even bother to apologize for the changes in my heart rate when the girl came near. She was too smart for that kind of talk. More importantly, I knew that if I made any more false moves, she might go off again. I did my damnedest to say nothing at all. So, we drank, and afterward we made love. She'd always been a demanding, strenuous lover, but this time our activities were more intense than usual. It was good, and when I finally did get some sleep, it was the sleep of exhaustion. Chapter 12 We made Planetfall precisely on time over Eden 8. I sipped coffee and blinked my red eyes. The nanites cleared the toxins left over from alcohol faster than normal human livers could ever manage, but somehow I still felt hard liquor in my brain the next day. There's a report from the task force in the Thor system, sir, Miklo said. I glanced at him. Anything serious? If it was, I would have awakened you. I nodded and flicked my finger over the screen of a tablet. It was from Captain Saren. I'd left her in charge out there. She said there were some odd readings from the bottom of the seabed on Yale. I frowned. Nothing's changed? Just these vibrations? Right, sir. Looks as if someone's trying to use the ring to communicate. When the rings were used to relay transmissions from one star system to another, they did so through a process of sympathetic resonance. Since the rings were essentially in two places at one time, if you could cause one to vibrate slightly, you were logically vibrating the one on the far side at the same time. Using this system and applying a code to the vibrations allowed for the instantaneous transmission of messages over countless light years. Jasmine is blocking this, right? Of course, sir, Miklo said. The instant the signal was detected, the fleet began jamming it. But we still don't know who is trying to send what message through, do we? No, sir. We do know the message is not intended for us. It could be the macros talking to the crustaceans, or the other way around. I frowned. What possible motivation could the crustaceans have for communicating with their masters now? Don't they know the machines are trying to kill them all? Miklo shrugged. Anything is possible, sir. We just don't know. I feel forced to remind you that the crustaceans did not agree to ally with us. For whatever reason, they are still technically allied with the macros. I don't like it, but I do understand it. The crustaceans are coldly logical when it comes to their own survival. They don't fear us as much as they do the machines. Miklos made a vague gesture that seemed to indicate I could be right, but he wasn't agreeing fully. I ordered some coffee and headed for the docking ports. The carrier wasn't built to land in an atmosphere, so we boarded smaller ships to take us down to Shadow Guard. When I finally stood on the battlements of my castle in the sky, I felt better. I liked it here. There were good memories already building, and somehow the place made me relax. I paced the walls for an hour, watching the sun drop over the horizon. The nights fell quickly here, and dawn was never far away. Tonight we were having a formal state dinner. This was the perfect place for it, and it would be our first— General Kerr had told us he'd make a formal announcement concerning Earth's diplomatic intentions at the dinner. I wasn't sure how I felt about that, but I was looking forward to the meal. The kitchens and chefs on staff at Shadow Guard were the best in the Eden system. I started off the evening by showing Kerr and his entourage around. 
Alexa was noticeably present, but subdued. Sandra was noticeably absent, but I knew she was lurking around somewhere nearby. She might be on the battlements or on the central mountain crag that anchored the fortress. My relationship with her was an odd one. She was part bodyguard, part lover, and part something else. We'd been through so much together, I couldn't imagine life without her shadow casting itself over mine. I knew that wherever she was, she was watching me, but I tried not to think about her. I knew I needed to clear my mind. I showed them most of the rooms, but not the command and control center, of course. We passed a number of dungeon-like doors which hid sensitive equipment, leaving them unopened. I knew that just looking at our hardware wouldn't be enough for them to gather much intel about it, but decided to err on the side of caution. Instead, I showed them the battlements, the views, and the ballroom where we would shortly have dinner. This is it, huh? Kerr asked me. Let me tell you something, Riggs. This is a fine medieval castle. The trouble is, I've seen them before, plenty of them. We've got them all over Europe clutching the top of one alp or another. I'm not terribly impressed by anything other than the view. I'm sorry you feel that way, General, I said evenly. I know you're hiding your real tech somewhere. I'm surprised you aren't proud enough to show off what it can do. Have you figured out how to spy on Earth through the rings yet? I blinked, startled. I'd never even thought of the idea. It was alarming, but I guessed immediately that it might be possible. Even if he just hooked up a remote control camera to the rings and used the vibration system to transmit back the images. You know as well as I do that we're both jamming the rings, sir, I told him evenly. Yeah, right. General Kerr was watching me closely, and I knew I'd probably revealed too much with my face. Damn the man, he was cagey. Are you ready yet to make your formal proposal? I asked, deciding it was a good time to switch the topic. I've yet to learn exactly why you're here. Let's start with the salad. I'm starved. All right, I said, and led them to the dinner table. I wasn't quite sure why Kerr was stalling about delivering his message, but maybe it was his natural flair for the dramatic. Sandra appeared when the dinner bell rang as if she'd been waiting for it. I knew that she had. One second there was a shadow in a doorway, the next she was seating herself at the table. I had the kitchens lay out our finest fare. It was different from an earth meal, naturally. We'd had some livestock and edible plants transported from earth and grown here. Most of them had come with the refugee fleet I'd rescued last year, along with the majority of our civilian population. I'd avoided eating the few goats, chickens, and cattle we had. Instead, I wanted to use them as breeding stock and build up to a nice harvest next year. I explained this to Kerr and his people as we sat down to our first course. At the moment, we'd even made it illegal to eat most of our earthly foodstuffs, I said. Anything that can be used to grow more food, especially animal herds, has been protected. We've got a few things that are ready to harvest, like coffee and beans— but most of our food comes from local alien crops. Eating unknown digestible has given us a few thousand tummy aches, but we've sorted out what can be eaten and how to prepare it. I can't wait, Kerr mumbled doubtfully. We started with six platters of seafood. Most of these mollusks were flown in from Eden Six, I explained. Our hottest tropical world. Over 95% of Eden Six is covered by seawater, the fishing is excellent in the shallower regions. Mollusks? Kerr asked doubtfully. Forgive me for the sea I got in biology thirty years ago, but are you talking about snails, Riggs? I cleared my throat in annoyance. Just try one, General. They're toasted to perfection. Dip them in that garlic butter sauce. You won't be disappointed. Making a face, Kerr tried it and chewed doubtfully. After a few seconds, his face softened. Weird tasting. Well, I quite like it, said Alexa. I glanced at her and smiled, but quickly took my eyes off her. Sandra was sitting at my side, and she watched me with careful interest. 
The table was long and rectangular. Some of my staff had pushed for a circular table, saying it went with the knights and castle theme, but I'd refused. I wasn't King Arthur, and this wasn't some kind of egalitarian round table. I sat at the end of the big table with Kerr on my left and Sandra on my right. Most of Kerr's staff members were placed close to us at the head of the table, with Miklos mixed in on the left side. Alexa was three seats down on my right across from Kerr and Miklos, but on the same side as Sandra. I didn't want to give Sandra any excuses to stare at the girl. Sandra had been irritated when I'd allowed them to bring sidearms to the dinner table. I assured her it wasn't a problem. A low-caliber bullet was unlikely to bring down any Marine, and we were armed, too, with much more sophisticated weaponry. Our needlers could burn a hole through inch-thick steel, most likely before the Imperials could get a weapon out and aimed properly. Real military people on the frontier felt naked without a weapon near at hand, and I understood that natural desire. We didn't have many traditions in the Eden system yet, but we knew instinctively that a table full of armed men usually guaranteed a polite dinner would be had by all. Accordingly, I had ordered all of my people to be armed at all times while in the presence of our visitors. The salads came next, excellent bowls of green and blue vegetation. These were local to Eden 8, as was the main course. When the roasted air swimmers were brought in, everyone sighed in anticipation. The smell alone was intoxicating. Even Kerr's eyes lit up. I felt a surge of pride. If we had a single meat that could challenge anything from Earth, it was our fresh, killed, and roasted air swimmers. We were all talking in a lively fashion and just starting to dig in when I noticed Lieutenant Alexa Brighton. She was standing at attention. Her plate of air swimmers lay before her untouched. Everyone quieted and stared. I felt Sandra tense. Most of us wore an expression of surprise. Sandra's was one of dark suspicion. I knew she was ready to spring at the girl if she presented any kind of threat. For once, I made no attempt to restrain Sandra. I didn't like this either, and I decided Sandra's natural paranoia might prove correct today. General Kerr spoke first. Yes, Lieutenant? He asked formally. Did you want to be excused? No, sir she said. She bit her lip. Her eyes didn't meet any of ours. They stared off over our heads. She was standing at full attention, as one might do when on a parade ground. I wanted to make a statement. The crowd had been murmuring, but now they fell quiet as a group. The clicking of forks and knives died with the whispers and speculations. There's no need to be formal, Kerr said softly. We are all engaging in polite conversation. No, sir, she said. You don't understand. This isn't conversation. Kerr narrowed his eyes at her. His fork was poised in midair. He'd been devouring his air swimmers with gusto despite himself. Now he placed the fork neatly beside his plate. He dabbed his lips with his linen napkin and sat back in his chair. Let's hear it, then. And I'm hoping it's something that will make your father proud back home. Alexa glanced at him for a moment, then looked dead ahead again. I don't know about that, sir. But General Kerr? Colonel Riggs? I wish to defect. I'm formally resigning my commission from the Imperial Forces. I would like to simultaneously submit my application for any role available in Star Force. The room fell into a deadly silence. Miklos and I exchanged glances. Miklos seemed as surprised as I was. I looked at Sandra and Kerr, but neither of them met my eyes. They were both staring at Alexa. Neither of them wore happy expressions. Now? Kerr demanded. Now you choose to announce you're a traitor. This is a state dinner. You've embarrassed everyone here, most significantly your father back home. I formally reject your request to resign. I doubt Riggs would want you in any case. 
Alexa looked at me then for the first time. There was a desperate look in her eyes. I... I await Colonel Riggs' decision, she said. This is his territory. It's his choice. There were a lot of eyes on me now. Everyone was in shock. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I was certain the girl had caused herself a great deal of trouble back on Earth if she was to be dragged home. Kerr would have her arrested, and who knew what else? The imperial government was not a soft one, by all accounts. It was an iron-fisted dictatorship. My mind swam, trying to foresee the possibilities. If I accepted her plea, gave her my protection, and granted her asylum, she might be able to give me invaluable intel on the Empire's military. On the other hand, it would be a diplomatic nightmare. It was just the sort of incident that had occurred with regularity during the Cold War between the dictatorial East and the Free West. I now understood what those leaders must have been thinking when these things had occurred on their watch. I'm surprised by your request, I said at last. I'm sure you can understand that. If I were to accept your application, and I'm only thinking about it now, mind you, I wouldn't want that to sour the improving relationship between the Empire and Star Force. It was at that moment I heard a click. It was a quiet sound, almost inaudible under the boom of my own voice. But it was there, and it was unmistakable. Having been in military action for years now, the sound was very familiar to me. Someone had drawn their weapon and readied it to fire. Chapter 13 Kerr was quiet and quick, but not smooth enough. Sitting on my left side, he had drawn his weapon under the table and aimed it carefully. I didn't have any time to think, or I might have pulled the blow. He was only a normal human, and one in his fifties at that. He'd been nanatized, but it looked to me as if he needed a fresh dose. I knew I didn't have much time. A single second, possibly less, I had to move now. Sandra had heard the sound as well. Her senses were enhanced, and so was her speed of movement. But she was across the table from Kerr, a good six feet away. She couldn't get there before I did. But she did act. I could feel her rise up behind me, looming and blocking the light. I didn't know exactly what she was doing, and I didn't have a split second to turn and look. Instead, I lifted my arm and brought it down on Kerr's wrist. Brought it down hard. Too hard. There was a snapping sound and a sharp intake of breath. The gun clattered to the floor, dropped by numb fingers. Kerr lifted his arm into view in shock. It had snapped down at a right angle. Both the bones in his forearm, the ulna and the radius, had been broken. The arm hung limply, his hand twitching feebly in an unnatural position. With Kerr disabled, I had time to turn my attention to Sandra and the rest of them— there she stood, my crazy woman, right on the dinner table. She loomed over Kerr and had a pistol in her hand, trained with unwavering precision on his left eye socket. Alexa, for her part, still stood at attention. Kerr had been aiming his gun at her, planning to shoot up through the table to kill the defector. I realized with sudden clarity that I'd doomed her in his mind— when I'd said I had not yet accepted her application for asylum, that meant she was still under his command and still his to execute if he wished to. The situation had unfolded so fast that I'd been taken by surprise. You've assaulted an Imperial officer on a diplomatic mission, Kerr said through gritted teeth. I'm sorry, I said, but I'm not accustomed to having dinner guests shoot one another at my table— not unless I ordered the action myself. Dinner is cancelled, Kerr said, hissing out the words in agony. I looked at him and nodded. I couldn't argue with that. Maybe we should adjourn for now, I suggested. We can pick up in a few days when you've recovered from this unfortunate accident. Kerr stood up, swaying slightly, chairs rasped on flagstones. All his staff members stood up with him. The Imperials wore white faces that matched their uniforms. There might not be any further discussion, Kerr said. 
It's up to you, Riggs. Do you want a deal, or do you want to abuse your guests and interfere with their internal politics? This is a serious diplomatic breach, and I can't do anything more until I contact the Emperor and make a full report. I'm not sure how he will react. I looked glum. I knew exactly how Crow would react, with rage. I stood up, too, and now all the Star Force people stood with me. They were all as stiff and uncomfortable-looking as the Imperials. I can understand that, I said. I don't have a policy in this situation yet. I'll arrest Lieutenant Brighton and place her in a holding cell. Colonel Riggs, called Alexa. May I speak? What is it? I'm sorry to have caused you this difficulty, but may I point out, you offered amnesty and protection to thousands of refugees from the Empire before this. They came out to you and found new homes. They're all around us. I realized she was right, of course, but this situation was different. Those people left with Earth's blessing, I said. Once they entered our space, I was obliged to protect them as civilians. You're part of a military organization. You've sworn an oath to them. Exactly, interjected Kerr. I demand that you remand the lieutenant into my custody. I shook my head. Given tonight's incident, I can't do that. Then I must retire and seek medical aid. I watched him go and then turned back to Alexa with a grim expression. That could have been handled better, I said. Couldn't you have at least waited until after he had made his proposals? I'm sorry, sir, she said. I was only thinking of myself. I've been building up my courage to make this move for months. I just had to try it tonight. I was afraid I'd lose heart and let the moment slide if I passed this by. I understood her, even if I was annoyed. It was a very human, emotional thing. I thought of her as a young woman in an abusive relationship. She had to move when she had the courage to do so. But oh, how I wished now she had waited. I was in a dilemma now. The easy thing to do would be to quietly ship her back to the Empire, perhaps to transfer her back to the battleship she'd come from, bound and gagged. That way, very few would know what had transpired. But the story would get out if I did that. I had to think about the future. This girl wouldn't be the last of her kind. She wouldn't be the only one to defect. We had a cold war of our own going on between Earth and Eden, and I couldn't afford to frighten every future defector and refugee. If they knew I would turn them away and toss them back to Crow's tender mercies, they would fear to even try it. And then there was the lovely, innocent girl herself. She'd come here to get this chance. She was the daughter of a high-ranking officer, a man who would be lucky to come out of this without being retired or even imprisoned. I doubted she realized what she'd done to her family back home. Crow had a jealousy of me that had grown over the years. He was also afraid of me. He wouldn't go easy on her or her family if he got his hands on them. I thought of sending her back to the Empire, handcuffed and terrified. What would they do to her? Torture? Mutilation? Quiet murder? How could I order her away, knowing what her fate would be? I couldn't. I knew that with a sudden crushing certainty. Like it or not, I was stuck with this young woman, and I'd lost an opportunity to seal a new deal with the Empire. How could I claim to be the voice of freedom and justice in the universe— if I crushed someone like this. I knew I'd met my match. In battles, I felt at home. I understood how to face an enemy and destroy him. But this was different. This was a choice with no right answer and with bad consequences no matter what decision I made. There was no neat way to win, or at least none that came easily to my mind. Everyone was looking at me, I realized, they weren't able to hear my thoughts, so I appeared to be dithering and indecisive. I didn't want to look weak, so it was time to take action. I flopped down in my chair and began eating roasted air swimmer again. The dish didn't taste quite as hot and good as it did a few minutes ago, but I wasn't going to let anyone throw them away. 
Around me, my staff sat and ate, too. All except Alexa. Am I under arrest, Colonel? She asked when I looked up at her. Yeah, I guess, I said. Now sit down and eat. Let's not let all this good food go to waste. Alexa trembled slightly as she sat down and took up her fork for the first time. She took small bites and chewed each one for a long time. I could tell her heart wasn't into the meal after her near-death experience. It was a shame, really. The air swimmers were superb tonight. My staff was subdued. Conversation was light and was kept to a minimum. To make matters less comfortable, Sandra leaned forward to glare at Alexa every few seconds for the rest of the meal. Both Alexa and I pretended not to notice this. When I finally sighed and pushed back from the table, I felt relaxed for the first time this evening. Now that was some good food, I said. I'm going to go down to the kitchens and tell the cooks they outdid themselves. Don't you think there's something more important to worry about right now? Sandra asked in an acid voice. She nodded her head toward Alexa, who sat very still with big eyes. I looked at Alexa and noticed her plate was only half empty. You going to finish those? I asked. Kyle, are you going to send her to the brig or not? Sandra demanded. I gave her a surprised look. Why, no, I'm not. You said she was under arrest. Yeah, she is. So what? She's in the middle of Shadow Guard, one of the highest security structures in the star system. She's not going anywhere. Sandra looked pissed. I wasn't quite sure why. So by prisoner, you meant she's a guest that can't leave? I nodded. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. We have to decide how to handle this situation with Kerr. I'm hoping he'll cool off by morning and we can get back to business. I turned my attention back to Alexa. You're going to have to stay out of sight for now. We'll give you new quarters, somewhere down with the enlisted people under the castle. Might as well let Kerr think you're sitting in chains someplace. Could you take care of that, Miklos? Of course, Colonel, he said. He got up and left the chamber. I could tell Sandra wanted to see real chains on the girl, but she was going to be disappointed. I didn't want to mistreat her. She could be a valuable source of information. If we treated her like a guest under restriction, she would stay friendly. I didn't know much about what was happening back on Earth, and she was connected to the people who did. I couldn't explain all this to Sandra with Alexa sitting right there, so I took Alexa's plate and finished it. Somehow this made Sandra more irritated. She watched me eat, wearing an expression that reminded me of an angry house cat. I did my best to ignore her and enjoy the dish. Really, it was too much good food even for my gut to handle. I felt a bit uncomfortable when I'd finished. Miklos came back as they rolled in the dessert trays. I waved them off. I was too full to enjoy something sugary now. Miklos whispered at my shoulder. There's a problem, sir. When Miklos worried, I worried too. I didn't ask him what the problem was. I got up, excused myself, and followed him to the main gallery. As we exited the room, Miklos paused. Lieutenant Brighton, there is a new room for you on level seven. Please ask the stewardess for directions. Ah, uh, okay, she said. Sandra stood up in our wake. She looked after me and then after Alexa. I could tell she was undecided who she should shadow. Finally, she followed me. She walked a good thirty paces behind us, and Miklos was whispering, but I knew she could hear every word. Tell me what's going on, Commodore, I said. I apologize for further interrupting the dinner. Never mind about that. It was a total disaster before you arrived. Just make your report. We've received a message from Captain Saren. She says there are strange signals emanating from the ring on the surface of Yale. What kind of funny signals? They're communication signals. Origin and destination unknown. Any clue what they're saying? No, sir. No known code is being used. I've given all the data to Marvin, but he's come up with nothing as well. 
we dealt with unknown signals being relayed by the rings before. The rings were communication devices, after all, if used appropriately. Unlike radio signals, however, they operated on a principle of entanglement, which was kind of like the way voodoo dolls were supposed to work. If you jabbed one, the other felt it. Unlike radio, there was no way to detect the transmission's source. You couldn't easily figure out who was jabbing a needle into whose doll. Let's go over the list of suspects, I said. Are either of the rings in the system vibrating? No, sir. Just the seabed ring on Yale. Okay, then. That eliminates Earth and the Blues, unless they've figured out some new way to bypass our jamming and detection systems. Assuming they haven't, we're down to two known participants in this conversation, the crustaceans and the macros. Miklos nodded slowly, frowning. We went in there to help them, and they talk to the very monsters that are seeking to destroy them all. Why would they do that, Colonel? Why wouldn't they side with us? I can understand their reasoning, look at it from their perspective. They just suffered hundreds of billions of civilian casualties. They aren't interested in right or wrong or honor. They're interested in survival. If they have to kiss up to their conquerors, they're going to do it. But they've seen us defeat the machines more than once. Yes, but much of our military strength is based on our battle station— that doesn't help them, because their three worlds are on the wrong side of it. The fleet we sent out there didn't impress anyone. The macros display ten times our fleet strength when they send out a wave of ships. No offense meant to fleet, Commodore. None taken, he said stiffly. I've tried relentlessly to convince you of our need for more ships. Relentlessly indeed, but that's got to be it, then. The crustaceans fear the macros more than they do us. It's as simple as that. What do we do next, Colonel? I'm not going to accuse them of anything or give them any ultimatums. If the macros have given the crustaceans new marching orders, I don't want to be caught by surprise. Transfer all production to fleet. Postpone all civilian and ground force orders at the factories. Miklos' eyes were shining as he took in these happy orders— I could tell he was excited to have his beloved fleet back at the center of our strategy. I'll make the preparations, sir, he shouted, saluting. He turned as if to trot away, but I called him back. There's more, I said. We need a show of force. We'll fly out there with every ship we can spare from the home front and prepare to do battle. If you will excuse me, Colonel. I nodded. Move fast. We fly out of here in three hours. He ran off like a kid that had to pee. The second he was gone, Sandra came out of the shadows. She'd been standing closer than I'd realized. This castle was lit in the old-fashioned way, with fewer, dimmer sources of illumination. We're leaving so soon? she asked. Did you hear everything? Yes. Well, then you know the score. We have to get out there and find out what's going on. I left the chamber and went downstairs to my quarters. Sandra followed me on silent feet. Our quarters were sumptuously appointed. We had velvet draperies and thick, soft carpets. The bed itself was a four-poster carved from local hardwoods. I'd looked forward to spending the night here again. This has become home, this castle of cool stone and cold winds, I said, looking around. Now it seems I'm not going to get to spend any time here. I know. I'll miss it, too. But there's something you'll have to decide about before we go. Kerr and his entourage. I looked at her suddenly. Right. The negotiations. Well, Kerr himself said that was on hold now until he could get new instructions from Crow. Since Earth is still jamming the ring to Seoul, transmitting back and forth will take nearly two weeks. We might be back by then, if we're lucky. He'll just have to sit here and eat our stocks of air swimmers until we return. When the rings were jammed, we could still communicate using radio signals to relay a message across the systems themselves. Each message had to crawl across each system to a ship waiting at each ring. The ship then crossed to the other side and relayed the message. 
This way, the transmission followed the chain until it reached its final destination. As radio signals traveled at the entirely inadequate speed of light, it took a long time for a message to reach across the stars. By the time Kerr did talk to Earth and get back a reply, the transmission would have crossed Alpha Centauri, Helios, Eden, and the solar system. Twice. The round-trip time was about two weeks. Sandra walked to the bed and swung herself around the nearest bedpost like a dancer. She paused, hanging upside down at an angle that would be impossible for nearly any normal human. I watched her with a mixture of amazement and alarm. My girlfriend was part pole dancer and part bat. What about the girl? She asked me suddenly. Will you leave her here as well? Oh, Alexa. Right. I said thoughtfully. I'm not sure that would be a good idea with Kerr so near. There might be an incident. He nearly murdered her at dinner, after all. What are you going to do with her, then? I guess we'll have to take her with us. We can interrogate her on the flight. She's sure to have good intel on the Empire. This could be a boon for us. We've had very little information on the political and military situation of Earth since Captain Sarin defected. We've got to make the most of these opportunities. Will you conduct these interrogations personally? She purred. My next breath froze in my lungs. I realized in that instant that I'd stepped out onto thin ice. Her questions had been calmly delivered, but I could see where they were going. She was feeling jealous again. I knew I needed to defuse her before Alexa and I both suffered. You know, I began, thinking fast, I think I'm going to be too busy for that. In fact, I'd like you to take over the task, if you could. Me? she asked. She looked at me, hanging upside down by one foot. Her hair nearly touched the flagstones. Yes. Don't sweat her, just be her friend. Do the girl talk thing. She'll probably tell you all about her family and what's going on back on Earth. That's a very sexist thing to say, Kyle. It is? Um, sorry. But I'll do it anyway. Good, I said, riding a wave of relief. I felt as if I'd just taken two flying bullets and slammed them into one another, canceling the momentum of both. It was the perfect judo move, a deft stroke of the sort I'd rarely managed when dealing with women. Naturally, I had no idea at the time what the repercussions would be. Chapter 14 the flight out to the Thor system quickly became more urgent. Just as we left Eden 8, we got a new communique from Captain Saren, who was still at her post in the Thor system. The ring on the seabed had become active again, but this time, instead of sucking out the moon's vast oceans, it was allowing things to crawl through onto the ocean floor. These things were unmistakable, as we'd seen them time and again. They were macros the big models. Also, unlike most of the macros we'd seen recently, these units had shields. I recalled that back on Earth when we'd first battled them, the biggest machines had been large enough and had generators powerful enough to project their own bubble-like domes of force. That had been the reason for the development of my marines in the first place— We'd needed to get under those shields and shoot up into the bellies of those hundred-foot-tall metal monsters. Now it was happening all over again, to another unsuspecting world. The machines were marching, masses of them. Like a long line of army ants, they came up from the seafloor and strode out onto the newly revealed salt-crusted lands. We're going to have to gather the fleet again. I told Sandra as I dressed and prepared to go to the bridge. We'll pull everything together into one single fist this time. With Miklos' new carriers, we'll have a stronger force than we've ever had. Why go out there at all? Sandra asked me. Why not retreat to hide behind our battle station? If the macros come, let them. The crustaceans don't want to join us anyway. Let them deal with it. You're a cold woman, Sandra. That's not what you said last night. I chuckled and shook my head. 
They've just lost hundreds of billions of lives. That represents a vast loss of sentient biotic beings. Whether these crustaceans agree to cooperate or not, I consider them to be my natural allies. Every one of them that dies weakens our side. So we're going to protect them. We're going to try. When we arrived on the bridge, my command staff was already in emergency mode. Marvin had remained out at Thor with Jasmine's fleet. I summoned him online to grill him. I wanted to know how the Yale ring had been reactivated. Marvin, you told me you'd shut off the ring, I said. Not exactly, sir. I said that it appeared I had shut off the ring. The truth is not yet known. I rolled my eyes. Marvin never took the blame for anything. Somehow, when the crap really hit the fan, it was always some other guy's fault. If you didn't really shut it off, why did it stop sucking out the ocean? I asked. And more importantly, why is it allowing troops through into Yale's ocean now? There are two possibilities that have risen to the top of my stack of logical deductions. Name one. Possibly I did shut down the ring. However, the macros have turned it back on again and purposefully reversed the flow of the ring— in this hypothetical scenario, they are now using it to transport their ground troops directly to the planet. What's the other? When I turned off the ring, it is possible I didn't actually turn it off. Recall that the command I sent was a random hit. It is well within the domain of probability that what I actually did was reverse the direction of the ring's flow. In this scenario, the ring was never actually disabled. I nodded slowly. He was right. One of those two possibilities had to be it. Really, it didn't matter much which one had occurred. What mattered now was that Yale was under attack. They had a full-scale ground invasion going on down there. I frowned at the on-screen maps. We'll have to deal with the machines directly. We can bombard them from orbit, but they're notoriously hard to kill. Those shielded behemoths are only going to die one way. We've got to get down there, land ground forces, and get in close. That's a very hazardous duty, sir, Marvin pointed out. Don't you think I know that? I snapped. I knew I was being irritable, but I felt I had a right to be. This wasn't going as planned. Nothing was. I contacted Miklos and gave him grim orders. Call up the transports, I said. I want an emergency muster. I want 10,000 Marines in space within 24 hours. Yes, sir. I'll try, sir. Over the next day, Miklos came pretty close. I had my 10,000 troops 30 hours later. That man knew how to get people moving. About half of the Marines were human, while the rest were Centaur volunteers. Instead of assembling an organized fleet at Welter Station and sailing out as a tight group as I'd planned, we scrambled and put up everything we could. I left only Miklos's carrier and two dozen gunboats behind to defend Eden in case Earth attacked us. I didn't like leaving Eden relatively undefended, but I figured the odds of a sucker punch coming from Earth were low right now. Emperor Crow had just sent us an envoy, after all, and technically we were still in the midst of peace negotiations. As far as I could tell, Earth had no way of knowing what our fleet movements were and they didn't have much of a fleet of their own left to hit us with after the macros had plowed into the solar system last year. Most importantly, it just wouldn't be like Crow to risk losing his last ships in a bid to knock me out. He'd always been the type to build up quietly, massing forces until he felt victory was assured before he moved. In a way, he reminded me of the macros, but with less guts even than they had. At least when they made a play, they didn't try to beg and plead their way out of it when things went badly. They just lost their fleets and built new ones. Crow was more like a Mongol leader in that he stayed well behind the front lines and would run if it looked like he was going to lose. Unfortunately, his tactics were as effective as they were dishonorable. My ships reached and passed Welter Station on the dawn of the third day. It took two more long days to reach Yale. By that time, Captain Saren had managed to knock out about a dozen of the big machines, mostly by continuously bombarding them from space. Our gunboats had a long range and powerful punch. She kept them firing down into Yale's atmosphere, sending a steady stream of blue balls of light from orbit to the surface. 
Single railgun salvos weren't enough to break the machines directly, especially not the ones that stayed under the cover of the ocean. But once they dared to march up onto the land and establish a beachhead, they were pounded with withering fire. The gunboats, all concentrating on a single target, could bring a machine down after an hour or so of steady fire. The trick was to hit a given machine several times within the span of a few seconds. When we managed to do that, the shields didn't have time to regenerate, and the machine was overwhelmed and destroyed. It seemed to me, looking at the raw data, that these crawling machines had tougher shields than the ones that had invaded Earth so long ago but they were also slower moving. Captain Saren sent us hourly reports. At first, our strategy was working. She picked a target, had every gunboat aim at it, and after a while it died. But the machines were still making headway. They'd set up a few underwater domes and were beginning to churn out workers. I had to wonder what the hell their long-term plan was. Right now, they seemed content to colonize Yale while under continuous fire— Maybe they figured they could just ignore us and keep building. The idea was galling. By the time we were a day out from Planetfall at Yale, Saren had given up on bombarding them in the shallow ocean near the ring. She waited until they surfaced and raced for rocky cover. Then, like a thousand BB guns popping away at sea turtles in unison, the gunboats began their relentless bombardment. There were two problems with our strategy that I could see— one, the machines kept coming. They seemed to be limitless, while our salvos of railgun ammo were dwindling. Within a few days, our stocks would be depleted. Two, the macros were clearly becoming harder to kill. They were redesigning themselves with thicker shields. It had to be that. Looking back through the vids and reports, I determined that it now took nearly ten hits to bring one down, and had taken only three at the start of the invasion. I was alarmed, and so was Saren. Our shooting gallery battle was turning into a nightmarish grind. Saren requested permission to commit her fighters, and I denied that request. She then asked to employ her missiles, and I denied that too. The inhabitants of Yale had suffered badly enough. I couldn't in good conscience begin blasting and irradiating their wounded planet with thermonuclear blasts. When we were less than six hours from joining her forces in orbit, Saren called to make her final plea. Colonel, she said, I can no longer hold them back. They've taken eleven islands near the underwater ring. They are setting up factories under heavy domes, two of them at the bottom of the ocean nearby. Railgun fire cannot possibly penetrate those domes. Already smaller worker units are flowing from the domes to gather materials. According to my projections... Yale will be overrun within weeks. I thought about her transmission carefully before replying. Captain Saren, I said while gazing sternly into the vid pickup. I understand your situation. Relief is on the way. I have reviewed your requests for tactical changes to our response operation, and again I'm rejecting them. All my prior decisions stand. You are not to use thermonuclear weapons nor employ your fighters— we're holding those assets in reserve for now. The only thing I want you to send down into that atmosphere are conventional bombardment strikes, laser emissions, and railgun salvos. Rigs out. I paused with my hand hovering over the cutoff button. I'd frozen her image on the screen while I made my reply. I stared at her dark, olive-shaped eyes. I'd always had a soft spot for Captain Sarah, and everyone knew that. She had to be freaking out. This was her first fleet task force, and it looked like she was failing her mission. The planet she'd been assigned to protect was being overrun. Jasmine, I said, lowering my voice and putting some humanity into it. I'll be there soon with heavy reinforcements. You've done well with what you had. You've slowed the enemy advance as much as you could. Don't worry, the Marines will handle this invasion when we get there. We've done it before. With this addendum, I signed off and transmitted the message. She didn't send me a reply. We arrived a few hours later and parked in orbit over Yale, joining Jasmine's forces. Altogether, we formed an impressive fleet. I transferred my staff over to Gotter and relieved Jasmine's command staff. 
Her people were competent, but slightly less experienced than mine. More importantly, they'd been sweating it out here for days and could use the break. Jasmine didn't take these changes personally. She wasn't like most of my senior staff. She didn't have a big ego. She wanted to do her job as well as humanly possible. That was about it. I'd always found her quiet competence refreshing. Within an hour after arriving, I was standing on the roomy but stark command deck of Gotter. The ship was equipped with a small holo tank to display the local situation in three dimensions. There was also a large planning table. It was easier to manipulate, especially when discussing ground ops, which were pretty much two-dimensional affairs. How do you like your new ship, Captain Saren? I asked. Love it, sir, she said. But I've yet to see my fighters do anything. I nodded, twisting my lips. You'll get the chance, don't worry. They're designed to operate under atmospheric operations as well as in space. We'll need air cover when we drop our marines. Let's plan that part of the operation now. She worked the table's controls with deft strokes of her fingers. The image changed and blurred for a second, then came into focus. The islands around the ring at the bottom of the sea were stained red. I frowned at the table. They've taken them all? Every island in the archipelago? Yes, sir. I'm afraid so. I looked up at Captain Saren. Had there been a hint of bitterness in her voice? I couldn't quite tell. Unlike Sandra, you didn't always know what Jasmine was thinking. She kept staring at the map, making adjustments. She didn't look me in the eye. Finally, I turned my attention back to the islands. We have to get down there. Right now, I said. You'll operate as my exec. I want you to stay up here even after we've set up a beachhead. If things go badly on the ground, take over. She finally looked up at me. You're going down there? Personally? Of course. You didn't think I'd dump 10,000 troops on the New World and hide in the sky, did you? Her lips twitched upward, a hint of a smile. She shook her head very slightly. I suppose I shouldn't have thought that. Sandra won't be happy. I frowned at her comment. Fortunately, she's not in charge of this fleet. Jasmine studied the table. She zoomed in on the largest of the eleven islands. She tapped on a mountain top, which instantly grew large and craggy. The table displayed an angled view canted about thirty degrees to the north. The mountains were rugged and barren. Every rock was encrusted by coral-like growths and lime deposits. I've been examining possible drop points, she said. I'd recommend this one. That looks pretty rough, I said. I'll have trouble setting up any kind of base there. Jasmine nodded. Exactly. That's why there are no machines at this location. At least none of the big ones. There are a few workers tearing minerals from the cliffs. I understood her reasoning immediately. When establishing a beachhead, it was best to land without being pelted by defensive fire. The mountain was steep and unfriendly looking, but it would afford us higher firing positions and would allow us to land our initial deployment battalions with minimal losses. Still, I was unconvinced. What else have you got? She paged to a new spot. This one was underwater, off a wide, rocky beach. There were no pretty sand beaches on these new islands. They hadn't had time to form yet. You could come down under the cover of water here, she said. This island is small and relatively undefended. There are no enemy factories here, so the machines seem to have given it a low priority. I massaged my chin and stared. Really, neither of these drop sites appealed to me. But with only a few enemy-infested islands to choose from, we didn't have a lot of options. This wasn't like Earth, where you could always land farther away and advance on foot to your destination. There was very little land to fight over, and I didn't want to get into a deep undersea battle if I could help it. I'd done that before, and it had been a grim experience. All right, I said at last. I'm going to take these two locations and hit them immediately. Captain Saren looked up at me with wide eyes. I could tell I'd surprised her. She looked pleased and alarmed at the same time. I imagine there are other locations to choose from, if you went over every island carefully. I nodded. 
probably, but we don't have another day or two to screw around. The macros are growing stronger every hour, sinking their teeth into this world. We're not gaining in strength. In fact, we're losing in relative terms. So I'm going to trust your judgment. As far as I'm concerned, these are the best spots to land. She nodded and began working on the details of the plan. I saw battalions appear on the map as if they'd been dropped. Our marine battalions had a fighting strength of about a thousand men each, broken into ten companies. She grouped them on both landing zones, placing three battalions underwater and the rest on the mountainous island. The three on the ocean floor were arranged in a crescent near the beach they were assigned to invade. I tapped at the three battalions she'd placed in the water. These will have to wait, I said. Prep the land drop first. I've got something planned for these oceans before we put a single boot into them. Something planned? Yeah. Where's Marvin? The robot showed up a few minutes later, looking excited. You requested my presence, Colonel Riggs. Yes, I ordered you to come up here, Marvin. I want you to link up with that ring in the seabed again. I want you to reverse your prior command sequence. Captain Sarin and Marvin both stared at me. When he'd first slithered up, most of his cameras had been trained on the tactical displays. Now there were too many cameras on me to easily count them. Let me verify that command, Marvin said. You want me to reset the ring? To cause it to empty the oceans of Yale again? I was under the impression we'd taken great steps to stop that process. Yes, I said. But now I want you to turn that ring into a giant sucking hole. I looked down at the display and zoomed in on the dark central circle of water the islands surrounded. If we can, we're going to flush every machine that hasn't made it out of the water yet back to wherever they came from. The glare coming up from the screen underlit my face. I knew I was smiling broadly, and my teeth were probably shining with bluish light. But I didn't care if I looked half mad to my staff. I was really looking forward to this little surprise. The machines were going to regret crawling onto this world, if they were capable of regretting anything. Chapter 15 Our drop troop technology had improved over the years. Our first efforts had been makeshift at best. I recalled loading up Marines into steel boxes resembling railroad cars and carrying them with the cargo arm on my nano ship. We'd later advance to small one-man flying discs we called skateboards. Lately, I'd had a new set of problems. Not all my Marines were human now. I found that the Centaur troops operated best on modified versions of our self-mobile discs. We'd changed the name from skateboard to surfboard, as they were longer and more powerful. These units could carry a Marine with full kit across a star system if necessary, but we rarely went more than a few million miles on them. The Centaur troops liked them a lot because they could travel in space without having to be confined in a tight compartment. Even after the microbial baths Marvin had worked out to change their brains slightly, the Centaurs still shied away from being crammed into a troop pod. Riding the surfboard gave them freedom of movement and more wide-open vistas than anyone could want. The problem with surfboards came into play when dealing with a large planet that possessed an atmosphere. They simply couldn't drop fast enough to the target. As any old-fashioned paratroop will tell you, dropping from a high altitude into a battlefield is not a fun experience. You're completely exposed up there. In a modern combat environment with automated anti-air weaponry that could pinpoint a missile and fire in less than a second, floating down on the breezes was unacceptable. You had to get down to the ground in a hot LZ as fast as technologically possible in order to survive the enemy AA. I knew the machines would be gunning for us when I left Eden, so I'd left most of the centaurs behind. I'd come out with human marines and our latest designs for encapsulated drops. The men had a special term for these new contraptions. They called them torpedoes, or, if they were in a sour mood, flying coffins. I decided to stick to the first term, as it was more positive and slightly more accurate. The units actually looked like torpedoes or old dumb bombs when they were dropped from space. They were about ten feet long with sleek ceramic exteriors made to absorb heat. 
That was their primary purpose, to allow our troops to drop from orbit at extreme speeds without burning up in the target planet's atmosphere. They were designed for single use and used simple materials so they could be mass-manufactured by our macro factories. We had two kinds of alien production units, macro systems and nano systems. Our macro units were big, dumb, and amazingly powerful. They produced things like the hulls of our ships and our biggest generators. The smaller factories, courtesy of the nanos, were much smaller and produced finer goods. Most of these were made up of nanites, which could be used to make almost anything from intelligent brain boxes to smart metal walls. Of the two, the nano units were probably more valuable to Star Force, but I always wanted and needed both types of factories. I decided to go down with the first wave. Sandra wasn't happy about this, and she let her feelings be known about ten minutes after I'd made my decision. She found me in the main passageway less than a hundred yards from the sally port. I was wearing my heavy exoskeletal armor and trotting happily for the exit when she appeared in front of me hands on hips and eyes blazing. I pulled up short, clanking and screeching to a stop. Around me, about five hundred other troops kept thundering by. They gave me smirks as they went by, no doubt knowing what I was in for before I did. My relationship with Sandra was well known among the troops. Few of them talked about it in my presence, but I found it slightly embarrassing anyway. "'Where do you think you're going?' she demanded. "'To Yale.' I said. The hard way. Now please step aside so I can invade this moon, Sandra. I would like to have a little talk with you first. I hesitated. As always, probably since time immemorial, I weighed my options when confronting my girl. Sure, I could blow her off and soldier on, but sometimes putting up the pretense of listening carefully to her complaints could diffuse a major blow-up later on down the line. Against my better judgment, I stepped into an alcove stuffed with emergency equipment. There were fire hoses, med packs, and nanite injection kits strapped to every surface. I had to place my foot-wide armored boots carefully to avoid smashing anything with them. These suits are getting more bulky every day, I complained. I think the next generation should be lighter and more mobile. Whatever they look like, I don't want you wearing one, she said. At least not without a very good reason. It was about then another person wandered into the alcove with us. It was none other than Lieutenant Alexa Brighton. Her eyes were wider than ever. I wasn't sure if she'd ever seen a company of Marines in full battle kit before. She looked stunned. Unfortunately, she also provided the marching line of men something interesting to look at. They paused at the alcove, examining the scene. They looked at the two women in confusion for a second, then suddenly brightened. Several of them grinned and gave me the thumbs up behind Sandra's back. It took me a second to realize what was going on. They thought Sandra had caught me with the girl. It had happened before, and the results were legendary. I did my best to ignore them as they tramped steadily by. This was difficult, as the level of noise a line of power-armored marines made was near that of a passing freight train. This discussion will have to wait, I told her. I've got a planet to save. Why do you have to go down there personally? Sandra hissed at me. I heaved a sigh. Lieutenant Brighton stared at the two of us with an expression of dazed curiosity, but didn't interrupt. I'm a Marine, first and foremost, I said. I'm going down with the troops to personally oversee the defense of Yale. I can't do that as well from space. Yes, but you're risking your life for a small benefit, Sandra argued. My face twisted in annoyance. I'll be fine, I said. I always am. No, you're not always fine. Sometimes you lose an arm or something. We've got the best medical now, I chuckled. I'll grow a new one. The women studied me for a moment. I had to wonder what Alexa was thinking. Two more passing marines paused and made a slightly obscene motion behind the women. Then they high-fived one another and trotted away. I frowned, but decided to pretend I hadn't noticed. You know what I think? Sandra said. I think you just can't keep out of the excitement. I think you love it too much, Kyle. 
It will kill you one day. What do you think, Lieutenant? I asked, turning to her. Alexa thought about it for a second. I think I'd like to go down with you. It does look exciting. This wasn't the response either Sandra or I had expected. No way, Sandra said, eyes blazing. You're staying up here with me. Alexa dropped her eyes and nodded. I felt a moment of compassion for the girl. Sandra had probably been a harsh woman to follow around. If Alexa wanted to drop with me, Sandra had to be giving her hell. That's right, I said. It's out of the question. You have no armor training, no nanites, and no place in ground base operation. I turned to Sandra. Has she been giving you any good information about Earth? Yes, Sandra said. Her father is very highly ranked. She has a lot of stories to tell. Things aren't going well back home, Kyle. He's turned into some kind of crazy cult of personality dictatorship. I nodded, unsurprised. Crow had always been big on himself, and he'd wanted total power since day one. Now, except for the stellar frontier, he had it. When I get back in a few days, we'll go over it in detail, I said. Thanks for your help, Lieutenant. She nodded, and I turned to go. A thin arm, like a steel band, blocked my way. I could have tossed Sandra aside, but I didn't. I turned back to her. I had my visor open, and she pushed her face into it. It wasn't easy to kiss a man in full power armor, but she managed it. She practically had to climb onto my suit to do it. Hooting broke out from the hallway full of streaming marines before we disengaged. A general cheer arose as I finally turned and trotted with the rest of them before she could think of another way to delay me. I stepped into a circular pad about twenty feet in diameter. Above me, a loud hissing sound erupted. I knew this was the hydraulics issuing a new pod. Just in time, I snapped down my visor and put my arms flat at my sides. There was a crashing sound and everything went dark for a second. It seemed as if someone had dropped a safe on my head. It was the drop pod being lowered by powerful nanite arms. The pod snapped into place, and I felt as if I were being picked up. Because I was. Inside full power armor, it's easy to feel claustrophobic under the best of circumstances. But when they seal you in a flying coffin on top of it all and throw you out into space, the sensation is inescapable. The circular pad was really a smart metal door. Once the pod was in place, the pad had disintegrated and let me fall through it into the firing chamber. Dropping us like bombs wasn't good enough for Star Force. Some underling of mine had determined more speed was needed. Under the launch pad was a long tube that essentially served as a cannon. I, inside my tight ceramic pod, was the cannonball. There was a spinning, rolling sensation for a moment as I was aimed downward, head first. Then the cannon fired. A terrific shock of force struck my shoulders and skull as I was hurled out of the bottom of the ship. Accelerating at about thirty Gs for a brief period, I knew what it felt like to be a bullet. I shot downward, encased in darkness. The acceleration was painful, but brief. The pod was carrying me downward with fantastic speed toward the planet's surface. As I dropped, the speed slowly increased— it was a grim sensation being locked inside this thing. There were no screens to look at, just a few readouts from my helmet's HUD. Except for numbers like altitude and speed printed in colored digital numbers on the inside of my visor, I was cut off from the world. When falling into a planet's atmosphere from space, there was always a few minutes of radio blackout. It was an empty, gnawing feeling. You were already alive or you were already dead and there was absolutely nothing you could do about it. Those few minutes passed, and I was still breathing. The pod tumbled until I was falling feet first. The next question in my mind was easy. Was I over the right target? Finally, data began streaming into my helmet. A few details about the ground flashed up, displayed in 2D as elevations. Piled shapes spiked up toward my descending rear end. The spikes grew, and my feet hurt just looking at them. The protrusions were mountains, of course. Rugged mountains crusted in coral and lime deposits. They'd been at the bottom of a black ocean a few weeks ago. Now I was about to walk on them. 
The retros fired next and slammed up into my feet. I wasn't really ready for the shock, even though I should have been. I made a mental note to add a warning buzzer when this transition was five seconds from hitting the men riding in these tin cans. If my knees had been locked at that moment, well, it would have hurt. Massive G-forces slammed up into my boots, shocking my entire body. I'd been relatively comfortable and weightless a second before, free-falling at about 10,000 miles per hour. Now that velocity had to be reduced. I gritted my teeth and strained my muscles. Everything hurt. The burn seemed to go on longer than the initial firing had, primarily because I'd been building up some velocity on the long fall into Yale's gravity well. I almost had a heart attack when the final stage began. The pot around me blew apart. It flashed open and fell in eight twirling, burning pieces. I was free-falling now, and since I hadn't really been ready for it, I inverted, then rolled right side up, then found myself inverted again. I was in a tumble. I fought the suit's controls and cursed myself for not having done practice jumps with this new drop pod system. The ground was alarmingly close. About a second after I got my feet under me and the automatic stabilizers kicked in, I hit the ground. I landed on an ancient seabed, which was now dry for the first time in probably a billion years. My boots hit the surface and kept on going, punching through the crust and into the slimy mud beneath. When I was about three feet down, my boots found solid rock. That stopped me. I could move my arms, but not my legs. They were buried like a spearhead from space in the mountainside. There was something all around me, something that looked like drifting snow. It took me a dazed second to realize it was salt and sand and dried-out crap from the ocean floor. I'd hit with such force, I'd fired up a plume of debris. I was on the surface of Yale. I wondered hazily how many alien worlds I'd walked on in total. I'd lost count by now. Chapter 16 You okay, sir? To me, in my slightly dazed state of mind, the question seemed to come from inside my helmet. I didn't immediately associate it with anyone in my surroundings. The voice was familiar, but my brains were addled. It took me a second to think about who it was. After a moment, I had it. Quan? Of course, sir, he said. A big shadow fell over me. Something grabbed my gloves and pulled. Just let me get you out of there, Colonel, he said. You're gonna be fine. I realized that Quan was standing over me, tugging at me as if I were a nail sunk halfway into a chunk of wood. It was an embarrassing situation, and I forced myself to get going. I knew that if Quan was there, others were close by. I didn't want to look as bad off as I felt. I had to appear to know what the hell I was doing, at least. Half of leadership, in my opinion, entails appearing to be strong and confident, even if you aren't. If you're feeling weak and you let the men know it, they get nervous. I began churning my power-suited knees. White dust plumed up. Brownish-green slime from under the crusty surface layer came up next, fountaining out of the growing hole around my legs. You must have hit pretty hard, sir, Quan said when he had me out and standing on the mountainside. All around us, Marines were busy helping one another, securing equipment and looking for targets. Nothing threatened us immediately, but I was sure the machines knew we were here and would be taking action against us soon. Did we lose anybody? I asked. No, sir, not in this unit. Excellent, I said, trying not to sound too surprised. Let's form up the company and head down slope. I want us dug in around the waist of the mountain, then we'll call in the next battalions. They're already coming down, sir, Quan said, pointing upward. I tilted back my helmet to the limit. The neck region on these power suits only rotated so far. The sky was full of burning, falling objects. They moved too fast to be flares, but too slow to be meteors. They were drop pods, hundreds of them. All right, everyone move down slope, I roared. Get them moving, Quan. Those drop capsules will make quite a dent in the helmet of any Marine left in this LZ. Quan gazed up at the falling stars overhead. His big mouth gaped open. 
You think they might hit us? The chances of a direct collision are small, but I want everyone moving down slope just in case. We can set up firing positions in case the enemy is deploying to contain us. Quan began roaring and clapping his metal gauntlets together. The sound was teeth-jarring, even through the thick helmet I was wearing. I couldn't argue with his results, however. The Marines responded as if kicked, trotting down the salt and brine crusted mountainside. They created a small avalanche of dead seabed materials, which was kicked ahead by their pounding metal boots. I joined the herd and trotted down slope, using my suit's grav power now and then. In these new heavier suits, it wasn't a good idea to fly unless it was really necessary. The armor was thicker, and therefore the mass to be moved was greater. Power consumption during flight was an issue, and I didn't know how long it would be before I was able to get a fresh charge. The atmosphere became steadily thicker as we descended, and was so full of dust and steam by the time I reached the rocky spur we were planning to call home, I couldn't see more than a hundred yards in any direction. It was as if I'd been immersed in a massive, clinging fog. This is good enough, I told Quan. We're about four thousand feet above the new sea level. That'll give the enemy a hard climb to get up to our positions. I want everyone digging in right here. Once he has a trench large enough to cover himself, each man is to keep right on digging. Every Marine is to dig enough trench space to shield three men. We're expecting more companies from above soon, and they might not have time to dig their own foxholes. There was some grumbling as Quan relayed these orders. The officers of the company we were embedded with were doing most of the grousing. They felt I was taking direct command of their unit, which I was. But I didn't lose my temper with them, as they didn't offer any direct objections. I could understand how they felt. Having brass in the middle of your team taking your decisions away wasn't fun. Digging the holes themselves was nothing like the grim chore of yesteryear. We had powerful, whining suits of armor on that did most of the work. Every movement was accentuated and exaggerated. We bent, we lifted, and we moved massive mouthfuls of loose earth with every scoop. Even if we'd been doing the job without power suits, our nanotized bodies would have found the work acceptable. Wearing what amounted to a forklift folded around your arms and legs made it positively easy. Joining the fun, I deployed two scoops, which fanned out from my gauntlets. Each of these was smart metal and about a foot across. I felt like I was pantomiming the motions as I shoved the blades into the ground and heaped up an earthen wall in no time. As we dug, we kicked up more earth until a dust cloud formed, but a breeze came up the mountain and began to blow the dust away. I could see the water shining far below us for the first time about two miles away. It was strange to think that seawater had covered this world just weeks ago. After the first hundred scoops or so, the work began to get a little more taxing. I welcomed the prickling of sweat I felt as I kept going. Sir! asked Quan, coming to stand over my growing trench. I looked up at him, feeling a trickle of sweat run down from my face. Trouble, Quan? No, sir, but I don't know why you're digging your own trench. It's good exercise, First Sergeant. I highly recommend it. Around me, the men made quiet, appreciative comments as they worked to connect their trenches to mine. I knew they liked seeing an officer dig a hole, and it was a rare sight— but I wasn't really doing it to generate goodwill or to raise morale. I'd been in space and eating air swimmers for weeks. It felt good to get in a solid workout. After staring down into my dust-filled trench for a full minute, Quan finally joined me. I guess he felt guilty, or else it looked like fun to him. He spread his hand shovels and laughed, then dug in. When we hit hard rock, we burned it, and our visors darkened so much we could hardly see. I imagine that from the bottom of the slope our activities must look like we were tearing the mountain apart. The enemy would be barely able to see us if they were looking. We'd be buried in a plume of billowing gray dust. When I was tired of digging, I contacted Fleet. This time I was looking for Marvin, not Captain Saren. Marvin, what is the story with the ring? Have you managed to gain control of it yet? All my attempts to do so have failed, Colonel Riggs, he said. The enemy might be jamming my efforts by sending in a flood of conflicting command signals. I'm getting resonance readings from the ring that seem like static, but I suspect someone is transmitting signals to it. I shook my head in disappointment. 
That blows my easy victory, I said. I'd hoped to land, then hit the machines by surprise by reversing the flow of the ring. If I could have gotten the ocean currents to suck a few trillion gallons of seawater out into another star system somewhere, the macros in the vicinity would have been destroyed or at least seriously inconvenienced. Well, I said, keep trying. If we can get the ring to suck them back where they came from, we'll pretty much win right there. We'll do, Colonel, Marvin said. But I calculate the odds of success as rather low. I glared up into the sky, wondering about Marvin and his true motivations. Too often, that robot was a mystery to me. Just keep trying, I snapped and disconnected. I turned to Quan and told him the bad news. We're going to have to do this the hard way, I said. Quan was overjoyed. No problem, sir. We'll gut every machine personally. Ha! I nodded unhappily. Quan loved nothing more than a good fight. But sometimes he didn't seem to see the big picture. The machines weren't going to go down easily. Our first surprise came when we were about halfway done with the digging. It came in the form of a series of blazing lights and ripping sounds from above us. I looked up the mountainside to see what was going on. It was hard to make out due to the visibility issues, but there was something happening up there. I connected to the command channel and tried to make sense of the chatter. The various tactical channels were buzzing. Something was happening, and it seemed to be centered on our original LZ. I didn't like the sound of that. Quan! I shouted over my local chat. Then I remembered the chain of command. Quan! Captain Marcos! Report! They quickly responded. Captain, get your men into firing positions. We're done digging for now. Quan, assist the captain, please. They began relaying the instructions, and the Marines around me started to hustle. They tromped and even flew past, stowing their smart metal hand scoops and unlimbering heavier equipment. Within a minute, they were all sitting in an assigned trench with weapons pointed watchfully in every direction. In the meantime, I'd received my first reports about what was happening upslope. The machines had broken through the crust of the mountain and attacked the second wave of freshly dropped troops as they were landing. Any invasion force is at its weakest when in the very act of making landfall. No one wants to drop directly into a fight. The macros had never been known for giving us a lot of breathing room. Quan! I roared again. I mean, Captain Marcos! Damn it! Assign a squad to distribute barrels of constructive nanites. I want every trench we have layered with a network of nanite strands. Then... Have half your men continue with the digging while the rest stand ready to engage anything that hits us. But, sir, objected the captain. She was another lump of metal to me in her suit, but the pitch of her voice was higher than most. Those nanites are on reserve for the permanent base structure. Our supply is... The supply is more than adequate to comply with my orders as given, Marcos. Get moving. She didn't say anything more to me, but a lot of shouting began on the company channel. I muted that one and tried to raise someone up at the LZ. Finally, a Captain Ling answered my questions. We're in action, sir. Not many of the machines here, but they are hard to kill. We've only encountered the small ones that dig. They're coming at us from inside the mountain. Repeat, they're burrowing, sir. Just as I thought. I want you to conduct a fighting withdrawal down slope, Captain Ling. I can't see a thing, sir. I know, but you can tell which way is down, can't you? The machines can't be hitting you very hard up there yet. I'm sure you can get out and move. I've established a makeshift fire base down here. We're waiting for you on that mountain spur below you on your maps, at an altitude of 4,000 feet. Get down here. We'll cover your retreat. Yes, sir. Every instinct urged me to call in support. Fighters, heavy beams from above, or even to advance with Captain Marco's company to meet them. But I resisted the temptation. In the chaos of a general landing, which had been hastily planned and executed at best, we all had to make do. I wanted to keep major assets like the fighters in reserve, until I knew where they could best be deployed. I didn't want to abandon the fortifications I was building, either. I knew this firebase we were in the middle of constructing would form a much-needed strong point as the invasion progressed. The troops were going to keep falling from the sky for the next day or so. As the battalions kept coming down, Captain Ling and a dozen men like him 
had to fight their own battles independently until we established a coherent front and could set up lines with the enemy to push against. One of the problems with fighting the macros was their reactions in combat. Human troops were predictable. They would typically break when a certain level of losses were taken, for example. In a situation like this one, humans usually wouldn't react quickly. When the Allied forces invaded France on D-Day, for example, the German troops were slow to react. They held back and allowed the Allies to get a critical stronghold before counterattacking. Experiencing a short state of shock was pretty normal for a human army when attacked suddenly. The macros, however, were machines. They weren't experiencing any kind of shock. They weren't going to fall back and try to figure out a safe course of action. They were going to throw themselves at us and bleed us wherever they could. They didn't really care about dying, other than seeing it as a form of mission failure. If they could win a battle by dying through self-sacrifice, they were very happy to do so. It was like fighting a nest full of gigantic, intelligent insects with bad attitudes. Looking over my maps, I contacted Captain Sarah next. She was overseeing the entire drop from space. Fleet, this is Colonel Riggs. Respond, please. It took a second, but I had the captain on the line very quickly. What is it, Colonel? Saren asked. She sounded harried. I know you have a lot going on, Captain, but I want you to change the targeted LZ. Don't send the next battalion down at the same location. There was a moment of quiet during which I heard rasping sounds. Possibly she'd taken up a microphone and switched the channel to a private line. Are you sure you want to second-guess the plan now, Colonel? Yes, I said firmly. The macros are already digging under the initial LZ. I want you to drop each remaining battalion in a random pattern at about the 8,000-foot level. Find a good shelf of rock and drop them on it. We'll establish fire bases wherever we can lower down for the men to assemble. A random pattern, she asked. That is not good procedure, Colonel. I can't condone it. Yeah, well, you're up there with the fleet. Things look a little different down here. I quickly filled her in on the lightning-fast enemy reactions to our landings. We're going to have to keep shifting our LZs, I said. They're harassing us much faster than we suspected they would. Jasmine was a stickler for details and didn't like changing plans in mid-motion. As a commander, I considered this to be a strength and a weakness at the same time, depending on whether she was right or not. But in this case, I overruled her objections and ordered her to move the LZs. What about the fighters, sir? Quan asked from behind me. I thought we were supposed to have air cover. He was standing in my trench. I wondered what he'd overheard. I had him on the command channel feed because he operated as my personal aide, Figuring he'd heard it all, I shook my head. I'm not calling down any fire support until I have something big enough for them to shoot at. So far, the enemy are just digging up out of the ground under our feet and trying to slice them off. Quan chuckled at that idea and made stomping motions with his amazingly large boots. They're going to have a hard time taking the feet off these suits, Colonel. I had to agree with him. Shortly after I disconnected from the command channel, I saw a shower of loose white dust rising up directly above us. It was clear, after a few moments of observation, that whoever was making that dust cloud was coming directly toward us. I zoomed in and saw the dark shapes of marines racing down the mountain ahead of the billowing cloud. "'Captain Marcos!' I boomed. Get a few long-range turrets set up. I want them on overwatch in case anything is chasing those men. The companies surged into action around me. They'd been busy laying out nanites in the fresh trenches. The nanites themselves were lacing together the soil, hardening it and forming polymer filaments in the dirt that were as strong as steel. Now the troops switched to pulling out and deploying our heavy weapons pods. Every drop company had three of them automated laser turrets with beam projectors that were about six feet long from tip to base. These were placed on tripods and attached to three critical elements, a generator, a brain box, and a small sensor array. Set on automatic, these units operated primarily as air cover. But they could also be switched to manual control. With a marine as a gunner, they'd been designed to serve as a heavy gun against ground targets. 
Three corporals with specialized training stepped into the gunner's slots when the pods had been put together and powered. Today, if we were going to be hit, it was going to be by ground forces. The first clue came when I saw a Marine get sucked into the dust cloud. He'd been running along steadily, kicking up a huge plume of dust behind him one second. The next second, he was gone. I attempted to connect with Captain Ling again. Ling, are you there? Report your status. You are less than one mile from my position in my estimation. Big ones, Colonel, came Ling's response. It was almost a scream. They are coming up out of the mountain under our feet. Well, then fly, man, I shouted. Fly! Gunners, if you see anything unusual, you have my permission to take a shot at it. Negative, Colonel, Captain Marco said. We can't do that. We'll be hitting Marines if we fire blindly into that dust cloud. I shook my head in frustration. I didn't argue with the captain because she was right, but it was disturbing. What could be chasing those men? It couldn't be just a few worker macros. They were no match for drop troops and power armor. It had to be something else. Chapter 17 I saw flying power suits now rising up above the dust cloud itself. Looking like tiny black and silver dolls riding a hurricane, they came at us as if they'd been thrown in our direction. Reaching the upper limits of the cloud and cruising there above it, the men were burning their power supplies at an alarming rate. These suits were highly protective and had many functional advantages over lighter gear, but long operating life wasn't one of them. I frowned and zoomed in tighter. I thought I'd seen. Yes, I was sure of it. A silvery rope-like tentacle had reached out and grabbed a marine. One second he'd been there, riding over the cloud. The next he'd been sucked back down into the dust, yanked out of sight. Ling, I called. You still there? Report. There was no response. Whoever is in command of Bravo Company 6 Battalion, please... I didn't get any farther because suddenly the dust cloud settled. What was revealed beneath it made the words die in my throat. The fleeing company had hit a stretch of exposed flat rock. With nothing much to kick up, they left the cloud behind, and I finally saw what was chasing them. A nightmare of burnished metal. The machine coming at us was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. It was big, with more bulk to it than the largest robots— it wasn't shaped like a typical macro, either. Instead of having eight legs like a steel spider, it had the shape of a horseshoe crab. Underneath was a churning mass of small legs, which I realized as it got closer were really whipping snake-like arms. The moment I saw it, I could only think of one thing. Quan thought of it, too, and he put the thought into words first. It looks like a giant, crazy version of Marvin, sir, he said. Yeah, it kind of does. From the armored back of the monster sprouted longer arms. These could stretch a hundred feet into the air. As we watched, it used these thick tentacles to deadly effect, reaching out and snatching flying marines as they tried to escape it. The unlucky troops were dragged down to the front of the machine, where they were unceremoniously shoved into the monster's maw. The opening was more of a doorway than a mouth— as there didn't seem to be any teeth or jaws. I could see inside now, and it was filled with a livid red heat that reminded me of a lava flow. I figured it had some kind of melting furnace inside, probably built to digest ores it found in the mountain. What the bloody hell is it, sir? Quan asked. Some kind of mining bot, I'd assume, I said. What matters now is that Ling's company is bringing it right to us. Get those heavy beamers firing on the carapace. It has to have a weak point. He relayed my orders, but orders weren't really necessary. The gunners could see the monster now, and they didn't need any encouragement. They knew what to do. My visor dimmed as streaks burned the air and punched through the roiling dust clouds. Two of the gunners focused on burning off whipping arms, while the third tried for a lucky hit on the thing's mouth. None of these beams seemed overly effective. Why didn't Ling just blow it up? Quan asked wonderingly. I knew he was referring to the tactical nuclear grenades many Marines had as part of their kits. Each company had been equipped with ten of them. 
It probably got in too close, I said. They couldn't get away to that quarter-mile safe zone around it before lighting a grenade. I might have done it anyway, Quan remarked, still staring at the approaching monstrosity. I bet you would have. Quan had been officially forbidden to touch heavy explosives. I'd been personally injured more than once by his negligent use of tactical grenades. All right, I shouted, engaging the company override. Every helmet in the immediate vicinity buzzed with my voice. This is Riggs. Get into your holes and flatten yourselves out. We'll burn this thing from underneath if it overruns our position. If it has a thousand legs, it probably can't operate with only five hundred left. Quan looked at me in surprise, but then quickly jumped down into a foxhole. A hundred other Marines did the same. They'd been expecting a battle, but this was more like surviving a stampede. We couldn't stop the thing. It was too close now and going too fast. Momentum alone was going to carry it down slope and directly over top of us, even if it died in the next second. What had looked bizarre and alien at a distance was absolutely terrifying up close. The sound it made, it was almost indescribable, like ten freight trains bearing down on me at once and running me over while I shivered in a hole. I'd heard descriptions of tornadoes tearing at homes while the owners huddled in the basement. This was louder than that. A moment later, the sun went out and I knew I was under it. I felt as if a battleship with legs had walked over me. I learned then that the small feet underneath weren't all that small. They were each a foot thick and twenty feet long. The entire monstrosity had to be five hundred feet across. We laid on our backs down there in our holes while dirt sifted down onto our visors, and we fired our beams up into the belly. My plans of fighting the thing from underneath quickly disintegrated. I thought maybe we could chop off those legs and disable it, but instead it was the legs that disabled us. There were so many of them. Hundreds of thick, steel, squirming legs. They were tube-shaped and moved with rippling segments. The worst part was that they came right down into our holes with us. The monster robot stepped on us with its hundreds of legs. The fantastic weight of the machine was distributed over all those supports, but it was spread unevenly. Some men were hit with a thousand pounds of downward pressure or less, which only left bright scratches on their metal casings. Others were not so lucky. Some must have been treated to ten or even a hundred tons of weight. Legs, chests, and most certainly visors were crushed. Men shrieked or died in silence, depending on the nature of their injuries. Still, my Marines were firing their weapons as best they could. They howled in pain, fright, and fury. They burned at the legs and the black wall of metal that loomed over them, cutting out the light of the white sun. Dirt sifted down over me, and I couldn't see much. I felt as if I'd buried myself in a grave of my own design. Lying there, I had time to think about how considerate I'd been to the macros. I'd ordered my entire company to dig their own graves and plant themselves at the bottom of them. My foresight would save the enemy a lot of time disposing of us later on. After an eternity that was probably less than thirty seconds in real time, the shadow lifted. Sunlight glared in my face again. I sat up but had to struggle to turn around. My right leg had been damaged. It didn't hurt, and it was still attached to my hip. But it wasn't bending. Clearly the machine had stepped on me and damaged my power suit's leg. I checked the readouts. Liquid flows indicated bleeding down around the knee. Grunting and heaving with my arms, I levered myself around to face the retreating monster, which had overrun our position and kept going down slope. I didn't have time for injuries. I had to get back into the fight. My Marines were in the same frame of mind. The survivors popped up like gophers all around me, and we sent a hail of burning fire after the creature. Within less than a minute, there was a shocking result. The machine exploded. The booming report and brilliant flash caused all of us to take cover. Seconds later, dust, shrapnel, and chunks of rock came twirling down to rain on us. Someone finally nuked it, Quan said from beside me. About time. I would have done it right off. Yeah, I said. And this time I think you would have been doing the right thing. Yeah, Quan said. 
He climbed up to the rim of the foxhole we were in. It had turned into something that more closely resembled a smoking crater. He extended a big hand down in my direction. I took it, and he helped me climb out of the hole. My right leg still wasn't operating. After going over the data, I determined it was lacerated and pinched inside the crushed armor. My power suit's right leg was about an inch thinner than it was supposed to be, but it was still attached, and the nanites were working to repair the damage. All around us, the men tended to the wounded. Some marines had to dig themselves out of their own foxholes, which had been filled in by the passing monster. Captain Ling showed up a few minutes later, coming from the north. I greeted him without enthusiasm. You could have warned us what kind of company you were bringing with you, I said. Sorry, sir. We didn't really know what we were dealing with. We crossed a wide gash in the mountain which looked artificial. We paused to investigate, but a shower of dust plumed up, obscuring everything. Before I knew what was happening, my men were running, saying some kind of monster was in the hole. It was a monster, all right. How many did you lose? I just did a head count. I've got thirty-three effectives left. I stared at him. Including the losses in my company, we're down about a hundred marines. Captain Marcos was also killed, her visor crushed by that machine. That's unacceptable. You're reduced in rank to second lieutenant. Get your most senior platoon leader and change places with him. Ling looked shocked. He dropped his eyes and stared at my boots. Yes, sir, but, sir, my senior lieutenant is dead. Do you have any lieutenants left? He finally located one, a short African-American man with a gravelly voice and a cocky look on his face. He had narrowed, squinting eyes and a bad attitude. I liked him immediately. Lieutenant Gaines, I said upon meeting him. Congratulations. I'm promoting you to captain. You're in charge of this new melded company. I've chosen you because Captain Marcos is dead and I've lost confidence in Ling. I'm folding both units into one as of now. He looked at me with quick eyes. He didn't appear eager, but he didn't look worried either. What about the other lieutenants in Ling's company? He asked. I shook my head. They'll serve under you. They're fine men, but they didn't just ride down this mountain on the back of a battleship-sized machine and survive. You did. I like survival traits. If you keep staying alive, you'll get promoted again. He nodded and flashed me a hint of a smile. I'm going to hold you to that deal, sir. I chuckled and turned back to rebuilding the fire base. The survivors were almost all injured in some way, but they were still game. I sat down with my newly minted captain and had a little talk with him while a medical bot worked on my leg. Mostly it ripped off my power suit's leg and hammered it back into shape. Exposed, my flesh felt odd and prickly. I knew that the nanites were at work in my bloodstream— having a race with the microbials that also called my body home to see who could repair my flesh the fastest. It was strange having two colonies of microscopic creatures working to heal you at once. It was also itchy. Fortunately, the atmosphere of Yale was breathable for humans. The nitrogen was a bit high, but not toxic. I could smell the air that drifted up from the opening at the suit's hip socket to my helmet. Every planet has a smell— and I had to say, this one wasn't a good smell. It reminded me of a beach covered in dead fish. I guess that was to be expected. The oceans had been drained and heated. Lots of things had died here lately, and they hadn't finished decaying yet. Colonel, Gaines asked me, looking around with his helmet off. Are we going to stay in this shithole for long? I looked him in the eye. I don't think that's the question you really want to ask. What you want to know is what every Marine in this unit wants to know. Why are we here? Captain Gaines nodded. Well, we're here because there were about a trillion intelligent biotic beings on this world a month ago, and the macros have already killed half of them. The rest were about to die when we arrived. I think we've done pretty well already. Looking over the casualties so far, we've lost about one human for every million crustaceans we saved by coming here. Sounds like a good deal, Kane said. But the crustaceans are still technically the enemy. I shook my head. I don't think so. 
They could have hit us when we landed, but they didn't. They're cooperating with us by staying out of it. By the end of this battle, I expect to see human and crustacean marines fighting side by side. That's why we're really here, to gain another powerful ally against the machines. Captain Gaines appeared to think about it. I could tell he wasn't fully convinced, but at least he had listened. The truth was that few humans liked the lobsters. If they all died, not too many of us would cry about it. They were irritating when you talked to them, and even worse, when you fought with them. They were tricky, arrogant, and very difficult to convince of anything that wasn't their idea to begin with. But I hadn't given up on them yet. I couldn't afford to. They were just too damned many of the bastards. I needed their numbers to swell my ranks against the machines. There's something else I'd like to talk to you about. Gaines said. It's about that machine. It wasn't a normal macro design. You noticed that, didn't you? How could I not? It wasn't a pure macro, as I understand these things. It had those arms. That's nanotech, isn't it? Yeah, I said. I know what you're getting at. And I've been thinking about it, too. I don't like the implications. If the macros have begun to weave the nanotechnology into their systems designs, well, that removes one of our key strategic advantages. That thing was some kind of hybrid. It reminded me of that robot friend of yours. What's his name? Marvin, I said. Yes, there was a resemblance. Gaines gave me a hard stare. He hasn't been in touch with the macros, has he, sir? He asked. This Marvin bot of yours? You don't think he's given them ideas? Do you have any evidence on which to base that accusation, Captain? Sorry if you don't want to hear that, Colonel. I thought about it, and his question made too much sense. He had to ask it. The thing had looked like a gigantic version of Marvin, after all. Where had the macros gotten the idea to build such a thing? Had they examined Marvin from afar and copied him? I shook my head slowly. Don't be sorry, Captain, I said. I want you to keep giving me ideas like that whenever you have one. Sure thing. We had some coffee and talked about less disturbing things for a few minutes, such as gun emplacements, patrol schedules, and enemy sightings. All the while we spoke, however, my mind was in a different place. How had the macros gotten the idea to use nanotech? Where had they found the factories to make the nanites in the first place? The macro factories couldn't do such fine work. Distracted, I went over recent events in my mind carefully. Marvin had been in contact with the macros as a translator on many occasions. He'd also transmitted codes through the ring in an attempt to shut it off, but he had ended up reversing it, which had allowed the macros to invade. Had that been an actual accident? I couldn't be a hundred percent sure. It would be easy enough to assume that the macros had observed us and adapted to our behavior patterns. We were now using both nano and macro factories and producing equipment that combined both technologies. But the macros, in my experience, had never been so adaptable that they could begin using tech they were unfamiliar with. They almost had to be reprogrammed to go in an entirely new direction. But how had the idea originated? Who had given it to them? I just didn't know, and not knowing disturbed me. Over the next hour, our base swelled as four more companies arrived. Upslope, more and more troops kept dropping in. There were eight fire bases like mine now scattered over the mountainous island. The enemy had yet to put in a major appearance, but I expected a counterpunch at any moment. When the strike came... It wasn't a surprise. Often the macros behaved in a predictable fashion. But they did hurt us. Missile, sir, Captain Gaines shouted in my headset. I didn't bother to ask for confirmation, range, or numbers. The enemy concentrations were only twenty miles distant, and their missiles flew like ICBMs. We didn't have much time to react. I tapped into the general override for the entire mission. Marines, this is Colonel Riggs. We have incoming enemy missiles. Activate all defensive systems. Take immediate cover anywhere you can. I switched over to operational command and contacted Captain Sarin. Jasmine, this is it. They're making their first play. 
Send down your fighter wing on CAP to give us air cover. Already done, Colonel, she responded crisply. They're on the way down. They'll reach effective range in ninety-five seconds. I've scrambled my second wing as well. Will you require more coverage? I didn't know enough yet to answer her. I didn't even know if two minutes would be quick enough. Part of me wanted to second-guess myself to chide myself for not having brought the fighter cover down earlier. I hadn't done it because we couldn't be sure how this attack was going to play out. The machines might have come at us with a massive ground attack. In that case, the fighters were not going to be as effective as ground troops. Because the macros had shields, they were hard targets for low-wattage lasers on a fighter ship. The tiny craft couldn't penetrate the shields, and they couldn't fly into them either as the shields would turn rigid and destroy something moving as fast as a fighter. I hadn't wanted to waste my fighters, so I'd held them in reserve. Now it was turning out that I needed them. Each tiny ship possessed a gun that could be fired manually or in an automatic mode when slaved to a brain box. When full auto was selected, each fighter became a small flying point-defense laser turret— it was harder to hit something when both the platform and the target were moving, so they usually sat at altitude and hovered. That's the mission I had in mind for them today. The pilots wouldn't like it much, as there wasn't much glory in sitting at a hundred thousand feet watching your ship shoot at missiles, but that was just too bad. Jasmine, I said, you've got better data up there and a more stable situation. You make the call. What are we facing? I've got about four hundred incoming birds, sir. They've just left the sea and are inbound for your beachhead. ETA four minutes. Four hundred? I asked, disheartened. Are they nuclear or conventional? Unknown. I grimaced and thought hard for a second. This didn't look good. Our fighter wings contained four squadrons of twelve fighters each. We hadn't bothered with dividing them into groups. The carrier I'd brought with us was capable of transporting two fighter wings, about a hundred ships in all. Right now, I was pretty sure that wasn't going to be enough guns. Only forty-eight fighters would be in range to provide us defensive fire, even combined with the small turrets our companies were carrying with them. There just wasn't enough guns to stop all those missiles. Some were going to make it through. Are you there, Colonel? Saren asked. I'm here. I'm just... Regretting coming to save the crustaceans about now. I understand, sir. More alarming thoughts piled on top of my first ones. I realized that if the enemy hit us hard enough right now, they could break our invasion before it really got started. In fact, the more I thought about it, the more I believed that was exactly what they were attempting to do. Captain Saren, contact your fighters. Move them to a higher elevation. Place them at maximum range to hit those missiles effectively. They can't possibly shoot them all down from that high, sir. I know that, but I believe these weapons are nukes. Or at least a large number of them are. That's why the macros have more or less sat quietly while we unloaded all our troops. They wanted us all down and set up as sitting ducks. Now they'll unload on us in one hard, smashing blow. Saren was quiet for a long second. When she spoke again, there was dread in her voice. I knew she could see my logic and agreed with me. What are your orders, Colonel? Let's try what we did in the past. Intercept their missiles with a volley of our own. Should I use nuclear warheads? Of course, I said. How many should I launch? All of them. Plotting. The mission is in the computer, sir. The birds will fly shortly. Flight time to intercept range. Forty seconds. Launching. Now. There were a million things either of us could have said in this horrible moment, but we both knew there just wasn't time to talk things over. I'd half expected her to point out, for example, that I'd made it our policy not to use nukes on Yale for environmental concerns. But that just didn't matter anymore. This had become a matter of survival. We had to operate on the worst-case basis. We had to assume the incoming missiles were nuclear, not conventional. To do otherwise might be committing suicide. I knew that if we were wrong, the enemy would have scored a coup. We were expending all our nuclear missiles blowing up the macro barrage. Quite possibly we were doing nothing more than creating a very large radioactive cloud for nothing. But there wasn't time to debate. There wasn't even time to second-guess. 
We had to assume this was doomsday, because if it was and we didn't play it right, my little invasion force wasn't going to exist five minutes from now. The birds are reaching their target altitudes, Jasmine said in my helmet. Darken your visor, sir. We're ready. Good luck, Kyle, she said quietly. This was a big breach of protocol for Captain Saren. When under battle conditions, she rarely used my first name. I figured she believed my situation could well be terminal. I had to agree with her. Thank you, Jasmine, I said. If this goes badly, you'll be in command of the task force. Miklos will be in overall command of Star Force. Rigs out. I felt like I'd just written my own epitaph. Jasmine knew what I meant. If I die in the next few minutes, take over. It had been a hard thing to say, but what followed over the next two minutes was worse. Around me, the men had all taken cover. The signal to darken visors had gone out and every faceplate was jet black. We all hunkered down, waiting for doom. Most of the men didn't know what was about to hit us. A few did. All of them stayed low and quiet. It's a hard thing waiting in an alien hole for hundreds of missiles to land on top of you. I knew every breath was quite possibly my last. It was frustrating not being able to do anything about my own fate. I'd much preferred facing down that bizarre mining macro, for example, to this. At least then I'd had something to shoot at. Taking action makes a man fear death less. Sitting in a hole as the seconds ticked by, it was one of the hardest things I'd ever had to do. Fortunately, I didn't have to wait long. The flashes began out over the eastern horizon. They were pretty at first, flaring greenish-white through our blacked-out visors. Fantastic power was being released out there. I didn't have a tactical table handy to figure out how many we'd stopped or how many were still coming. I couldn't see the fighters. They were too high up. Hanging in the upper atmosphere, I knew they were stabbing down at the surviving missiles with hot, invisible beams of light, but I couldn't see any of that either. In the last seconds, I did see contrails. I knew that was a very bad sign. Incoming trails could only mean one thing. Some of the enemy missiles had made it through. A moment later, the impacts began. They were nuclear. There were no mushroom clouds yet. Those would rise up later. In the first moments after a nuclear explosion, there's nothing but a blooming sphere of heat, light, and a sound that's beyond all sounds. These effects combined into what we call a shock wave, one of which rolled over my unnamed firebase. Because my visor was the weakest part of my armor, I'd rolled over and hugged the dirt face down, when the shock wave hit, it felt as if something huge had jumped on my back, and I lost consciousness. Chapter 18 I was still breathing. At first I wasn't entirely sure about that, but after a few hitching gasps I knew it was true. I was still alive, for now. Groaning, I tried to roll over. It didn't happen. My suit seemed to be dead. I wasn't sure what was wrong, but it felt like about two thousand pounds of dead weight. I realized I was having trouble breathing. The air mix in my suit. I looked for the readouts, but of course there was nothing. The HUD was dark. My first thought was that the generator on my back had gone out. Possibly it had been damaged by whatever had landed on my back. I struggled to get up. I'm a powerful man. Quite possibly I'm the most powerful man physically that's ever lived. I've undergone treatments that the rest of my men hadn't. Microbial baths had been piled atop of the changes the nanites had made, and had scarred my guts and muscles until they couldn't be toughened or improved any further. My conclusion was that I should have been able to move in my power suit even if it had gone dead, like power steering in a car. A man could still wrestle with the wheel even if the hydraulics failed. I strained and grunted, and I felt myself shift, but not by much. I couldn't get a breath. That was the problem. I was suffocating, and the suit that was supposed to protect me was now killing me. 
I fought to think clearly. Everything hurt. My head was buzzing, and thinking was harder than it should be. Oxygen deprivation. That had to be a factor. A growing certainty came over me. I was going to die right here, face down in this dusty hole. I wondered if I'd rate a tombstone on this spot someday. I thought about what the inscription might say. Here lies Colonel Kyle Riggs of the infamous Riggs Pigs. He dug his own grave, laid down in it, and buried himself for the convenience of the machines. Angrily, I thrashed about, trying to move my limbs in any possible direction. There did seem to be some lateral range of movement to my left arm. I could swing my gauntlet back and forth, working the elbow joint. I found also that I was able to turn my head. Getting an idea, I turned my head to the left, pushed away my fist as far as it would go, then smashed it into my faceplate. I did it with a little too much force, as it turned out. My nose was pulped. But the visor did break, and dusty, smoke-laden air rolled in. It wasn't good air, but there was some oxygen in it. I coughed and wheezed. After a few seconds, I felt better. Star Force Marines are tougher than normal humans. We'd been toughened further over the years. I recalled reading that the aboriginal peoples of the past were much hardier folk than the soft modern humans who sat all day at their computer stations. We Marines had changed all that. We were the ones in the record books now. I breathed in dusty, radioactive soot, and I did so greedily. My lungs burned as the air was hot. I had to guess the ambient temperature was around 150 degrees Fahrenheit. It was hot enough to kill a normal man, but for someone who'd once rebuilt himself to go down into the atmosphere of a gas giant, it wasn't all that bad. Feeling stronger, I heaved. The thing on my back shifted and swayed. I knew now that it wasn't a ton of earth or a huge rock. I couldn't be buried if I was getting air in through my visor. Roaring and straining, I managed to get to my knees. Finally, the fantastic weight on my back rolled away. Then I saw what had pinned me down. It was Quan. I checked his suit, and it was dead as well. I punched out his visor and reached inside. Blood trickled from his face. For a few long seconds, I figured he was gone. I've known Quan for years, and there'd never been a more faithful, loyal person in my life. I didn't want to lose him. I should have gotten up and called for a corpsman, but I didn't. I knew I had better things to do. I had an army to look after and a war to fight, but instead, I spent the next few precious minutes trying to save Quan. He'd been without oxygen for a considerable length of time. Normally, four minutes resulted in brain death for a human being. But in the case of a Star Force Marine, that could be extended considerably. Even after our bodies shut down, the nanites in us didn't. They had programs to maintain, and could even keep blood trickling when the heart stopped pumping. In emergencies, they could go to the lungs, gather oxygen, and distribute it to critical centers of the body. These extreme measures wouldn't keep you alive forever, but they might double the time a man had before suffocating. After working on him with a first aid kit and a fresh nanite medical injection over the heart, I was able to get a pulse. He didn't wake up, but he was alive. I slumped back in my incredibly heavy suit, gasping for air myself. A figure appeared at the top of my dusty hole and looked down at me. You're alive, Colonel asked Captain Gaines. It would appear so, I mumbled. Here's some water. He handed down a bottle, and I sucked on it, spat out a gray mass, and sucked on it some more. You survived again, Gaines, I said when some of the dust had cleared from my throat. Yes, sir. If you get off this rock in one piece, I'm going to make you a major. I'm going to remember that, sir. Just about then, Quan sneezed. It was a big sneeze, the kind only a big man can make. A fine, wet mist rose up from his smashed visor. The mist was part blood and part snot. I grimaced. It reminded me of a whale clearing its blowhole. You awake, Quan? No, sir, he said. I'm still dreaming. I nodded. I knew exactly how he felt. Colonel, Gaines said. With your permission, 
I'm going to check on the rest of my company. Do it. I'll join you soon. Are communications up with fleet? Negative, sir. The blast that hit us was laced with an EMP. I think that's what killed our suit functions. I nodded. Bastard machines. They know how to hurt us. Let me know when you have communications up again. Will do, sir, he said. Then he trudged away. I can feel the radiation, Quan complained. He had yet to move. He just laid there on his back like a beached whale. I hate that feeling. It makes my teeth ache. Yeah, I said. I recall reading about the Russian troops who were tasked with cleaning up the mess after the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl exploded. They called them human robots. Quan's face stirred and his eyes looked at me. He hadn't bothered to sit up yet. Didn't they have real robots? He asked. Yeah, they had some, but it was 1986 and they didn't have good ones. Strangely, delicate electronics are more vulnerable to radiation than biological systems, such as humans. The real robots all broke down. What happened to the men? Quan asked. I could see the whites of his eyes in his helmet. He stared up at me, looking at me from an odd angle. I figured this was easier for him than turning his head. Most of them lived, surprisingly. They had lots of problems, of course, and they tasted metal in their mouths for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I think I've got that right now. I nodded. Can you get up yet? No, sir. That's going to take a while. I knelt and frowned down at him. What's wrong? I'm pretty sure my neck is broken. I'm paralyzed. Sorry about that, Colonel. It's all right. Over the next half hour, we were in an emergency recover mode. No follow-up assaults came from the seas or the macros that we knew were crawling all over the other islands in the region. I prepared to inject Quan with a pasty mixture of nanites and microbial sauce, a medical concoction we used for serious injuries. The package said bone injury on the side, so I hoped it could handle cracked vertebrae. I was more worried about his spinal cord damage, but couldn't find anything that referenced that. The needle on the syringe was about six inches long and as thick around as a ballpoint pen. Quan looked at it, his eyes rolling in concern. I'm not going to feel that, right? He said hopefully. I mean, I can't feel my arms or legs. Sure. I lied and jabbed him in the neck with the needle. The bulb at the end of the syringe was smart metal. It sensed it was go time and started pumping beige fluids into his flesh. Quan squinched up his eyes and made a hissing sound. I hate needles! I patted his helmet and pulled the dripping needle out of his neck. You'll be fine. In an hour. I left him there, flat on his back in the foxhole. I figured it was the safest spot available at the moment. Next, I sought out Captain Gaines. He'd been taking in reports, and we went over some numbers together, which we reported back up to Captain Saren. She was in a better position to see the entire battlefield situation, so I put her in charge of ops, with guiding suggestions from me. We lost about 1,100 men due to missile strikes, she said. Added to those lost in the initial drop and various mishaps, such as the mining machine, that totals up to about 15% of your total force, Colonel. Not bad, I announced. Not bad at all. I looked around and was mildly surprised when I realized my command staff didn't share my enthusiasm. They weren't wreathed in smiles. They obviously didn't agree with my assessment. I tried not to notice their sour moods, but after a few seconds I grew angry with them. Did you people come here not expecting to take serious losses? I demanded. We just hot-dropped on an uncharted planet. That takes huge balls, and so far I figure we've been lucky. Captain Gaines lifted his hand. I didn't expect heavy losses so early, sir. I glared around at the rest. Majors and captains shifted uncomfortably. Some appeared about to speak up, but thought better of it and remained silent. Some of you might be under the impression we dropped too close to the enemy lines, but we had no choice. 
We're less than ten miles from the enemy concentrations because we couldn't drop at a safer distance. These islands are the only scraps of available land. But so many lost, Captain Gaines began. Back in World War II, I said, interrupting him, the Americans lost 2,400 Marines on Omaha Beach in a few hours. During the invasion of Okinawa, over 150,000 died on both sides. The lesson here is that beachheads are often hard to establish. Quit whining. No one was actually whining, but they still managed to look glum. I turned away from them and continued planning the next stage of the assault. I gathered a few nearby officers and connected the rest up via their HUDs. Captain Sarin was there in a virtual sense, as were a number of others. Now it's time to bring down the second wave. I want those three battalions water dropped off the beach here, I said, working a thin, flexible computer screen that looked pretty much like a piece of shelving paper. The sheet was impregnated with photoreactive nanites that knew their jobs well. Activated by my touch, they collected data from networks that reached all the way up to the ships in orbit. So soon, sir. Captain Gaines asked. I glanced at him in surprise. He was a junior officer in the extreme, having been a lieutenant earlier in the day. I was somewhat taken aback to be second-guessed by a man who barely deserved to be at this meeting. Yes? Why not? They just hit us hard. They're probably preparing their follow-up. If we land in the middle of a second missile barrage, we'll take high losses again. Presumption, Captain, I said. Incorrect assessment. The enemy is well known to me. In their mechanical brains, they marked that last attack down as a failure. They expended a great deal of missiles hoping to take us out early. They lost a lot of ordnance and only killed 15% of our overall ground force. To them, that's a failure. Gaines shrugged. So why not do it again? Because they don't like to repeat the same mistake twice in a row— They'll adjust their plans and do something else. That's pretty typical for the machines. They like to hit hard, but they don't hit hard the same way unless it worked the first time. Gaines nodded. If you say so, sir. I stared at him flatly for a second. I just did say it. What we need to do now is get all our forces down out of space onto the ground where they can do some good. Gaines raised his hand again. I felt a surge of irritation, but suppressed it. Due to the virtual conference set up, most of the staffers were listening in. They were staying quiet while this man was interrupting my presentation of the plan with regularity. I could tell he was green and had been fooled by the fact only a few of us were standing here at the dirt together. He was behaving as if it was just he and I on a hill having a chat. Reluctantly, I recognized Gaines with a nod. I'm assuming we'll now focus on digging in and preparing for the next assault, right, Colonel? He asked. Absolutely not, I said. We're going to attack. That's how we'll cover the water drop and make sure they make it up onto the beaches, by giving the macro something else to think about. Gaines's mouth was open, but there wasn't any sound coming out. I kind of liked him that way. For the first time, I saw a new look in his eyes. It wasn't fear, exactly. I would describe it as... Extreme alarm. Are we ready for that, sir? He asked finally. No, of course not. Most military commanders never feel they're entirely ready to attack. But we're going to do it anyway. We will throw the enemy off and grab the initiative. If they're worried about us coming at them, they can't plot our deaths so easily. I don't think that's a good idea, sir. I'd had enough by now. Look, Gaines... I've cut you some slack because you're new to operational command. Let me put it to you this way. Should I be losing confidence in you? Do you feel unfit for the duties assigned? No, sir, he said quickly. All right, then, shut the hell up. We're all Star Force Marines, and you have the particular misfortune of being directly associated with Riggs' pigs, meaning whatever unit I'm marching with. My pigs, whoever they are, aren't known for crouching in holes on mountaintops waiting for enemy assaults. You can read the wiki on that one. Gaines just nodded. I figured he was going to keep quiet for a while, so I turned my attention to the rest. I want to hear any objections the rest of you are bottling up. I want to hear them right now. 
Perhaps it was my tone of voice, which was gruff and angry, but no one spoke up. I showed them their positions, gave them an hour to get their men back on their feet, and broke up the meeting. A minute or two later, my comm light was blinking. It was Jasmine Saren. Yes, Captain, what is it? Sir, I wanted to discuss the battle plans with you. I just finished rolling up the damned map. Did you think of something else? Well, no, sir. I wanted to give you my input concerning the morale of the staff. It's low, sir. Yeah, people are always deflated when their team loses one. I'm trying to give them a win now so they can feel good about themselves again. That's what I am, you know, a glorified grief counselor. She was quiet for a moment. I could tell she didn't like my sarcasm. Suddenly I felt a touch of remorse. I liked Jasmine, and I didn't want her to doubt me. Is something wrong, sir? She asked. I don't know, I said, sighing. I checked to make sure the channel was a private one. I didn't want to accidentally broadcast even a single second of self-doubt. Just between you and me, I began. Every time I have dealings with the Thor system, with the lobsters, I end up feeling like I've been duped somehow. I've felt like a puppet since we came out here. At this moment, the crustaceans are hiding in their underwater holes, and by some voodoo, they've gotten us to fight battles for them. They didn't even give us a guarantee of an alliance when this is all over. These people have suffered grievous losses, she said. Yeah, that's about the only thing that allows me to tolerate them. You've allowed them to get away with this because you want them to join us so badly. Perhaps you could contact them and demand commitment. I've thought about that, but rejected the idea. I'll do it after I show them some victories. They won't respect anything less. That's a big part of my frustration. So far, we're not looking like big winners on Yale. That means we have no leverage with the crustaceans. After we broke off the conversation, I returned to the foxhole with Quan. I sagged down into it and slumped back to rest. My helmet had repaired itself and was functioning normally, and I was able to set an alarm to wake me up ten minutes before go time. Soon, Quan and I were both snoring. Chapter 19 when my alarm went off, it was a gentle beeping sound. This soon rose and rose to a shriek. I woke up, slapping at my helmet. This did nothing, of course, as the controls were all inside the helmet. The suit detected that my eyes were open, however, and canceled the alarm. Sourly, I struggled to my feet. I almost fell over Quan as I checked on him. It was funny how tired a good bombing could make a man once you were used to them. When I got into battle mode, I tended to shut down for sleep whenever there was a lull in the fighting. Quan's eyes snapped open as I regarded him. You're ugly, he said. I snorted. Same to you, big man. Are you okay? Can you move, First Sergeant? Experimentally, he rocked his head from side to side. Feels a little crunchy in my neck area. Yeah, that's the dead microbials. They'll drain out of you over the next few days. Quan heaved and managed to sit up. I reached out a hand, but he pushed me away. No, sir, he said. Let me do it. He climbed to his feet and swayed. How old are you, Quan? I asked him. I don't know, sir, he said. I mean, I'm not sure right now. I guess I'm about thirty. Haven't thought about that in a long time. Dates don't mean much when the sun is crazy in the sky. Sometimes there's no sun at all. Yeah, I know what you mean. We've been on so many worlds, I don't think about little stuff like birthdays anymore, but I think I'm forty. We should throw you a birthday party. I'll find some black candle somewhere. I laughed. I clapped him on the back, and he winced. Sorry, I said. Still tender back there? I'll be fine. I knew Quan was worried he'd be left out of the action to come if I thought he was too injured to fight. He obviously was, but I knew he hated to miss a fight against the machines. I figured it would probably be another hour or two before we made contact with the enemy, 
That was plenty of time for a nanotized marine with a fresh batch of juice in his blood to recover. Hell, an hour ago he'd been crippled. Okay, then, I said. Let's march. Quan put on his best show, beating his gauntlets together and bellowing for people to move. I could hear a twinge of pain and weakness in his voice, but I doubted anyone else caught it. Even while half dead, Quan was more of a Marine than most of them. Our battalion gathered itself and moved in loosely grouped companies downslope. The machines were concentrated around the beaches in most cases. There were no domed factories on this big island, but then there weren't as many machines per square mile as there were on the other scraps of land. That was one of the reasons I'd landed here. Okay, I said over command chat. You all know the plan. Move in battalion strength groups down from the mountains to the nearest beach and begin to sweep. Destroy every gathering machine you find. We'll clear this island quickly, then identify our next objective. I hadn't let my staff in on it yet, but if this mop-up patrol went well, I planned to cross the sea to the nearest island with a macro factory on it. With luck, we'd capture it. In that case, we could subjugate the factory and command it to output the supplies we needed. Without luck, it would be destroyed by our assault or self-destruct. Whatever happened, the invaders would be significantly weakened. At least that was the plan. Lightning attacks. Shock the enemy lines and dig deeply into them before they could react fully. No matter what, keep moving. That was my plan, and I was sticking to it. Within an hour, my battalion, under strength as it was, had destroyed hundreds of the gathering machines. These resembled metal grasshoppers about the size of a luxury sedan. They were easy to kill as long as they didn't mass up or arm themselves. The ones we found went down fast to laser fire, and we continued on. On the beach, we met up with a dredger. It was my first, and it was big. It rolled up out of the water to greet us. I was reminded of old Japanese monster movies I'd seen as a kid. The thing was impossibly large. Flashing metal cylinders with grinding teeth rose up, dripping seawater. These resembled the blades of lawnmowers. It came toward us, and I knew a moment of concern— those blades could slice through rock and sand with ease. Surely they could sever a man in half, power suit or no. Fortunately, the giant was slow and relatively easy to disable. The control cables were exposed, and we burned them away at every opportunity. About when it reached the sandy beach, it collapsed with a tremendous howl of twisting metal. It thrashed for a while, until it gave up and died. Some of my men cheered and stood on the big blades. I didn't join them. Good job, Marines. Let's keep marching. Darkness finally fell over the world about an hour later. It was what we would soon come to call Second Night on Yale. The moon had two kinds of night. The first type occurred when the spinning planet turned away from the sun. That was a natural enough pattern. The rotation period of the world was about ninety hours long— so it took quite a while for a full day-night cycle to occur. Rotation didn't cause the only kind of nightfall, however. What we experienced was the other kind of night, which happened when Yale passed into the shadow of the gas giant it orbited. These second nights were shorter and occurred more abruptly. Really, it wasn't night at all, it was an extended eclipse. From the surface of Yale, however, it was hard to tell the difference— other than the fact that the darkness came within a ten-minute span. Once you were in the gas giant's shadow, the sky was as black as it had ever been back on Earth. I'm not sure if the machines had waited for a second night to hit us or not. Maybe they'd calculated that we would be disoriented by the sudden shift from light to dark, or that we'd have trouble seeing in the starlight. Fully equipped, a Star Force Marine had no such difficulties. Our visors compensated for any level of light, whether it was bright or dark. Whatever their reasons were, they hit us about eighteen minutes after darkness had enclosed my men in its chilling shroud. I'd almost realized my goal of securing this entire island. In about an hour, I'd planned to announce the island was clear, and that it was time to glide our power-suited butts a few miles over the waves to the next one in the chain. They didn't let me have that much time. We were marching on the shoreline, making good time, when the attack began. 
It started with a rush of missiles. It was a light barrage, really, and localized on my battalion. Fortunately, we had eyes in the sky. Saren's ships were able to give us nearly three minutes' warning. Colonel, Captain Saren said, I'm registering a large concentration of machines off the coast, coming in your direction. Big or small, I demanded, halting my march. Quan stopped beside me. A dozen marines streamed past, weapons in hand. They were chatting and oblivious. Big ones, she said. Big enough to have shields, anyway. Thank you, Captain, I said, switching to the battalion-level channel. Stop the chatter, please. This is Colonel Riggs. I want everyone in this unit to take cover and— That was as far as I got. When the first machine rolled up out of the sea, I thought to myself that Saren had cut it rather finely. We barely had time to react before it charged us. Fortunately, the water slowed the machine just as it would a charging man. The dome of force that covered its back shimmered where it touched the waves, releasing little bright flashes of discharged power. The command channel became a cacophony of sound as people sounded the alarm. I switched to company level and heard the newly minted Captain Gaines giving his unit orders. They were good ones, so I kept my mouth shut. We've got to get under that shield as fast as possible, he said. Hold your fire until you get inside that dome. You'll just be wasting energy. Ignore Riggs' order to take cover. Fly out there and attack it. I nodded inside my helmet. He was making the right move. I thought we were going to have more time, but they were on us already. I'd have to ask Jasmine about that later. Maybe fleet sensors needed some calibration. Behind the first machine, another dozen monsters were surfacing now. Gaines's company took flight as a group and charged out over the water. Quan and I went with them in the middle of the pack. Our foot-wide steel boots skimmed the waves. Maybe the machine deduced our intentions, or maybe not. In any case, it slowed and backpedaled, bringing its big beams down to bear. Twin lasers lanced out. Independently targeted, the heavy beams cut down two charging marines in about a second— then the projector swiveled, locked, and fired again. I was flying with the rest of the company. We were charging at full speed until the last moment, then slowing to allow entry. We had to slip under the shields at a walking pace. We had to get in close, under that machine, under its dome. Once inside, the shield dome would protect us, not the macro itself. Being cut down by one machine was bad enough. But if all of them could fire at us at once— We'd be shredded in minutes. The dome would prevent the macro's fellows from helping out. We pressed close, and no one else died before we pressed into the shield dome and forced our way inside. Macro shields were triggered by energy emissions and by any physical mass moving at high velocity. A laser beam or a bullet couldn't push through. But a marching man could. This weakness in their design was precisely why we'd invented the marine force in the first place. Once inside the macro's dome, of course, it wasn't any kind of picnic. There were thrashing legs a hundred feet high, moving with violent speed and unstoppable power. It was like dodging massive, sweeping tree trunks made of steel. These macros, like their brothers I'd fought so long ago, had anti-personnel turrets underneath— they were independently operated by the machine and stitched us with laser fire. Fortunately, our armor came into play here. The enemy showered us with glittering sparks of light, but every hit wasn't deadly. The power armor was gouged and scored when struck, but didn't rupture unless a single target was hit with a steady pounding for several seconds. Similarly, our weaponry was superior to what it had been in the old days. A single Marine was able to destroy an anti-personnel turret with less than a focused second of beam time. The turrets popped like light bulbs. In less than a minute, we destroyed them all and only lost three more men, two of them having been knocked flat by the thrashing legs. I figured we could probably revive them if we had time. Next, we cut down its legs and burned our way into the CPU. Ten seconds later, the machine sagged down in death and the company cheered. I wasn't happy, however. Gaines, I said. You still here? Yes, sir, he shouted back. 
obviously overjoyed to have survived in my presence for nearly a full day in a war zone. Congratulations, I said. Good work on the macro, too. But I want to change up our tactics for the next one. Already we were coasting toward the next macro in line. This one was behaving in the way the last one did, backing up like an elephant being charged by metal mice. Why? Gaines asked. That was a textbook kill, sir. I rolled my eyes briefly and urged myself to be patient. I know, I said. I wrote the textbook. Check your power gauge, Gaines. Ah, sixty-four percent. Yeah, I said. We just expended about ten percent of our charge killing a single machine. Have you counted how many machines we have to kill? Gaines paused. We're going to run out of power before we get through them all. Power or manpower? Exactly. The trouble is, our method works, but it takes too long. We're forced to use the grav lifters to keep these heavy suits above the water surface, and the whole maneuver is taking too much power. Point squad has reached the next hostel. What are your orders, Colonel? Tell them to ignore the anti-personnel turrets and legs. Just burn through the CPUs and kill it as fast as you can. It will go crazy, sir. We're supposed to just take all the incoming fire? Relay the order, or I'm hitting the override. Gaines did as I told him. The Marines were stunned. They'd all practiced our classic kill approach to this kind of enemy before, and they'd just seen it work as advertised. Changing it up didn't make much sense to them, but they were Marines, and Marines followed orders and got the job done. The next machine went down in half the time it took to knock out the first one, and we only lost a single man. His power suit sank to the bottom of the sea and laid there, inert and spread eagle. Quan, I'm getting life readings from that fallen Marine. Go get him and drag him back to the beach. Stay on the bottom so that the enemy machines can't target you. Oh, sir... I'm fine to fight. You have your orders first, Sergeant. Yes, Colonel. Quan dove away from me toward the sandy bottom. I felt better now that he was out of the battle. He'd been reacting slowly for the last several minutes. It was only a matter of time until one of the machines caught him, and then it would take more than an injection of nanites to put him together again. By this time, my company had destroyed three of the machines. We only had three full platoons left— so I made another refinement to our tactics. We're going to split up on these next targets. We're running into each other as it is, and the machines are going to get smart soon and change their own tactics or retreat. I want to take them all out. One platoon each will attack the three closest machines. Not even Gaines objected. The next kills went faster than before. We were down to 30% power, but we were getting the moves down. As far as I knew, Quan and I were the only ones out of the entire company who'd ever had the pleasure of fighting under the legs of a steel behemoth. I knew the improvement wasn't due only to my improved tactics. It was also the men themselves. They were learning fast. The next machine went down, and then another. I was breathing hard, and sweat poured down my back. Seawater had gotten into my left boot somehow and was sloshing all the way up to my hip joint. I suspected I had a burn through there as my left thigh was numb. I was trying to ignore it, even though the added weight was making my entire left side sag and list as I cruised over the waves. I checked my gauge as the macro did its death roll. We hadn't lost a single man. Seventeen percent left in the juice box. Marines, I said over company chat. I want you to know I'm proud of you all this day. None I've served with could do better. After these next few fights, we're going to start running out of power. If you get down to five percent, I want you to let yourself sink to the bottom, then escape by walking in any direction you can. Your generators will recharge your armor in time if you don't push it. Sir. Gaines spoke up, interrupting me. What is it now, Captain? Sir. All the machines appear to have been knocked out. I looked around, swiveling my helmet and scanning the night. The inky black ocean was empty. A few steaming wrecks bubbled here and there, emitting internal light as they arced and sizzled. But there were no macros left standing. Oh, I said and then laughed. I guess I'm surprised we're still alive. 
Ha! <laughs> well done, Marines. They cheered tiredly. I cheered, too, and kept laughing. A few of them had the energy and the spirit left to laugh with me. Chapter 20 We charged up, then swept the big island clean over the following five hours. The machines were still out there, I knew, making their plans. But they didn't have any ships to cover them. Their forces were made up purely of walking units and missiles— we had the high ground of space, and I kept the gunships firing down into the atmosphere, working to pin down their roaming concentrations of big machines. During the night hours, the railgun salvos showering Yale were more visible. The white streaks rolled down, taking several seconds to go from a tiny pinpoint of light to a brilliant flash as they struck home. It looked as if the world were being hammered by an endless series of slow-motion meteors. I knew the macros would come again if we didn't hit them first. They'd never be content to let us share ground so close to them. But that could wait until another day. Because I had my beachhead, and I was happy. The next island target was one of the smallest in the archipelago that surrounded the undersea ring. Shortly after my group had cleared the seas near the big island of attacking machines— Three battalions splashed down in the shallow seas of the smaller island, which I'd named Tango. It was shaped like a T, and my battalions had landed just above the top crossbar on the map. Following their orders, they assembled underwater, then advanced on the shoreline. The first reports I received concerning the assault weren't positive. Colonel Riggs? Captain Saren asked, hitting my helmet with a private channel. I stopped going over casualty reports and vids of our assaults on the big machines to take the call. Go ahead, Captain. The beach assault is meeting stiff resistance. The machines were forewarned by your attack, I believe. What kind of resistance? Gun emplacements and a series of ridges lined with smaller machines. I've ordered the marines to retreat into the water where the laser turrets can't hit them. Can we use our fighters to support them? Yes, but I calculate a high loss rate. I gnashed my teeth. I didn't want to lose the fighters, nor any more Marines. The fighters were primarily designed to fight in space, not for ground support. My Marines should be able to do what they were destined to do. If three battalions of Marines can't take a beach, we're going to lose this anyway. I believe they can take it, sir. But I wanted to ask you for support. If some element of your force on the Big Island could cross the water and hit the enemy's flank, I think we could lower our losses by seventy percent. On what basis did you arrive at that calculation? She showed me her numbers via my computer scroll. I flattened the screen, which wanted to roll up at the corners. Even smart screens tended to curl. I see your point, I said after reviewing the data. If we come in on the eastern peninsula, they don't have much there— We'll be able to get our boots on the ground and advance under cover. While the enemy is busy with us, the three invading battalions can charge the front line and take the turrets out. We can even bring the fighters in when the enemy is engaged and hit them with combined arms. Exactly, Colonel. I chewed it over unhappily. We'll still suffer harsh casualties, I said. But short of retreating, I can't see what else we can do. Those men can't sit there at the bottom of the sea forever. How long do you think it will take you to get a full battalion to the peninsula? I thought it over, and while I did, it occurred to me that Saren really was running this op. It wasn't the sort of situation I was accustomed to. Normally, my officers didn't call the shots, not on something as big as this. But she was doing a good job, and she was in the better position to do the job. It wasn't her fault I'd insisted on coming down here and doing the dirty work personally. All right. I said at last, going over timing and readiness issues with her. We'll be there in about twenty hours. It will be a long night, crossing the water and all. I'll take only our freshest troops, along with a sprinkling of veterans who have experience with our newest tactics. Captain Saren inquired about the tactics I was talking about, and I explained how we'd brought down so many of the machines so quickly. If she was impressed, it was hard to tell. It usually was with her. Unlike most of my troops, she didn't express herself with vigor. Your results are impressive, sir. 
I'll relay these tactical refinements to the rest of the officers. Fine, but I still want an experienced crew with me. I'll take Captain Gaines's company for starters. Captain Gaines heard his name and wandered closer. What's up, Colonel? I held up my hand, shushing him. Very well, sir, Captain Saren said in my ear. I've placed his company on the roster. Please move west as quickly as possible and merge with 4th Battalion. They are full strength and positioned close to the crossing point. Got it. Let them know I'm coming. Rigs out. Anything I should know about, sir? Captain Gaines asked. I grinned at him. Yeah, you're going to love it. Over the next ten minutes, I briefed the captain, who didn't voice any objections for once. I thought he might be in shock. I know your men have been through a lot, Captain, I said. But that's how most Marines feel the day after an invasion. Our work here isn't through, not by any measure. Less than ten percent of the machines have been taken out, and that's only counting the ones we can see from space. Nodding numbly, Captain Gaines followed me to brief the men. There were a few groans, but they gathered their kits quickly enough, and we set out. We had about sixty effectives in all. I frowned at that. Hadn't we started out with two full companies? These men had indeed gone through the ringer. I decided to split them up when we merged with 4th Battalion. If I put a fire team of about four men in every company in the fresh battalion, they could disseminate the tactics and lead by example. They'd also be less likely to be taken out entirely. We're going to merge up with the 4th and serve as reinforcements for them, bringing the battalion up to full strength. Oh, said Gaines, sounding disappointed but resigned. I guess my company is finished then. I'm sorry to see my first command disintegrate. What? I asked, giving him a frown. No, no, I said. They've taken a few losses. It just so happens they lost a captain. I'm giving you a new company. Choose a fire team to take with you from the old one. Gaines perked up. Yes, sir. He trotted away, and I looked after him, smiling. Then I had to get back on the radio with Saren. I checked and found out 4th Battalion hadn't lost anyone. I ordered her to transfer a junior captain to another outfit we were leaving behind on the Big Island. I don't care what you assign him to, I told her. Put him in charge of digging latrines. Think of something. I signed off again, muttering that I had to do everything around here. When Gaines came back, he had a hard-eyed group of killers at his back. They didn't look like the cleanest cut team, but they looked like they could shoot. These men will do fine, I told him. By the time we reached 4th Battalion, another hour had passed. I let the men rest while I went to talk to the major in charge. I was surprised to see a familiar face. The commanding officer of the 4th was none other than Major Randall Sloan. I laughed when I shook his hand. I get it now, I said. Sir? I mean, I now understand why this battalion is almost entirely intact. Sloan's face fell. I guess I shouldn't have said it. Major Sloan had a reputation for self-preservation on the battlefield and in space. Somehow he was always the first man to reach the airlock or the lifeboat when the ship was breaking up. He was a soldier, just like all my Marines, but he had the survival instincts of a junkyard dog. Quit pouting, Sloan, I said. I didn't mean anything by it. Remember, I appreciate a man who can stay alive. You've got a knack for it, and it's something I need today. In fact, that's exactly why Captain Gaines is here at my side. I briefly explained Gaines' rapid advancement. Gaines tried to look tough while I spoke. When I finished the introduction, Sloan shook Gaines' hand and welcomed him aboard. You've got Alpha Company, Sloan said, gesturing toward the beach. They've recently lost their commander. It will be an honor serving under you, Major, Gaines said. After another round of salutes, he trotted toward the beach. Behind him, his hand-picked fire team followed closely. They'd almost never spoken since we'd broken up their original company. Sloan looked after Gaines' crew wonderingly. You sure can pick them, sir. Never mind that, I said. Are you ready to cross the water or not? Negative, sir. 
We stopped mop-up operations as soon as we got your call, but our suits haven't fully recharged. I would imagine that your people's suits need an hour or two to top off as well. We can't make the crossing with people sinking into the waves on the way. Yeah, I said, looking at my gauge. It read 47%. I hadn't fully charged before I left, but that was still an alarming number. We flew here to save time, I said. But possibly that was a mistake. These new power suits take some getting used to. The men love them, as long as they have power left in them. Our suits had generators, of course. All our marines carried generators and laser projectors. But the generators could not, by themselves, generate enough power to keep the suit fully operational under battle conditions. Our big, hard-hitting laser projectors sucked too much power— so we designed the suits to operate on batteries most of the time, and they automatically recharged themselves back up to full when idle. Unfortunately, that recharge period often took too long. I called Saren again and demanded that a power source be dropped from orbit. Ten of them, in fact, one for every company in the battalion. We had to get recharged and moving soon. The longer we delayed the assault on the target island, the longer the machines had to dig in and set up an ambush. Captain Saren was nothing if not efficient. Within twenty minutes, she had the big generators ferried down from orbit by destroyers with black nanite arms. They were placed in a neat row on the beach, and the men rushed them the moment they were down and humming. They must really need a charge, I said, watching. You would think we'd laid out a buffet and rang the dinner bell. Their suits mean life to them, sir, Sloan said, and power keeps the suits operating. A few minutes later, I walked up to the nearest hulking generator. It detected me and sent a tendril of nanites threading their way across the sand to my suit. It looked as if someone had poured out a bottle of mercury, except that the liquid ran uphill. The line of nanites met my left boot, and the tickling sensation of heavy power passed through me. There was always some detectable level of bleed when you dealt with this kind of amperage. We relaxed, ate and talked while our suits charged up. I reflected that although it was strategic downtime, maybe it wasn't all that bad to have suits that needed a charge. Sometimes Marines needed to recharge, too. In less than an hour after I'd merged my company into 4th Battalion, we were on our way across the waves. To me, this was the most fun you could have in power armor. I'd always enjoyed jet skis back home, and this was a close equivalent. The huge metal toes of my boots touched a cresting wave now and again, but otherwise I stayed fairly dry. Hundreds of other Marines zoomed along in loose formation all around me. Beneath us, our grav lifters pushed at the water, making it dish outward and form small wakes. Behind us, we left a thousand white trails in the black seawater that rippled and bounced until the sea smoothed out again. Soon I could see Tango with my helmet set to infrared. It was a greenish zone of warmth on the near horizon. We were still in the middle of second night on Yale, and we were using our infrared systems to see. The land was much cooler than the hot seawater, so it registered green while the ocean below my feet was a glaring white. Beach invasions are always problematic, but natural conditions on Yale made this particular invasion worse than the norm. We would have to come in at night, flying over the water. This made us perfect targets for enemy emplacements on the target island. Yale's climate didn't help. One of the biggest concerns was the behavior of the tides here. On Earth, our relatively small moon gave our oceans pretty impressive tides for its size. The difference in ocean depths on a given beach was often four feet between high and low tide. But Yale was much more dramatic when it came to moving water around the surface than what we were accustomed to on the relatively placid oceans of old Earth. Here, there was the gas giant itself, a massive gravitation force of crushing proportions. There were a number of local moons in the planetary system as well, each exerting their own significant forces on the oceans of this world. As a result, tides were rather chaotic— and could vary by as much as thirty feet in an hour. It was almost like witnessing a continuous series of rolling tidal waves. Our power armor would keep us from drowning, 
but we had to take the tidal movements into account. The islands literally lost or gained 10% of their surface area depending on the time of day. It was safe to say that humans would never be able to swim on these dangerous beaches. We hit the shores of Tango at low tide. The last thousand yards were a muddy slog, but I ordered my men to turn off their grav lifters and hump it to cover. We needed to save power. The dark beach was soon full of clanking marines. We made it about a quarter of the way to cover when something spotted us and opened fire. Streaks of incoming fire spat out, and to my surprise, they weren't lasers. They were pellets. Hard-hitting rounds of ballistic ammunition flashed out to greet us from a dozen machine-gun nests on the ridge ahead. I shouted over the command channel, giving the go-ahead to fly again. The men barely needed to hear the order. They were already lifting off in droves and zooming forward. The longer we were on this open beach, the worse it was going to be. The streams of bullets were different than normal automatic weapon fire back on Earth. First of all, there were no tracers. I suppose the machines didn't need to light up every fourth round with an incendiary just to see what they were aiming at. Due to my sensory gear, I could still see the incoming streaks of hot lead. The bullets were different in other ways as well, I soon realized. They were bigger, being about the size of felt pens. About four inches long and more than half an inch thick, these rounds struck with real force. Ten rounds hit my armor in a burst as a hosing spray swept near a chest level. A normal man would have been cut in two. Fortunately, my armor didn't even rupture. But the kinetic force was such that I was tossed back and thrown onto my can. I couldn't believe it. Nothing less than a macro's leg should have knocked me down in this power suit. Major Sloan, are you reading me? I asked over the unit channel. Here, yes, sir. We've got to get to those nests and take them out now. I'm well aware, Colonel. We've got casualties. I jumped up and rushed forward. I was very conscious of the fact that my chest armor had been seriously damaged. Another hard hit like that might punch through. Even with all my modifications, I didn't think I would survive it. Should we use grenade launchers, sir? Sloan asked. The grenade launchers Sloan was talking about weren't the old-fashioned under-barrel units like the American M203. When we fired a grenade, we fired a small tactical nuke at the enemy. The ridge is too close, I said, and I don't want to expend that kind of ammo on this position. Permission denied. I'm putting a sharpshooter squad on every pillbox then, Sloan said. Maybe we can get a lucky hit. Good idea. Right now, I'm wishing we had brought along some heavy weaponry. We could call for air support, sir. Forget it. By the time they got down here, this will all be over, and I don't want them exposed to enemy AA until we know what we're up against. Roger that. Now, from our advancing lines, counterfire was being thrown back at the enemy. As far as I could tell, this had little or no effect. We charged onward. It seemed to take forever, but really it was probably less than a minute, before the first elements of the fourth reached the ridge. That's when the enemy really let us have it. Up until we got close, the enemy guns had been spraying at all of us, like someone with a broom trying to push away dust. When that didn't work and we got in dangerously close, the automated guns changed tactics. They chose an unlucky Marine at the front of the charge and hammered him until he went down. Then they kept hammering him. I wasn't at the very front wave, but I was within a hundred yards of the brave men who were. I watched as dozens of them went down, being shot to death by a thousand orange-sparking rounds. The men fell, struggled, fell again. There was nothing we could do for them, and their suits kept them alive for several ghastly seconds. Even after they'd stopped moving, the streams of bullets poured into dead marines. The beach ran red and flesh flew after the shell-like armor was finally breached. When the guns were satisfied, they traversed their turrets to the next victim. Then, at last, we reached the ridge line. It's hard to describe how you feel at a moment like this, when you finally get to sate your urge for revenge on your tormentors. I guess attackers who suffered losses and abuse during a long charge have felt the emotion since time immemorial. We roared and strained, grappling the machines, burning them. They weren't easy to take out. 
Guns operated by humans were relatively simple to destroy. The key was that the human soldiers firing the guns were softer than the guns themselves. But in this case, there were no soldiers, just the heartless guns, chattering away relentlessly. We had to destroy them in detail, ripping barrels from tripods, stripping away snaking belts of ammo, and burning smoking holes into their CPUs. Finally, it was over. While the fourth spread out on the ridge, seeking cover and checking on the wounded, I went to find Major Sloan. He was just coming up from the beach when I met him on the ridge. I gave him a single raised eyebrow. He was practically the last man to reach the ridge line. I was with one of the sharpshooter teams, sir, he reported. Negligible effects. I noticed. How many casualties? Fourteen dead, six wounded. An alarming statistic. Normally my men were very hard to kill. It wasn't uncommon for us to have two hundred wounded and no deaths after a hard fight due to our individual survivability. I frowned. I guess the enemy tactics of overkill worked for them in this instance. The machines didn't stop us, but they made us bleed. Agreed, Sloan said. Your orders, sir? Request rescue for the wounded. The rest will pack up and advance. Sloan looked westward at the dark hills. Ahead of us, a series of ridges loomed, separated by flat, rocky terrain. There could be a large number of ambushes ahead, sir, Sloan said. Maybe we should scout first. Excellent idea, Major, I said. I walked forward and clamped my arm around his shoulders. His helmet swiveled to regard me. I couldn't see his expression through the dark plexiglass, but I could bet it wasn't a happy one. I've got just the man for the job, I said, giving him a little shake. Are you sending me on point, sir? I'm a major. I laughed. No, I'm just screwing with you, Sloan. I can't afford to lose my unit, Commander. I'm sending Captain Gaines and his team of toughs. An excellent suggestion, Colonel, Sloan said, brightening. He trotted away to relay the order. A few minutes later, Captain Gaines showed up and asked to speak with me. I waved him to sit down. I was crouching with my back rubbing against a ferro-creed pillbox wall. I had a nanite sprayer out, which was working on repairing my armor with repeated light coats. I'd found that if you sprayed a thin coat several times on the damaged area, they seemed to work faster. Colonel, have you got a problem with me? Captain Gaines asked. I looked up at him. I do now, I said. What do you mean, sir? I like you, Gaines. I have you down in my private book as an up-and-comer, but this is a bad moment in your personnel records as far as I'm concerned. Gaines shuffled uncertainly in his armor. Finally, he threw up his hands. I just don't get it, sir. First you praise me and put me in charge of a company. Then you give me a series of hazardous duties the latest of which seems to be tailor-made to get me killed. I shook my head and stood up. On my chest, a mass of nanites bubbled and worked to patch up my suit. It was sort of like watching acid eat at something, but in reverse. Captain, I'm going to give you a pass on this one, because you and I haven't been in close contact before. Here's the deal. I need officers who can do anything and everything I ask them to do. I'm asking you to do a nasty mission right now. Are you requesting another assignment? So this is all some kind of test? Not exactly. It is a test, but it's also an opportunity. You can't prove what you're capable of if I don't give you the chance to do so. Right here, right now, I'm giving you that chance. I see. I'll ask again. Do you want another assignment? Captain Gaines hesitated. Then he straightened his spine. No, sir, he said. I'm taking this mission, and I'm going to complete it successfully. Excellent. I knew I could count on you. He turned and trotted away to gather his hand-picked group of hard-eyed vets. I'd done a little checking up on Captain Gaines during my brief downtime before we'd crossed the sea from Big Island to Tango. He had a checkered past— he was one of those Star Force types that had joined us to get away from troubles back home. 
He'd been a gangster and had a rap sheet as long as my arm. But Star Force had given him a second chance, and the structure he seemed to need. I felt he'd excelled under my command. Now it was time to see what he was really made of. As he led his group of scouts off into the darkness, I sincerely hoped I'd see him again. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook, so please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.